meeting. Okay, thank you, Madam Clerk. Okay, we are live. Yeah. Well, good morning, everyone, and welcome to our county council meeting for November 12th, 2020. And uh, I want to uh, say good morning to county councilors and staff and the viewing public. I, want, I do want to say that um, since uh, travel restrictions are in place and we can't go uh, anywhere else, it's nice the past week that the Florida weather has came here instead of us having to go to Florida. So we've enjoyed a great week of weather. And I think we've been blessed from that uh, ability to have that. Uh, moving on in, uh, Madam Clerk, uh, can you do the roll call, please? Thank you, Mr. Warden. We have all members of County Council in attendance today. Well, thank you for that. Uh, so we do have a published, an agenda, a published agenda that was uh, circulated to, uh, for the past week. Are there any declaration of, uh, of interest with regards to uh, County Councilors? Okay, uh, if one does arise, you can de declare at that time. Uh, so we do have some business arising from our, our previous uh, council meeting and it's with regards to our new procedure and with regards to picking a warden. So Madam Clerk, do you wish to speak to this? Thank you, Mr. Warden. Um, it is a notice of, mo or a notice or a motion um, regarding the election of the 2021 warden. It uh, comes from the discussion that took place at the last council meeting so uh, a few of the sections of the procedural bylaw will be waived. It does require a two thirds uh, vote of council. Um, the secret ballot will be replaced with an online poll similar to what uh, Rob Hatton showed us at the last meeting. Nominations for the position of warden will be delivered to the clerk no later than noon hour on Friday, November, or Thursday, November 26, which is our last council meeting for uh, 2020. Um, the inaugural meeting will be by electronic means and it will take place at 4 p.m. on Tuesday, December 1st. I'd be happy to answer any questions from council on that. Well, thank you, Madam Clerk. And it has been moved by Councilor Desai and second by Councilor Hicks. Are there any questions from County Council with regards to uh, uh, changes to the procedure bylaw? A question from Councilor Desai. Desai. Councilor Desai, go ahead. Thank you, uh, thank you, Worship. I think it's important to let uh, let the viewing public know that even though it is going to be an online poll and that it's a shift from the secret ballot, the online poll will still be uh, an anonymous uh, um, voting method, uh, if I'm correct. And so I'd just like the, um, the Madam Clerk to confirm that, please. Yes, that is absolutely correct, Councillor Desai. It will be an anonymous online poll. I also note that okay. Councillor Millen had a hand up. Okay, uh, thank you for that, uh, Councillor Millen. Thank you, Mr. <coughs> Excuse me, thank you, Mr. Warden. Um, I'm just wondering in regards to the uh, nominations delivered in writing, does that mean literally you need a piece of paper that is written or is an email electronic uh, letter sufficient? An email is perfectly fine. Thank you very much. Thank you for that, Councillor Millen. Is there any other questions then? Councillor Mack. Uh, Councillor Mack. Thanks, Mr. Warden, and, and through you to, uh, to Heather. Heather, can you just uh, you know quickly go over what the procedures will be that day uh, on the uh, the fourth? Like, is it a, an actual meeting that we're having where we'll be logging in and then getting the results and uh, what the the time frame is expected to be? Thank you. Go ahead, Madam Clerk. Thank you. Through you, Mr. Warden. Um, the meeting will be held at four o'clock. You will get a Zoom invite similar to what you get for County Council. It will be a County Council meeting. Uh, you should have those invites in your calendar already. Um, I think Kathy Nuno sent those out to you a couple of weeks ago. Um, the procedures itself will be fairly similar. Um, the motions will come forward uh, through writing uh, to me. And again, I will ask the intent of, of the nominees to stand and we will go through the election process uh, online poll. And um, then th those results will be shared. The um, nominees for each candidate will have a chance to speak as will the candidate themselves. And then um, once the election is completed, then 
Um, the uh, incumbent warden for 2021 will present uh, his or her opening uh, remarks and uh, will uh, complete the oath of office and that will be the end of it. It's, it's, it's very similar to what normally is. It just is online with a few uh, changes to that process. Councillor Mackey, do you have a follow-up there? Or is that oh, us? thank you very much. Okay, go up. Quick welcome. Um, are there any other questions? I do see Councillor Millen's hand up. Councillor Millen. Thank you, Mr. Warden. Uh, Madam Clerk, why four o'clock? Well, normally it's in the evening, and yes. um, because we're doing it virtual, um, four o'clock is at the end of the business day. People can log on and uh, watch us live stream. And then honestly, people have the evening to themselves and we're not, we usually have a social function after that's not going to happen this year. So um, doing it at the end of the business day allows people to um, participate in the meeting and then have your evening free. Socialize later. Right. Very good. Thank you. You're welcome. Okay. Maybe by that time you can go and shovel your walkway or something. <laughs> Hopefully not. Any other comments, uh, uh, discussion points with regards to this? The only one I was, I'm going to raise, uh, Madam Clerk, and I know we went through this with Rob and, on the exercise last council meeting, was if there are 18 representatives here and when they vote and if there are 17 votes come in, uh, there's a time period, um, just refresh my mind in a sense, do we wait or does that person remember i think councillor millen said if there's an inter internet issue or you know with regards to that uh then i think he said that he would make a phone call like can you just walk through that part just because because it is reliable it is relying on on having uh internet uh availability and and make sure that everybody's had that opportunity to vote okay uh certainly so rob will run the um anonymous online poll and should there be connectivity issues with any member of uh, council, they have the option of um, calling in to Rob or um, sending him an email to indicate uh, their vote. It, it, um, those are the options that are available. Okay, just wanted to make sure everybody was quite aware of that. And I remember that was how, sort of how we did it last time for sure at the mm -hmm. discussion point. Okay, uh, any further, um, any further, uh, Comments. I guess that it will be published on our website, so those from the viewing public will make sure they it's four o'clock and and not uh, seven o'clock as the traditional time. Okay. All right. So I, I see there is no other questions. Is there anybody opposed to this motion? Hearing none. That is carried. Okay. Thank you very much. Uh, moving on then to our agenda, we have the uh, minutes of the strategic. Uh, well, the minutes, hang on, the minutes of the Committee of the Whole. We got uh, minutes of the Committee of the Whole, strategic planning meeting dated October 15th, County Council meeting, uh, Committee of the Whole of October 22nd. And that's been moved by Councillor Robinson and Councillor Mackey. Are there any uh, errors or omissions or any discussion on those sets of minutes? Okay, seeing none, are there, is there anybody opposed to those sets of minutes? Okay, that is carried. Okay, then moving on to the CA, uh, you know, put the page here. So we have the CA, the CAO evaluation minutes that are there as moved by Councillor Desai, second by Councillor Mellon. Are there any discussions on those? Councillor Hutchinson, did you have a question? You, you're on mute there. Morning, Warden, sorry about that. Just got a text message from Councillor Robinson's been disconnected and was wondering if uh, we could uh, resend the invite. It looks like she went right down with the internet. If that's possible, oh. I could resend the invite, yep. please. Yep, I'll and, do that right now. Thank you. Okay, uh, so has she been off for a period of time, you know, Councillor Hutchison? Uh, my, just the tail end of our last discussion. So just, uh, I noticed she, she went off the screen, but. Uh, Okay, I can I can wait here a few few seconds here to see if she can uh, can reconnect. Thank you. Sorry for interrupting. I appreciate it. Thank you. I see that she sent me a text as well, so I missed it. But uh, okay, just uh, 
going to wait here for a few seconds here to see if she can reconnect. <clears throat> Again, it's sort of ironic when I asked a question about internet, <laughs> how it happened. So I see that she has joined, I popped up my screen. Is that uh, correct, Madam Clerk? You have... That's correct, okay. I see her on mine now too. Okay, very good. So I'll, I'll just repeat then, and then the uh, minutes of the CAO evaluation, uh, moved by Councilor Desai, second by Councilor uh, Minute, uh, Mil uh, sorry, Councilor Millen. And any discussion on those minutes? Anybody opposed to those set of minutes? Okay, that is carried. Thank you. And then we have the uh, minutes of the uh, uh, public minute meeting minutes uh, of October 22nd. And Mr. that's been Warden, moved by, sorry. I'm sorry. Um, before that are the closed meeting minutes from the CAO committee. Oh, sorry. Okay. I apologize for that. So that is moved by Councillor McKeveny and second by Councillor Desai. Sorry about that. The close set of minutes for the um, evaluation committee. Is there any discussion there? I guess if uh, somebody wanted to go on camera, I guess I would have to raise that. Any issues there? Any discussion points there? Anybody opposed to that motion? Okay, that is carried. I apologize for that, Madam Clerk. Moving on then to the adoption of the public meeting minutes of October 22nd. That was moved by Councillor Hicks and second by Councillor uh, Woodbury. And is there any discussion points on those set of minutes? Hearing none, any, uh, anybody opposed to those minutes? Those are carried. Okay, thank you. Then moving on to the uh, Board of Health minutes. It's moved by Councillor Patterson and Councillor <laughs> O'Leary and Madam Clerk, I think you indicated that Dr. Era is going to speak. Um, Dr. Era is in attendance with us. Okay, so I'll, I'll pass it over to uh, Dr. Era. Good morning, Dr. Era. Good morning, Lord, and good morning, Council. Uh, so the uh, minutes had two, had multiple items, two of them of, uh, are the highlight of these minutes. Uh, the first one is related to uh, safe school reopening and I, I am pleased to uh, share with the council that currently we have zero outbreaks in schools. We have had zero outbreaks in schools for the since school reopening and uh, there has been two incidents related to schools where students uh, were identified as cases with the uh, epidemiological link or acquisition of the virus outside of the school and uh, uh, those uh, two incidents were have been uh, very helpful examples as a result uh, to know that the uh, public health measures that have implemented in schools through school officials and school, school staff have been sufficient to ensure safety of the students and the staff in schools as there have been no transmission after identif identifying these uh, cases. And the second uh, lessons lear lesson learned there or um, positive, relatively positive results uh, concluded. Uh, the fact that the public health protocols to respond within the school, the protocols that we deployed have been uh, also sufficient in ensuring safety of uh, the uh, students and the school staff. Um, so uh, all in all, that, that has been uh, a tremendous effort from everybody around the table. Uh, however, it has been successful the second item on the minutes is related to uh, um, an update on modernization of public health uh, slash regionalization of public health. Uh, so as you all know, in 2019, there was proposed um, modernization of public health and potential amalgamation regionalization of, uh, of public health. Uh, the health unit has been one of the early adopters of that initiative. Um, after thorough discussions uh, between the ministry and uh, public health, uh, boards of health, MOHs and other stakeholders, the uh, uh, modernization or the initiative, uh, this, <clears throat> sorry, a consultation was decided uh, to proceed uh, to ensure adequate and thorough consultation was required to, uh, to be in place before 
uh, the process of regionalization or modernization. That started in 2009, sorry, it started in 2020 and it was put on hold, rightly so, in March when the pandemic started. Nevertheless, we have been observing uh, informal uh, channels of regionalization that has been that have been established over the past seven months, um, and and it is more or less uh, under um, the, the intent of collaboration to respond to COVID. Um, nevertheless, it it creates its channels and structure that is regional, and by regional I mean Southwest Ontario region. And uh, recently we have seen um, evidence of activation of that uh, structure in certain initiatives. Although it might carry some benefit in the short term, it also creates some role clarity uh, when responding to the pandemic and uh, role of authority and, and um, sorry, confusion about role of uh, clarity and confusion about authority. And that might be uh, carrying some potential risk, especially when we're managing outbreaks in long-term care, other facilities that are high sensitivity. That's short-term. Long-term uh, regionalization without consultation, thorough consultation, um, might have uh, potential negative impacts on our ability as organizations related to health to address the health need for the community. So this has been an observation of uh, uh, us and of our organization, and it has been also observed by other health units. And um, the, the uh, report here is just to bring awareness about it and uh, um, to, to be uh, cognizant of it. It might be parallel to the same uh, regionalization structure, creation of Ontario health teams for Grey Bruce. Uh, all in all, um, it's something that we observed and we we encourage discussion about it in different settings and different um, at different boards in, in the area and across the province. Open to question as always, uh, Mr. Warden. Well, thank you for your explanation. And I'm getting some feedback. I'm not sure where that feedback is coming from. Um, sounds like it's me. Um, <laughs> um, any questions uh, to follow up from Dr. Ayer's report? I'm kind of counselors. I see Councillor Sulever. Oh, go ahead, Councillor Sulever. Yes, uh, thank you for that, Dr. Ayer. And, um, you know, certainly um, I would have a concern with uh, the big regionalization. I think um, our, health, our health unit in particular and your team has been very effective. And, uh, you know, I know that our businesses in Blue Mountain and, um, you know, the resort and everything, we have a lot of visitors, so we have a lot of issues, um, you know, both here and with some of our local businesses even. And um, your team's been very responsive into helping all these uh, people out in, in putting the proper protocols in place. And I fear if we've got something regional with say the base in London, uh, we wouldn't get the same, uh, you know, understanding of our issues and the same responsiveness. And I think the other thing is if we look at what's happened in our long-term care homes compared to surrounding municipalities, um, I think because of the protocols we have in place, we've managed to contain the few cases that we've had in the long-term care homes and we've had no deaths so far. So, you know, I think it's working perfectly and it's providing a very high level of service that I don't necessarily see the same level of effectiveness in surrounding um, units. So um, I would say that maybe County Council should um, discuss this and, and, and possibly um, inform the government that if it's not broke, don't fix it. Thank you for those comments. Uh... Councilor Sorber. Um, I'm sure Dr. Error will communicate that or read into the board. Um, Sue Patterson or Councilor Patterson, as the vice chair, do you have anything you wish to add to that? I know there's been lots of discussion in that. Yes, thanks, Mr. Warden. Good morning, County Council. Uh, Dr. Error said it so eloquently. Uh, I was also going to comment the same. Uh, 
items that our focus is on the local need, not on the regional need. So it's um, on our radar, what is happening. And also, I think it's important if you have, I hope you had the opportunity to review Dr. Era's um, presentation about uh, school reopenings, an update on it, because there's a very thorough detailed process that happens if there is a confirmed case with a, a student. So it's good to know this is happening and gives people uh, a level of comfort that we need. That's it, Mr. Warden. Thank you. Well, thank you, uh, Councillor Patterson. And I will echo those uh, same comments, as, you know, especially some of those events happening in Grey Highlands and uh, Certainly, we were blessed uh, with the, you know, the uh, expertise staff that the Great Bruce Health Unit has locally, and certainly, you know, I think it's a good reflection of looking at where our numbers are and how how, how good a position that we are compared to the rest of the province. So, I, I certainly kudos to that local that local level of uh, follow up. Um, other um, other uh, comments uh, with regards to uh, the minutes or the report from County Councilors. Yes, I have Councillor Desai and then Councillor Soever has a follow-up. Okay, go ahead, Councillor Desai. Thank you very much, Mr. Warden. Uh, thank you, Dr. Ara, for the presentation. Um, my question is with regards to the number of um, uh, positive tests as a percentage of the total tests. Um, we know Manitoba is, is the highest in that regard at 10% of um, total tests returning positive. I was wondering if you had the corresponding number for, uh, for our health unit here. Um, and as well, if you had the corresponding number in the initial wave and comparing that to the current wave, um, if you could, if you had those numbers, if not, you know, we could, it's okay. Uh, thank you. Certainly, thank you. Uh, through you, Mr. Uh, uh, Chair Warden. Uh, the um, percent positivity, as you can appreciate, is a product of two numbers, the denominator uh, is, is a very important number that keeps changing. If you compare Manitoba to Ontario, the number of tests that have been done in Ontario is way higher. And by definition, the, the percent would be, might reflect a higher number in Manitoba. That's an artifact. Uh, similarly, if we compare the number of tests we've been doing in the first wave was around 2000 per day. Currently we're doing 30, 40,000 uh, per day. So whenever you have the, uh, the denominator changing, it's very difficult to compare the two results. Then you add another layer of, uh, of uh, complexity. Uh, the uh, uh, people who are being tested, again, the denominator, the number on the bottom, if they are symptomatic and they meet a case definition that's consistent, that would allow us to compare the two numbers. However, we know that people without symptoms have been tested throughout the summer. Uh, so, so again, that, that number without adjusting for all these variables uh, is, is not uh, uh, easily useful. The utility of it really diminishes. Um, in, in our uh, area, if we look at the seven day um, um, <clears throat> percent positivity, it has varied significantly from day to day between 1.25 to around seven. And again, it really is biased because we have smaller numbers. That's another layer of it. Um, if, if there is sudden testing for, for example, uh, the school incidents that happened, we tested over uh, 60, 70 people. So that's on that specific day, we had many numbers in the bottom, the denominator in the bottom part of the, uh, the percentage. Uh, that's gonna dilute that number, uh, the, percentage, the percent uh, positivity. Uh, so more, more or less, uh, it is uh, under 10%. Uh, it is, uh, if we adjust for all the uh, asymptomatic people and um, uh, for, for uh, testing out of anxiety, it, it's probably around 2 3%, my best estimate, over the past few weeks. And again, it really varies from day to day. We don't depend on it much just because we have small numbers. If we're having 200 cases per day, that will be a number that's solid. Um, uh, I'll be more than happy to address the question if uh, there is a need for that number to understand an aspect of the uh, there is a response. I can provide a different metric that's more reliable if, if of interest. Is that something that's really 
or is that something that's uh, more scientific formula? Dr. Era? Sorry? Is that something that's fairly quick or is that something that's sort of more of a scientific uh, uh, formula that you need, would need to email out to everyone? Sorry, I was just asking uh, the counselor, uh, he requested the number. If I know the intent of using that number, I can send different metrics that could be useful, way more useful for that uh, sense. So, um, thank you. you. Is that okay, uh, Councillor? Just... Yeah, sorry, uh, he just broke up a little at the end there, so I didn't quite catch it. So thanks for repeating that, Doctor. Um, no, the, the context was just to see, um, you know, whether the whether we were in fact a better positioned now. Uh, to um, in terms of fighting the virus compared to the initial wave or not, uh, because I know people keep talking about the um, the increased numbers of, uh, of positive tests. Um, so I think, um, like you said, we were doing 2,000 tests in the initial wave, and now we're doing about 30 to 40. So we're bound to have more positive tests now than we, we had previously. And so I basically, I wanted to see if the percentages were same um, and the increased number of uh, positive uh, tests is, um, you know, quite frankly, simply a function of an increased number of total tests. Um, so that, that was what I was trying to see uh, or whether if we were in fact having a higher ratio of positive tests now uh, than we were in the initial wave, in which case then, you know, it's a, it's a different uh, uh, matter altogether. Thank you. I see. Through you, Mr. Chair, uh, the, uh, indeed there is uh, there is difference in the testing, and uh, the numbers ought to be uh, not tread the same. Uh, although we're testing more, so we're going to find more. The metric that we can use is the doubling time or the uh, uh, steepness of the curve. So, in in the province, it's an easy example probably to look at. A um, few weeks ago, we had less than 100 cases. So we start finding more cases, but the increase of the number of cases, the doubling of these cases have been very steep. So whether, uh, whether we test more or not, it's the same amount of testing during this period and the doubling of, of number of cases uh, have been clear that there is a growth in, in the uh, outbreak. So the wave is real. It's not a reflect of testing more. Um, that's definite. The other part probably would be more useful in addressing your question is the number of close contact for each case we found. In the spring, we used to find uh, two, three people who are close contact to each case. Currently, it's not uncommon to find 20 or 30 people. So that's another metric that there is more transmission there. And uh, we have been following, for example, the um, cluster in, in uh, South Bruce Peninsula one case generated 10 cases and generated over 130, 140 close contacts. Uh, not the one case, the whole cluster. Uh, so this is totally different scenario from the first wave and it's definitely more severe. Okay, thank you for that. Thank you, thank you very much, Dr. Okay, um, I'm gonna go to Councillor Mackey first because I think uh, Councillor Soever wanted to wrap up. So I'm gonna go to Councillor Mackey first and I'll, I'll finish up with Councillor Soever. Go ahead, Councillor Mackey. Counselor, I do have Councillor Potter as well, Mr. Warden. Okay, okay. Councilor Thanks, Mackey. Mr. Warden. And through you to Dr. Era, uh, just wondering uh, if uh, Dr. Era could speak about the hospitalization rate across the province and you know where it's at and uh, uh, when it becomes uh, critical. Thank you. Doctor? Uh, thank you, Mr. Warden. So hospitalization rate across the province, I, I can get these numbers. I, they're, they're not available to me on daily basis uh, because we're focusing on the uh, area um, locally. I can share the local scenario. We have overcapacity just because the hospitals have been trying to uh, catch up with the backlog from uh, surgeries that were delayed. Uh, although we don't have COVID cases, we are in that uh, uh, high capacity. And usually around this time, uh, the flu season really challenges the hospital capacity regardless. Uh, so this is locally without cases, 
uh, we, we have uh, around 100% or over 100% in some uh, cases capacity in the hospital used. Um, with knowing that there are other uh, areas with the high number of cases and hospitalization, especially the for um, red areas or hot spots, um, we, I would I would anticipate that the, there will be potential of challenge of the capacity um, in in the coming few weeks if the trends continue, and uh, this is not again this is not based on a report I read rather just. Uh, anecdotal look at the situation, and I'm not the expert in these other areas, and I don't know their uh, uh, their detailed uh, uh, daily reports. Uh, however, of if of interest, uh, I'll be more than happy to provide that report by email to uh, the CAO and uh, to be distributed to the group. Well, thank you for that. Uh, Okay, thank you, Councilor Mackey, uh, Councilor Potter, and then Councilor Swerver. Uh, thank you, and thank you, Dr. Era. Uh, people are sort of have the idea that, well, we don't have many cases here, so we're fine. Why are we worried about it? Um, do you have an answer to that? Uh, should we be more worried than a lot of people are when we don't have a lot of cases so far? We definitely need to be concerned, and... Uh relative to our population, relative to our hospital capacity, uh, we, we need to be very careful uh, to, to ensure uh, the, the, the control over the outbreak that we have had continues. Uh, with, with about uh, seven cases in that cluster in South Bruce Peninsula, we had over 140 close contacts. And, and uh, we followed them for uh, around two weeks or three, then when they became 10, again, that number increases from one side, decreases from the other. Uh, to follow up with 140 cases uh, is, there's a lot of anxiety for that community, for all our communities, knowing that there is potential for, for uh, cases and uh, there's potential for um, suffering for especially older adults and people with comorbidities. The resources spent is a taxpayer that we all pay. Uh, the hours lost for these people isolating, 140 isolating for that long of time. Uh, again, that's a societal loss. And, and if we continue to have what we uh, have uh, of people lowering their guard, you know, for the sake of uh, having a party for a couple hours, one person, it ends up with this much uh, threat to the community. Um, again, if you picture how much fatigue with COVID going forward, and if we have a few of these at the same time, would our system be able to handle it? And as soon at, at breaks, it's very difficult to contain it. So again, we are in good standing. However, we need to be very concerned because this concern is what kept us engaged and, and uh, um, you know, in, engaged to, and, and in action to provide safety for all of us. Uh, I'm, I'm not sure, Councillor, if, if this uh, would address it, and I, I know it wouldn't because too much communication during an emergency is not enough. We continue to send communication from our team, and uh, as a matter of fact, I was communicating with the um, CEO for Gray, uh, that we might need to, to up the communication on augmented. And um, yeah. all in all, we're in all in this together. And I, I apologize, it sounds cliche and we repeat it all of us to, on a daily basis. However, it has many facets to it. And, and your question really ignites something that we uh, need to struggle with, all of us, to, to double down and ensure uh, we have this commitment from everybody to the three W's, to the measures in place, and hopefully uh, the, the vaccine will be in place in a few months from now. As you know, I should have um, provided that update if, if uh, it was not known to people. Uh, there is uh, a vaccine that was uh, developed uh, by uh, a company in the United States with 90% efficacy. And... Uh, if it is uh, mass distributed over the coming three, four months, um, that will be the uh, 
uh, last nail in the coffin of this pandemic. So until that happens, we really need to double down and we need to be very concerned. Uh, if I may, yeah. Mr. Uh, I'd like to thank uh, Dr. Era for his answer. That That is, uh, I guess, what I was, the information I was looking for is, is where we need to go. And, and we do need to continue to communicate uh, right across Ray County, but in our own municipalities as well, that this is not over, it's not dying out, it's getting, it's getting stronger, and we really need to keep up our efforts. So thank you. Well, and, and, and thanks for raising that, uh, Councillor Potter, because I was going to raise the point that to Dr. Ayer, is it possible through Ray Roots Health Unit, along with the wardens and the counties, along with all the lower tier municipalities to have a campaign coming up, uh, a joint campaign coming up to spread that message? Because we've got Christmas coming up and we know that's Christmas has a, a strong <laughs> attribute of, of people getting together. So it just maybe something that could come back to the board or whatever and think about that. But I think collectively, if we can all work together to try to spread that message coming forward to that Christmas holidays, we have some time. Uh, they tell me Christmas is coming quickly. So, um, but I just wondered if, if there is a, a, you know, a repetitious campaign that you mentioned, Councillor Potter, that we can communicate even from our lower tiers, but it's the same message, but it's, it's being, inundated uh, from all levels of, of our, our government in the sense of county and lower tier and the Great Bruce Health Unit. So I, I, I'll give that or let you take that back, Dr. Arab, but it's just something that uh, I think collectively we could, should or could or try to do. Thank you, Mr. Orlin. That will be greatly appreciated and uh, uh, I'm confident we can uh, uh, collaborate and coordinate this effort. Fantastic. Okay, um, are there any other calls before I go to doctor or any other questions before I go to yes. Dr. Soever? I think. Councillor Gamble. I mean, Councillor Soever. <laughs> Councillor Councilor Gamble, go ahead. Get unmuted here. Uh, doctor, uh, you mentioned briefly about the flu shot. I, I, I have been in Onsound several times to try and get that, and there's no place that has it. Is there any information that's going to be available soon or uh, just an information? Uh, certainly, so through you, Mr. Chair, uh, the distribution of the flu uh, vaccine uh, has two systems. One of them from uh, the Ministry of Health and national distributors directly to pharmacies. And that's totally separate system from the second one, which is through the health unit. Uh, to primary care, long-term care hospitals, um, healthcare providers in Grey Bruce. Um, my understanding uh, about the first one from communication from the ministry that there is sufficient supply, however, intermittently challenged. So there is always going to be um, uh, some, some delay in delivery or, uh, however, uh, if a person checks with their local pharmacy, they would be able to get it in a during a short period of time. Uh, the second system, the one that's under uh, the health unit's control, has had complete flow at all times. And actually, we proactively ordered in August, and we received a small shipment in September. It was completely delivered to everybody in Grey Bruce who needs it. But then a second shipment by the end of October, and uh, we were pleasantly surprised that the shipment was doubled in November. Uh, we have been providing it to primary care. Some primary care uh, and, and family health teams have been doing mass immunization. For example, in the uh, peninsula, uh, the family health team ordered 500 and delivered it, and it was delivered completely. Um, so depending on the source you're looking at, uh, if it's a pharmacy, it can be uh, intermittent. If it is a primary care or uh, hospitals, uh, long-term care, um, it, it should be there at all times you need it. And um, the health unit clinic will provide it no question at any time um, during our uh, clinic hours. So uh, if, if the pharmacy was not sufficient system, please uh, um, at the, um, c contact our health unit clinic. And if I may just explain the vaccine, I was uh, referring to in a previous answer is the COVID vaccine. That's anticipated, not the flu vaccine. Yep. 
I think there's a lot of concern with getting the flu the flu shot it's what itself. Councillor Gamble, is that uh, is that uh, sort of phone ahead maybe or or is that yeah. Nice? I've, I've tried that method, and uh, as we know, the the health system is is flogged right now. Uh, it's about a two week wait, three week wait, so. It's not an easy process, and the pharmacies have no idea when they're going to get it. The two that I tried. Okay, thank you. It's it's worth mentioning through you, Mr. Chair, that the messaging to encourage the public to get the flu vaccine has been a success. The overwhelming demand on it is what created the intermittent backlog. So again, uh, there is there something there to celebrate, definitely although we need to iron out the challenge of delivery. Thank you. Okay, well, thanks for that good discussion. Uh, and then I'm going to go to Councillor Swever to uh, follow up. Yes, uh, thank you. Um, so um, I have a question for Dr. Era on the numbers, but before I get to that, I might answer Mr. Mackey's question. Um, I keep track of statistics as you, you guys might know by now and the, um, the, the hospitalizations uh, last week were up to 367 across Ontario, which is not quite to the first uh, wave, which was over a thousand, but it's a 20 times increase from the low of about 18 a few months in middle of September. So it's a very steep curve as well. The hospitals, you know, 20 time increase in a couple of months is, is pretty serious. Um, now, for Dr. Era, we have had 17 cases over the last week, which given our population of 162,000 puts us just over 10. So that would put us in the, we moved from green to yellow now on the provincial measurement. Um, so what, what changes um, does that trigger in terms of uh, restrictions? Hey, Dr. Era. Sorry, when you say we moved from green to yellow, is this something that you calculated or you observed? Or well, you it's it's the I I had I had previously um, had some conversation with Svet then, and so it's the number of cases, weekly number of cases divided by the population per hundred thousand. So the 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 limits that the province published said that when you go over uh, ten cases per 100,000 in a week, then, you, then you're in the yellow zone. So since we've had 17, we're now at 10.5 over the last week. Right. Uh, the thing is, the when the ministry calculates these numbers, mm -hmm. they might use the one week or they might use the two weeks. And truly, I don't know at this point which one they use. We wanted to have communication in our situation report that reflects their calculation, we have our own calculation, uh, but consistency is is uh, a virtue, uh, and uh, they would not be moving health units from a category to another uh, within two week period. Although they're calculating based on one week, and that's something I cannot really understand yet uh, until we see what they're using in the background. So again, saying that we are moving to a different category might really not reflect what the ministry is going to send us uh, early uh, next week. Okay. Well, if you, I'd, I'd appreciate if you let me know when you find out what they're doing. Uh, certainly. Uh, the the um, underlying principle is, is uh, the same and you're correct in that our numbers are increasing. How how much, uh, you know, if you look at it from practical point of view, is it still manageable? It is manageable. We have capacity. We've been proactive to increase the capacity to deal, to deal with it. Uh, the, the type of increase, if you have uh, um, increase throughout the community is different from one increase in one facility. For example, in, in one of the health units in Eastern Ontario, there last week there was zero cases in the community but there were 55 cases in one long-term care. And if you look at that number, you, you might easily conclude that they are moving to a different category. However, it's really not reflecting the risk in the community. It's reflecting 
one facility. So there are different ways to really look at it. The, the provincial uh, framework might be useful to simplify things. However, in reality, in managing these outbreaks, simplicity is, might not really answer the questions that we need. I'll be more than happy to share that, the information with you and with the group as soon as we have those calculations. Thank you. Okay, well, thank you, Dr. Aaron. I just saw that uh, or Millen has posted that today's counts are 1,575. So it is continuing to climb. And I just wonder, just for wrapping up here, is if Heather, maybe we go back to, because of, of the increased numbers here starting, if we need to go back to those Friday uh, Q&A sessions again, because there's a lot of questions here today. And I just, uh, I know we need to get moving on here, but uh, maybe that's something just to, because we, we were doing those earlier on this year where we had the Friday where, we did the Q&A and counselors could put in those questions and we sort of had that joint session. So maybe that's just something maybe we can talk about and other counselors that have further questions can look for that forum. So I do have it uh, moved by Councillor Potter and Councillor O'Leary for the minutes and the report. Is there anybody opposed to that? Seeing none, that's carried. Again, doc, thank you very much, Dr. Ayer and thank you, uh, uh, Councillor Patterson for bringing that forward. Uh, moving on our agenda then, uh, there, is, there are no closed Mr. Warden, you just moved, muted, yeah. That way, what part did you not get? <laughs> did you get right the part after, about anybody, sorry? Right after, uh, there are no closed meeting matters. Okay, I don't know what happened there. I was, I'm holding my paper, I didn't even touch the computer. Okay, so there are no closed meeting matters. Uh, moving into then um, some reports then for, uh, well, I guess that is, it. Um, is that uh, going to be? That's, that's one we just- We're on to bylaw, yeah, we're the bylaw now. We're on the bylaws, yeah. Okay, mm -hmm. so moving on then to bylaw 5097-20, and that has been moved by Councillor O'Leary and Councillor Hicks. And, um, I don't know if there's any, anything needs to be just, just uh, spoken there, Madam Clerk. No, sir, it's from the report uh, presented at the last meeting. Yeah, so pretty straightforward. So is there any discussion on that, uh, on that set of bylaws? Seeing none, anybody opposed to that uh, bylaw? Okay, that is carried. Thank you for that. Um, we do have a busy day today. Uh, we have a busy, uh, full agenda and the community of the whole. I'm going into good news and celebrations. So if we can sort of, uh, uh, don't want to miss anything, but if we can keep it uh, moving along, that would be uh, very, very good. So uh, I guess we'll, we'll start off with uh, Chatsworth. Thanks, Mr. Warden, and uh, good morning, County, County Council and staff. Um, not a lot to report. Uh, Certainly good weather for the harvest and, uh, you know, the, uh, the bean and corn crops have been, uh, you know, wonderful throughout Gray County. Uh, township office continues to be open uh, with all staff reporting in, uh, open for appointment only. Our arenas, uh, our two arenas are fully booked. It's nice to see you know, all the kids and uh, adults out enjoying those. Uh, just wanted to... Uh, there was Remembrance Day celebration throughout Gray County yesterday. They were somewhat uh, muted because of uh, COVID, but uh, in Chatsworth at the Cenotaph, the uh, Legion members did have a, a lovely little uh, service. And, you know, it always astounds me the uh, when they do the roll call, the number of uh, men and women that made the uh, ultimate sacrifice. You know, all of our towns and villages have uh, Cenotaphs. And when you look at the number of people that... Uh, that passed away. Certainly, uh, Gray County made their uh, their contribution, known throughout uh, the various wars. So, um, you know, our appreciation to uh, all the families that lost loved ones uh, through the great wars. Anyways, I think that's it, Mr. Warden. I'll try to keep it short. Thank you. And uh, Councilor Gamble, do you have anything to add, or Brian Cap or, or uh, Scott captured it all? Mayor Warden said it all. Just uh, one thing. Uh, Santa Claus Parade is a stationary one at the old arena site, and I believe it's uh, Saturday before Christmas. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Okay, moving on to George and Bluffs, uh, Councilor Bur uh, Burley. Thank you, Mr. Warden. Uh, we're still living the dream in George and Bluffs. So There's one very important thing I'd like to bring to County Council's attention. I, something, a topic I hardly ever talk about, but 
we're having a special council meeting. It's a public meeting and it's to have a great discussion about the war in Kabul International Airport. It starts at, uh, it's Tuesday, November 24th at five o'clock. It's uh, open to all of Gray and Bruce counties. It's, uh, you can take part by YouTube to watch the whole uh, program, or you can take part by uh, contacting our clerk to register to uh, uh, have a discussion or whatever about the topic. We look forward to everybody listening to get more information about the fantastic airport, and uh, we look forward to that day. Thank you. Okay, thank you, uh, Councillor Burley and, and Councillor Carlson. Do you have anything to add? Okay. Sorry, I think I was muted. I have nothing to add today. Thanks, Mr. Warden. Okay, thank you. Uh, moving on then to uh, Hanover, uh, Councillor Patterson. Thank you, Mr. Warden. Uh, just one item, please to say that our Legion held the modified Remembrance Day service with all health protocols in place. And although it was much smaller uh, this year, it was still a very moving ceremony. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Councillor Patterson. Councillor Hicks, do you, Deputy Warden, do you have anything to add? Nothing to add, Mr. Warden, thank you. Thank you, okay, we'll move over to Meaford and uh, Councillor Compass. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Warden. Uh, uh, just ditto with the Remembrance Day ceremonies. It's always one that I really, really value and appreciate and, and uh, welcome attendance at that. Um, it was a very different uh, situation yesterday, but uh, nice to see the wreaths at the Cenotaph and folks uh, depositing their, their uh, poppies on the individual wreaths. So enjoyed that. Um, Meaford has just gone through a, uh, I would say, grueling <laughs> two days of uh, budget discussions, and uh, um, it's uh, resulted in a, in a successful event, I think. Um, we have brought down a, a proposed tax increase of 8.7% to 5.14, so we're pretty happy with that. A little tired, but happy. Thank you. That's what happens and you got to roll up the sleeves. Uh, yeah. Uh, Councillor Cole. Thank you for that. And uh, Councillor Keeveny, anything to add? Uh, thank you, Mr. Warden and good morning, everyone. And just quickly, yes, our uh, seventh line bridge that has been under construction all uh, summer is uh, now open as well as uh, Edwin Street, which has just been resurfaced. Um, our Dragon's Den event through the Chamber of Commerce will be uh, live streamed uh, on video uh, December the 2nd and tickets are available now that you can purchase online. That event will be at 7 p.m. and it would give everybody a great opportunity to see how our, uh, how our Meaf and Dragons uh, operate. So that's an exciting event. Um, uh, fishing has been great in Meaford. We've been seeing lots of fishermen down around the harbour during the great weather. And I know I've mentioned it as, as Mayor Clumpus, I think the last couple of meetings, but our library really is going to open within the next few days. So we'll make sure you know when that's going to be, Warden McQueen. Thank you. And, and thanks for bringing it. I, I drove by there just in the past week and it looks fantastic. Yeah, it really does. It really does look great. great. Especially in your downtown, for sure. Okay, uh, moving on then to uh, the city of Own Sound. Mayor Body, Councillor Body. Thanks, uh, Morton. Um, 10th Street Bridge, the asphalt's down, uh, same on 16th Street East, so we're getting really close to uh, finishing both of those. Tom Thompson Art Gallery, there's an uh, auction uh, online for art. Some pretty nice pieces there that uh, fundraising are good for the artists. Santa Claus Parade, we usually kick off the season. It'll be November 21st, 7 p.m. at the Bayshore Community Center. It doesn't move, you do. Uh, Festival of Northern Lights are flipping the switch that night, except without uh, ceremony and without fireworks. Uh, we're kicking off our capital budget uh, deliberation tomorrow, and that's it for Owen Sound. Thank you, Councillor Body. And Councillor O'Leary, do you have anything to add? Nothing to add, Mr. Warden. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Thank you. All right, to the sunny south, uh, Mayor of Southgate, Councillor Woodbury. Good morning, everyone. Um, yeah, things are going great here in the sunny south. Um, we uh, There's been a lot of uh, the, the uh, service groups 
trying to figure out how to do things and moving on with, with things. We were really disappointed the uh, non-motorized parade was uh, cancelled in Holstein this year, but in its place they're going to do a stationary uh, parade. So uh, I haven't heard any more details about that except for that it's December 12th. Uh, and uh, so we're just, uh, we're doing great. Thanks. Well, thank you, uh, Mayor Woodbury and uh, Councillor Mellon. Anything to add? Nothing to add, Mr. Warden. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Uh, moving on then to uh, Town of Blue Mountains, Mayor Swaber. Yes, uh, thank you, Mr. Warden. Uh, everything's going well here. Uh, yesterday we had our usual two um, uh, Remembrance Day uh, ceremonies, one in um, Clarksburg and one in uh, Ravenna. They were live streamed, so there was uh, fewer people there. But I'm told that there was over 150 people watching live on the Clarksburg one and about 50 on the Ravenna one. And subsequent to that, there's been another 100 people and about 50 people for the Clarksburg one. So the, the turnout, although the public was discouraged from coming, um, the ceremonies were smaller, but there were just as many people participating through the online which was provided through our library and the town website. So um, that was good and everything went off without a hitch. We had CNN there, the Clarksburg News Network, the Clarksburg Village Association uh, also uh, produced the feed of their own. So everything uh, went well. And um, so everything's going well here. Um, I'll now turn it over to uh, uh, Mr. Potter and the apple harvest has been great. So you can see we have great apples here. So okay, well, thank you for that, uh, Councillor Potter. Uh, thank you. And uh, Mr. Mayor, when is the apple harvest not great? It's always great. Uh, just uh, to add, uh, the our military heritage virtual exhibit is still on at the Craigleith uh, Heritage Depot website. It's all about local families who took part in the uh, in Canada's military past, and uh, it really brings the stories home. So it's uh, it's well worth seeing. Even if you if don't live in the Blue Mountains, you you may uh, recognize some of the family names and some of the people, uh, and of course, lots of other things going on through the Blue Mountains Public Library. Also, the business areas are gearing up for Christmas and. Uh, there are going to be some lighting displays and, and various things like that, uh, details to come. So uh, in, in the interest of keeping it short, my phone's ringing. So in the interest of keeping it short, I will, uh, I will end it there. Okay, thank you. Uh, great news. Okay, I'm moving on then to West Gray, uh, Councillor Robinson. Good morning, everyone. Um, good news announcement, if I might. The West Gray Police Service will be holding a food drive and toy drive starting November 25th and going on to December 17th. Donations can be made at the West Grave Police Station, Granny's General Store and Germania Insurance. Last year, over a hundred families um, were um, provided the support uh, because of this initiative. Thank you very much, Mr. Warden. Okay, thank you. And anything to add, Councillor Hutchinson? Morning, Mr. Warden and uh, County Council. Just a uh, couple small things. Minor hockey's running well, and the uh, recreational rentals are up in our arenas, which is uh, good to see people getting out and get some exercise. Uh, the other thing I wanted to mention is, <clears throat> excuse me, Chris Wells has been uh, promoted to Director of Fire and Emergency Services in uh, Brockton. Um, Chris actually oversees both Walkerton and Elmwood, so it's good to see we have a, a chief co coming back in. Thank you. Okay, well, thank you for that. And uh, just a, a quick wrap up with Gray Highlands, uh, uh, Councillor uh, Desai. Thank you, Worship. Um, I'll start with uh, the water tower in Markdale. We're getting a brand new water tower. We've got a, we've got a crane in Markdale. It's a beautiful crane, it stands tall. You can, I, I can see it from my house, which is, uh, uh, you know, in one of the lower sides of Markdale. And it's a beautiful crane. That's going to be a be I can see Councillor Milton laughing over there, which is why I paused. I was hoping to find a better word, but I couldn't. Um, it says, so there's development happening in Grey Highlands. Uh, I'll, I'll quote uh, our, our mayor, uh, Mr. Warden. Grey Highlands is on fire. 
and uh, and we're very happy about that. Um, I also had the honor of attending uh, uh, the Remembrance Day service in uh, in Marcel uh, yesterday, and I hope we all uh, were able to take a moment yesterday uh, to remember and honor uh, the sacrifices of uh, those men and women, in many cases younger than I am now, uh, who paid the ultimate price, as well as uh, those who continue to serve and be uh, at the ready uh, to pay the ultimate price for the freedoms we continue to enjoy in this beautiful country we call home. Uh, it is important that we continue to honor their memory and understand uh, that freedom is, is not always free. And uh, on that note, uh, Mr. Warden, I'll turn it over to you. Thank you. Well, thanks for those uh, great words. And I will say that that's part of the reason why we got to build a new water tower because Markdale is literally on fire. I've had, uh, and, and council and staff have had a lot of interest for development for Markdale. And uh, again, it just it re reiterates that whole part of why we needed to keep the school and to, to expand that school. So I'll sort of wrap it up there. Our, I just want to say our four arenas are open. And uh, so we, you know, and I think we're finding that bookings are happening and uh, for you know activities, people are looking at uh, the best way of trying to keep entertained and then the arenas seem to be uh, booking up. So from that, I'll wrap it up from there. And Mr. Uh, Morton. So moving forward. Sorry, Sorry. Um, I see Councillor Hicks has his hand up and I know our director as well of uh, economic development, tourism, culture has some good news to share with council as well. Oh, absolutely. Uh, Deputy Warden Hicks, go ahead. And then our, our, our staff person, go ahead. Thank you, Mr. Warden. I apologize. I should have mentioned it uh, during my little uh, time. Um, I want to put a plug in for the Tom Thompson uh, Art Gallery. I know in addition to having their auction, they are also uh, selling a really, uh, I think, excellent uh, calendar. Uh, group of seven uh, calendar makes a great gift uh, for Christmas. I have some in my office if anyone uh, wants any. They're $20 each. Anyone who loves the group of seven will really enjoy this calendar. Thank you. Oh, there it is. Ian, Mr. Body, Councilor Body has one. Fantastic. Uh, and and I, I do want to say that at the TIO conference, I don't know if anybody attended that virtually, they were talking uh, about the group of seven and, and that whole uh, lead up to how it came about. I learned a lot that during that conference there. So thanks for bringing that forward. Uh, yes, look at that. Look at all those pages there. Thanks, Councillor Boddy. Uh, so then on to staff uh, from our economic development staff, uh, we have some good news. Excellent, thank you very much. Good morning, Council. Uh, I am here in place of Sim and Jill this morning. Uh, they are on the road for a site visit but I didn't want to miss the opportunity to give a shout out to Grey Roots who just received a Ontario Museum Association Award of Excellence for Community Engagement for the Facing the Flames exhibit. Um, that it launched in September uh, 21st, 2019. It was a collaborative ex exhibit that showcases stories of local fire and rescue um, from the Brave Bucket Brigades to the current uh, highly trained professionals and features more than 150 artifacts as well as an interactive children's exhibit which was now less interactive uh, for COVID, but, but still very much a part of it. Um, it was a tremendous amount of work that staff did for this and the community engagement was just phenomenal. Uh, there were more than 30 firefighters who were interviewed. Uh, so I just wanted to make sure that they did have that shout out. If you have not seen the exhibit, it was extended because of COVID until May of 2021. So there is still plenty of time to visit and view. Uh, and this was the third OMA award that Grey Roots has won since 2017. So it was a really big deal and I'm very, very proud of them. And unfortunately they couldn't be here to tell you, but I didn't want to miss the opportunity. Well, thanks for that great news, Savannah and always Grey County leads, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> great news. Any comments there? So do get out if you haven't seen it. And uh, yeah, I know that I was there and a few others were there when, you, when that uh, exhibit kicked off there. So that was great. Okay, I know we have a busy day. Uh, seeing there's no other comments then, uh, moved by Councillor Carl uh, Carlton and Councillor Mackey that we do adjourn. Anybody opposed to that? That is carried. Okay, we're well, moving into our Committee of the Whole. We do have um, a number of items here today. I do wanna say uh, in the past when we've had a long agenda, I think it's been uh, uh, prudent that we do stop for lunch. I know that uh, looking at that, this is going to take us into the afternoon and so, 
somewhere around noon, I would suggest that we do take a 30 minute break. So those that wish to grab a, a bite or whatever and uh, re replenish uh, themselves, and then we come back fresh and finish the rest of the agenda. And I know in the past we've tried to get that agenda in and, and uh, take a short break, but um, some, most times it, it doesn't always work that way. So we'll, we'll play it by ear, but that, that is the intent as we move along for today, because there are a lot of items on the agenda. So I'm going to call that uh, committee of the whole meeting to order. I'm going to say that's uh, 1036, Madam Clerk. Uh, are there any declaration of pecuniary interests with regards to the agenda that's been published? Okay, seeing none. And uh, so moving on then from business arising, we do have a notice of motion by- uh, Mr. Warden. Councilor, sorry. I wonder with council's permission, we do have a delegation that was scheduled for 10. If with yes. council's permission, we could move that ahead of the business arising. Absolutely. Thank you for that. Uh, is there any um, concern by doing that from county councilors that we move right into that delegation because it was scheduled for 10 o'clock? All right, hearing none, good suggestion, Madam Clerk. Thank you for that. So we'll move into that delegation then uh, from a number of speakers with regards to the community safety and uh, well-being plan and, and Sarah, Kali is, I think, and there's a number of people there are going to lead off on that. So not to hold off, I'll move right into that. Sarah and Thank company. You. Sorry, Sarah, we're having trouble hearing you. Oh, I'm sorry. Okay. It's almost like you're on, you know, on speaker. Can you hear me now? Better. Okay. You, you are sort of distant though. I think she was logging off and going to rejoin uh, the meeting, Mr. Warden. Okay. So this community safety plan has been in, community safety and well-being plan has been in the works uh, for over a year. And I'm sure we all have had staff or, or other people being part of that. There was there is a report further in our agenda with regards to that plan. So I see there. Can you hear me now? Better, much better. Welcome. Okay, good. Thank you. Yes, yeah, sorry, had to log off and try again. I don't know what was going on there. So. Um, as I was just saying, I am going to be the only one presenting today, but I do have Barb Beatty with me. She's on the steering committee for uh, the Community Safety and Wellbeing Planning process, and I do appreciate your time today. We will keep it short. You do have a presentation that we sent out, um, and I believe Tara was going to be sharing that with all of you and flipping the slides for me. Thank you, Tara. So we'll dive right in um, to slide three actually. And what, uh, what we wanna highlight for you is the importance of why we're doing safety and well-being planning. So this is highlighted under the Police Services Act. It was uh, brought into being uh, at the beginning of this year. And the goal is to really look at ensuring that in the community, everyone has a sense of belonging, opportunities to participate, and that individuals and families are able to meet their needs for education, healthcare, food, housing, income and social and cultural expression because we know these things will ultimately lead to a reduction in crime across the region. And so, as I said, this is process, uh, this is legislated under the Police Services Act and the two counties and 16 participating municipalities entered into an agreement to complete one regional plan. And at this point in time, I'd like to highlight, we believe this is the largest and most unique collaboration in Ontario. Next slide, please. So just to give a quick highlight of the uh, framework from Ontario. So the goal is to look at the four rings uh, or areas of intervention when it comes to crime prevention. And so as you can see from the image on the right, what we really wanna do is focus more on those larger outer rings, the social development and the prevention. And you can see the definitions here. We're really looking at those upstream interventions where we're tackling things um, from a social uh, determinants of health uh, perspective, looking at complex issues like poverty, mental health concerns from all angles. When we look um, further in, if you flip to the next slide, please, 
you'll see we want to we we know that risk intervention and incident response is extremely important but the the goal of upstream interventions is to see that we have to intervene in less uh, numbers fewer numbers have fewer incidents down the road if we if we hit those social development and preventive interventions where we're not having to deal with critical and non-critical incidents um, where we're looking at police fire emergency fire emergency medical services and child welfare organizations potentially having to be involved Next slide, please. So you can see here, so this uh, collaboration has 72 partners involved. So again, two, two counties, 16 lower tier municipalities. We have two First Nations partners organizations at the table, all eight police services, 14 police service boards, six organizations from children and youth and youth justice, four from education, that's all three school boards and Georgian College. We have nine community and social service organizations, five representing health and mental health, and six community committees and collaboratives that already exist that are already doing good work in all of these areas. Next slide, please. So just to highlight for you, uh, one key thing I wanted to share, of course, this project to date um, has taken resources um, financially and from a time perspective, from all participating organizations, counties and lower tier municipalities, but it also included the participation of almost 2000 residents from across Bruce and Gray who took part in our public consultation process, which actually uh, we were really pleased took place right before COVID hit in March. Um, and I did wanna highlight for you, one of the key groups that started this planning process was the Halton region. And when they did their first round of planning, they had uh, just over 500 residents participate and I think it's really interesting to note that, that we had three and a half times, more than three and a half times participation, and we are three and a half times smaller from a population perspective than Halton is. So our communities were really engaged. Next slide, please. Uh, would also like to highlight, we've had lots of support um, from the Canadian Municipal Network on Crime Prevention. They've really taken the lead in ensuring that um, all communities across Canada are supported with this planning process and we're involved in the Ontario Municipal Social Services Association. They have a working group um, of coordinators for the safety and well-being planning. Next slide, please. So our timeline, as I said, so many of you may recall last spring of 2019, we, we had a large meeting through Healthy Communities Partnership to bring this information to the communities. But then this work actually began in September and you can see all the phases of work through now to where we are, which is planned presentation and adoption by the lower tier municipalities. I will also speak later on about the indicator report that we've been working on to ensure that our actions are evidence-based and that we're able to evaluate when moving forward. Next slide. So our model, you have this in your uh, package, but it does include a variety of people who have a variety of roles and responsibilities. Um, and the key one I want to highlight at this point is uh, the action tables. But this is the phase we're moving into now is implementation, looking to implement actions specific to each of our priority areas of wit risk, which I will talk about briefly now. You have, perfect. If you could flip to the next slide, Tara, thank you. So for many around the table, no surprise, our priority risk area number one, um, both from a data perspective, so using our local data and from a public perception perspective came up as addiction and substance use. And so the areas that we're going to look at as we move forward are really uh, centered around regular heavy drinking continue, continuing to be a known issue um, because self-reported use continues to be tracking higher in Bruce and Gray than in Mount Ontario. Uh, we know that over half of our emergency department visits are linked to alcohol, and there has been a two and a half to three times increase for opioid related visits. We know that school student alcohol and cannabis use is increasing, and although this concern is not necessarily reflected in some of the local police data um, since the legalization of cannabis in October 28, we know that we do need to keep an eye on this and continue to track it. And we do see that addiction and substance use is the cause of increasing hospitalization and death in the region. When we look at priority risk area two, again, no surprise to anyone, uh, mental health. So we continue to see that uh, self-rated mental health indicators show approximately 20% of residents across Bruce and Gray are experiencing a lot of stress and at least 15% are seeking help for mental health issues. We know that more than 30% of students in grades seven to 12 experience moderate to severe psychological distress 
and a third of those still want to talk to someone but don't know where to turn. We also know that both EMS and police services in the region have seen increases in calls related to mental health concerns and that 211 calls for mental health reasons have also increased. Finally, we know that self-harm emergency department visit rates have tripled among young females locally comparable to the province and that Bruce and Gray males, 25 to 44 years of age, continue to have higher hospitalizations and death by suicide than Ontario. Priority risk area three was crime prevention. And although it's difficult to get a clear picture of our police crime statistics across the region because of the differences of reporting between OPP detachments and our four local municipal police services, we do have individual statistics for each of those areas. Um, and a review of this information will be extremely important as we move forward with planning for action. What we do know though across the region is that criminal court cases show trends are increasing over time for most offenses. And you can see there's a 17 to 27% increase across offenses from 2017 to the 2019-2020 year. Also a key statistic to keep in mind that we'll, we'll be looking at for action is that overall, although assault injuries are comparable to Ontario rates, the Bruce and Gray rate of emergency department visits due to assaults is higher than the Ontario rate. So we see a higher level of impact assaults in the area. The next two, we did talk when we started planning about having kind of the top three areas regionally that we'd want to tackle. But when we looked at the data um, and the resident perceptions, we knew uh, we couldn't leave out the next two because they are so intrinsically entwined in the impacts related to mental health addictions and, the, and crime itself. So priority risk area four is housing and homelessness. And we see in our area that compared to Ontario and Canada, we have more owned dwellings and fewer rental dwellings. Although, and uh, some also have more subsidized housing, so specifically Owen Sound, Meaford, King Carden, and Southgate. We know that over 15% of homeowners and all, almost 50% of renters in Bruce and Gray spend more than 30% of their monthly income on shelter costs. And this is a situation that leaves them only one to two paychecks away from potentially not being able to pay their housing bills. So away, that, that short period of time away from homelessness. We also know that average housing prices are increasing, although they remain lower than Ontario, and that we have very low rental vacancy rates in our region, which are similar to Ontario, but present complications for people if they're underhoused or housed in this living situation that isn't um, sustainable, where there are repairs that need to be made or that they're smaller than they actually need for their family size. Seasonal housing numbers are high, of course, in North Bruce Peninsula, Town of the Blue Mountains, and South Bruce Peninsula. And we know that housing wait lists are increasing as are calls to 211 for housing related issues. Finally then priority risk area five is poverty and income. Um, and so here we see that medium, median household incomes in our region are lower than Ontario and are the lowest in Owen Sound, Hanover and South Bruce Peninsula. And approximately 20% of children in the region still live in poverty. Um, based on the low income measure after tax. And this is the highest in Huron Kinloch at 30%, then Chatsworth, Owen Sound, Southgate, and Aaron are all over 55%. We also know that trends from various organizations are showing increasing needs for support, such as Ontario Works, Ontario Disability Support Program, the United Way Backpack Program, utility assistance, and 211 call, calls for foods and meals and utility assistance services people not able to pay for their food or pay for their utilities. And we also know that over 25% of our residents report spending more than 30% of their income on housing. 5% in the past year had not paid rent or mortgage on time. 18% reported not paying their bills on time. And 9% ate less because they did not have enough money to buy food. So as we look at how do we tackle those, Again, we know that lots of good work is happening, whether it's in a sector or an organization or a collaborative committee, a cross-sector committee. And so what the, the goal of our project in the safety and well-being planning moving forward is really to look at collective planning across sectors and between those collaborative committees in order to ensure our responses and actions are systems-based and are tied to outcomes that can be evaluated. So the plan is designed to leverage the good work already being done across Bruce and Gray by enhancing the collaboration and coordination of the work being done. That is a key outcome indicator for community safety and well-being planning is to help bring that work together and to organize it and coordinate it better. Next slide. 
And so when I talked about the indicator report early on, that is really with the goal of facilitating outcome evaluation. So although not originally on the work plan for this project, we determined that an indicator for report was really necessary because it will bring together all of the local data. And there is a lot, there is a significant amount of local data that we can use to drive our outcome evaluation. Um, but it's in many places. And so we really wanted to create a safety and well-being indicator report that would allow us to look at all of the categories, uh, priority areas of risk, and determine what were some indicators and actions that we could take so that we can start to trend and track whether or not we're making improvements in those areas. And so, as I said, ultimately, this report will facilitate outcome evaluation using our local data and will be a resource for the advisory committee and the identified action tables. Next slide. So sustainability, all the two counties and the lower tiers are of course planning budgets right now. Um, and the current discussion around budget is to uh, have everyone participate in the planning process in the same way they did financially for the first year for this year, to hire a coordinator to really assist in determining the work and driving those action plans forward and looking at the evaluation. Because we know without resourcing, um, the momentum of the project is at risk but by pooling resources, there will be a reduction in the duplication of work and the overall implementation costs for individual local municipalities. So we'll have a really streamlined approach, which again, um, need to highlight across the province is extremely helpful and unique. And so when we look at next steps for Bruce and Gray, moving from phase one, which was planned creation, which we've come to, um, and into phase two implementation, if we could flip to the next slide, Tara. Thank you. So of course we're presenting to county councils for endorsement now, and then I am presenting to all of the 16 participating lower tier municipal councils uh, to support their approval by resolution of the plan. We will be, then be posting the plan and that indicator report once it's finalized on our website. We'll have that annual budget confirmation for sustainability, continue with the coordinator work to drive this uh, action forward. We'll look at the action tables and those local committees and organizations already doing the great work to help organize them around those priority areas of risk. Look at what are the individual actions and evaluation outcomes. Um, and then we will look at the implementation, monitoring, evaluation, and revision of the plan with annual progress reports to the advisory committee, council, and to the ministry as well under the legislation. So any okay, questions? Sarah? We're just Thank you for that uh, report and uh, a lot of hard work's gone into that. And uh, I uh, just want to say that um, certainly with COVID-19, I'm sure that is, hasn't helped on the mental health part of what you're finding. We actually have found Warden McLean that all of those people who were vulnerable before COVID are even more vulnerable now. So everyone in each of those priorities of risk whether it's related to housing and homelessness, whether it's related to poverty and income or mental health and addiction, it's just worsening the situation for them and we need to collaborate for more action. Definitely, most definitely. Okay, thank you for that. Uh, questions to our presenter. Are there questions from County Council? Uh, I see uh, Councillor Compass, go ahead. Maybe there's others. Thanks very first. much and thank you, Sarah, for a very, very uh, a comprehensive report. I guess my question is, and congratulations for getting this much done in a, in a time when COVID has uh, impacted all of us. My question was um, whether your public engagement has been through, mostly through uh, the surveys, through SurveyMonkey or whatever vehicle you use, or have you actually been able to talk with individual groups and, and um, individuals? Um, my second question part to that was in terms of, of uh, the, the impact of COVID and whether or not there's been some thought given to um, might some of the answers to the survey questions be a little different now um, or in intensity, if nothing else, uh, uh, after we have gone through this uh, experience of COVID and, and coping with emergencies and that kind of thing. Thank you so much for your question. Uh, the engagement piece first. Definitely the engagement we were able to uh, do before COVID started and all the, of course, community activities and, and groupings of people shut down was online. So our it was a community engagement survey um, that we were able to uh, conclude. I'm online. sorry. Oh, are you not able to hear me? No, I couldn't hear you. 
Oh, others are saying yes. Okay, can you hear me now? Garbled, but just speak okay. clearly, please. Sure, no problem. So the engagement for this project for phase one did involve online um, and hard copy surveys uh, that we did get out to the community. Um, and as COVID hit and every, all of the face-to-face -face engagement kind of shut down and was put on hold, we really realized that we needed to be thoughtful as we determined specific actions for phase two moving forward. And so face-to-face uh, -face engagement with people in, uh, with lived experience, with other residents in the community for each of those priority action areas will happen as we start to look at developing of individual action plans. So that is the goal. For the second piece around the impact of COVID, certainly uh, we know that our survey is pre-COVID, pretty much pre-COVID information. There was a bit of a, you know, a week or two overlap, but certainly people weren't feeling the impacts of COVID as early as March uh, 15th, although schools were closed at that time. Um, and so we know that we have a significant part to play in the information, the data collection and the tracking of the impacts of COVID on people as we move forward. So that survey, re-administering that community engagement survey will be key in looking at what those impacts of COVID have been um, and analyzing how, to what extent things have improved or worsened for various groups across the region. So we do see safety and well-being planning as a, a significant and integral part of the recovery process related to COVID. Thank you. You're welcome. Other questions Mr. from County Council? Mr. Warden, I did see Ms. Uh, Councilor Millen's hand. Okay, go ahead, Councilor Millen. Thank you, Mr. Warden. Um, I'm struck by the, uh, and thank you, Sarah, for that report. It's very good uh, from what I can see so far. Um, I'm struck by the similarity to some of the conclusions you've come to that we're seeing on the uh, Hanover Own Sound uh, Task Force, so the parallels there. Uh, mm -hmm. My question is regarding the uh, individual municipalities. You're looking for approval or endorsement for the lo local municipalities. Is is this going to be sort of like the uh, Russian polar bear? Somebody, Grey Highlands, uh, are they going to have a veto on this so it's all or nothing? Or what happens in the scenario where uh, an individual municipality says uh, no? So I'm happy, I'm happy to address that. And then if Barb has further comments, I'll get her to speak to it as well. The goal here is that everyone who's, who is participating now would continue to participate. Um, as you know, we do have one lower tier municipality who, who hasn't participated in phase one and, and they're doing this work independently. Um, but if uh, the goal is that if those groups don't buy in for phase two, we would continue with the regional work with the participating municipalities, but under the legislation, those individual municipalities have to do the planning evaluation on their own. So they have to continue with this work, whether it's with us or independently. Um, and so of course, our goal is to ensure that we're being really resource efficient. Um, and that's why having one coordinator doing one large project, supporting everyone to do the work um, was seen to be the most efficient from a resource perspective. But they, they, are still, they, they do still have to do the work themselves if they don't buy in. Excellent. Thank you very much. You're welcome. So just be careful looking far into the future, Councillor Mullen. And thank you, Sarah. <laughs> uh, um, Councillor so Robinson? I had, I I Council, yeah, Councillor Robinson. That's what I'm next to you. Okay, go ahead, Councillor Robinson. Well, thank you, Mr. Warden. And through you, I, I just want to say congratulations for all of the work that has been done so far. I really appreciate the data that has been presented today. Much of that is extremely um, shall I say startling that individuals are living two paychecks away from uh, you know, a really crucial uh, time in their, in their quality of life. Um, I'm looking forward also to the continued data collection so that uh, certainly this county and uh, our, our county um, lower tiers are able to utilize the information in decision-making and priority setting. Um, so it's extremely important. The other point I, I would like to make is that our West Gray Police Service will be attending the, um, your delegation when, it, when your delegation is scheduled for West Gray Council. So we are looking forward to additional information. Thank you very much. You're welcome. 
And just to speak to that, to the local data, certainly we do have survey data specific to municipalities and the municipalities have been provided with their individual responses um, from the survey. And we also, the goal is to tie that to that local data in the indicator report to be able to help with locally driven responses. So although we know all five of these top five priority areas for risk are across the region, there may be something specific to a municipality that we would then want to support them to address. So we do want to make sure that that continues as well, that local, that local work and the regional work at the same time. Thank you. You're welcome. I think Sorry, I, my my comment there about the Russians. I hope that didn't affect the warden's feed there. I think the warden is frozen, so <laughs> I'll just, um, <laughs> Councillor Keaveny. Uh, thank you, Mr. Warden. And I just wondered, Sarah, if I could ask if you would be presenting as well to our affordable housing task force so much of the information you've gathered is uh, related to housing. And I'm just wondering uh, how else you may be uh, sharing the information besides uh, to each of the lower tiers. Thank you for that. At this point in time, um, when you see the plan or if you go to our website, you can see all of the current partners, those 72 partners who are sitting at the table. Um, and so the counties and the groups that are involved in that housing task force are at the table. So I would tell you that they will have all of this information and we will be working very closely with them as we move to action to determine what specific items do we need to tackle together. Right, no, no one sector and no one organization can do this alone. So we will be working very closely with those groups to determine that work. Thank you. You're welcome. Mr. Warden, you are on mute. I'm on the county's uh, internet here and I disappeared there for a while. <laughs> um, I thought it'd be the best spot would be here. So anyway, uh, sorry about that. Um, I, I, Sign back in. So I don't know if others in the county building are having the same issue, but um, are there any other uh, questions to Sarah? All right. So, uh, well, thank you very much. We're going to be dealing with this item later on on our agenda. And certainly, again, uh, thank you for presenting this, Sarah, and, and all the hard work that you and all the others have been doing. And we look forward to getting approval from all the lower tier municipalities to moving into the phase two portion of this. So, thank you again. Thank you, Mr. Warden. Okay, so uh, it is 11.03. We'll move back. Our next delegation is 11.15. So we'll move into the business arising again. And this is going back to the notice of motion by Councillor Desai. And at this time, uh, Councillor Desai, I'm going to pass it over to you because you are moving this, but we will need a seconder if uh, you're convincing enough to arrest the County Council. Thank you, uh, Mr. Warden. Uh, I'm a little surprised there isn't a seconder for this, um, well, but none just for that, so. Madam, We do need Madam a seconder Clerk, before Councillor Desai can speak uh, to the, his motion. I will second it, Madam Clerk. Councillor Millen. Councillor Millen, okay, there you go. Go ahead, Councillor Desai. Thank you very much, Mr. Warden. Uh, so the reason for presenting this uh, notice of motion or this motion today, uh, Mr. Warden, is quite simple. Um, a number of times uh, the Premier has referred to uh, having a partnership with municipalities. A number of times the Premier has referred to um, municipalities being in, a, in the best position to know how their money is being spent. Uh, yet when a shove, a push comes to shove, um, it seems that the province has unilaterally almost decided that um, they would like to take away the option of ranked ballots. A number of municipalities uh, have invested in um, uh, having the option for ranked ballots. Uh, London was one which did it in 2018. Kingston and Cambridge had the question on the ballot in 2018, and they were moving towards having uh, the ranked ballot in 2022. Um, if memory serves, Meaford was uh, starting to uh, undertake that process as well uh, on seeing um, on, on seeing on, on um, going towards ranked ballots, if I'm not mistaken, um, but they've had to pull the plug on that. Um, a recent report from the City of London shows that London would now have to spend another half a million dollars in order to go back to 
uh, the, the regular uh, first pass the post ballot, uh, which means that they'll be using a total of a million dollars uh, for one election being the 2018 election. I don't think that's acceptable. Uh, I don't think uh, it's fair to municipalities, uh, the lack of uh, consultation that was done on this. And I think in, in the spirit of a fair partnership, uh, we should uh, be expressing our um, uh, displeasure of this uh, item to the um, uh, to to the province, and which is why I've brought the uh, motion forward. Thank you, Mr. Warden. Uh, thank you for that. And Councilor Millen, do you wish to speak to it as well? Go ahead. I, I just had a question for I uh, per, uh, perhaps yourself and uh, Councilor uh, uh, Robinson. I'm just wondering uh, what's what Amos' position is on this. So I can I can sort of speak to uh, this came out. In that bill, there has been some discussion at the MOU table, which I can't speak to uh, directly because of the MOU relationship. But certainly, there has been some, I think, concern from uh, lower tier municipalities, as is being mentioned here today. There has been other parts of this bill as well, um, the date, and there's some other parts because they're looking at changing the the date of um, the I think you have to sign in by a certain date and they're proposing it to be later there has been some concern on that but uh um but again uh generally comments have uh, have came forward in the sense of some concern from from some or a number of municipalities well i would uh, if i might I, I would hope there would be some concern from amo because uh, at the very least it is ironic that the premier himself was elected leader of his party by the rank ballot and now to see him stand back and say, oh, no, 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 the lower tiers, that's far too complicated for them to understand. Us here in the big boots, we understand it, so we'll keep it here, but you guys can't have it down there. That's, in my mind, unacceptable, and AMO needs to step up and tell the government that. I will say that they generally, there has been, there has been conversations going on. I will say that. And that's part of AMO's... Uh, part of AMO's uh, relationship through that MOU, and I have to be very careful as on the executive part, is uh, I can't disclose other things that are in that, in that closed session. But I will say that AMO is having those conversations. Uh, trust me in that. I don't know if, Christine, you have anything to add, uh, add to that, maybe from the uh, Roma per uh, per uh, perspective, Christine. So what I would say is with, uh, with any upcoming um, meetings with regard to Roma or uh, AMO, uh, we will uh, deliver that information to Gray County um, and have that discussion at the appropriate time. Thank you. And I just want to add, this sort of came out of uh, left field. I'll leave it at that. I think, I think we're all aware of all of a sudden there it was, right? So which is very un unusual for the process that is normally, you know, gone through. Um, I don't know, going back to you, Dr. Councillor Desai, I'm like to say Dr. Desai. Councillor Desai, do you have anything to add to that from your notice of motion? From I think the information you, that you've gathered? Thank you, Mr. Warden. I've been led to believe there used to be a Dr. Desai in Owen Sound. Uh, when I was at uh, Georgian College in Barrie, uh, quite a few people asked me if I was related to him. Uh, I'm, I'm not, for the record, I guess. Um, just to add to this, uh, I, I did send in an email as well to Graydon Smith, the uh, pre uh, president of AMO and, uh, and the mayor of uh, Bracebridge. Uh, and at, he, he had told me at the time that he would be speaking in his position as AMO president with, uh, at the um, uh, standing committee uh, on Wednesday, um, a week ago yesterday. Um, I've heard reports since uh, I was unable to see the video of the, of the committee meeting because we, we had our own council meeting that day. Um, so I'm, I, I can't confirm this, but, but I have heard that AMO was not given an opportunity to speak at the committee. Uh, I don't know if either you or Councillor Robinson can uh, comment on that or, con or confirm that, uh, but AMO has published a position uh, on, the, on the issue. Um, and so I think that the more support there is behind Amos' position, uh, the better uh, it will be. And so uh, with, 
having said that, Your Worship, I'd like to add a final clause to the motion um, that it be forwarded to our uh, local MPP and uh, the Office of the Premier, the Office of the Ministry of Municipal Affairs and Housing, uh, as well as all AMO municipalities. And um, that uh, under, um, under uh, I think it's number 26, of, of our procedural bylaw, uh, that this be uh, uh, this be given action prior to ratification at the uh, next council meeting. Uh, thank you, Mr. Warden. Uh, uh, thank you, uh, Councilor Desai. And procedurally, uh, Madam Clerk, do we need this an amendment, or is this can be added to his notice of motion as 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 a friendly well, we amendment? Need it. We'll need it as an amendment, and I'm assuming that uh, Councilor Desai would move that amendment. So we would be looking um, for a seconder. And just so I have it clear, um, all AMO municipalities, premier, uh, local municipalities within Gray County and the Ministry of Municipal Affairs and Housing. And procedurally, 26.5B uh, of the procedural bylaw um, approval prior to council. Perfect. Um, sorry, it was, it was not local municipalities. It was local MPPs. MPs, okay. MP yep, thank you. Sorry, thank you. Do I have a seconder for that amendment? Do I have a seconder? I will second. Councilor Millen, thank you. Discussion on the amendment. Okay, I hear none. Anybody opposed to that amendment? Well, I see, I do see Councilor Burley's hand up um, for discussion. Okay, go ahead, Councilor Burley. Councilor Burley, go ahead. I think this is a very important motion I would like to record a vote on. On the amendment or on the on the full one? On the full motion. Okay, we'll keep that in mind. This is the uh, this is just the amendment part to add to this motion for sure. Okay, so I hear no no one else is uh, anybody opposed to the amended motion. Okay, that is carried. Now we have uh, the main motion that's been amended. Um, I guess going back to you, Councilor Desai, have you had any discussion or? or conversation about because I understand in that bill as well there is a change I think originally it was July 17th was the cutoff and they've moved it into September have you followed up on that part of the bill because I know that uh, that is something that faced as well thank you Mr. Warden uh, on that part of the bill, bill MTTO uh, has released a position on that I, I haven't followed that part as closely uh, uh, unfortunately but AMO has also referred to it in their uh, position on that and uh, Amos' position on it is that uh, if, if they do absolutely believe that a date change is necessary, that it goes to the second last week of August uh, in order, so that staff may have enough time to prepare uh, the ballots and manage the elections administration. So Amos', Amos position speaks to that as well. Um, and so in this case, with, effectively, we're uh, expressing displeasure with Schedule 2 of Bill 218, which includes all of the all of those changes to the Municipal Elections Act. No, that's that's quite that's quite quite uh, that's good to hear that because I know uh, that was positions of other people had been speaking with regards to that change of date as well. And just going back to Councillor Mellon, uh, we do have a, a, a full AMO board meeting coming up at uh, the end of November. Certainly, if this passes and other information that comes forward is indicated from uh, Councilor Robinson, we can certainly communicate that strongly as at the full board uh, on the end, toward the end of the month. Okay. Any further discussion with regards to this notice of motion? Okay. Seeing none. Uh, I think yeah, Councilor sorry. Bowie, I do I... see Councilor Mackey. Okay, sorry, Councilor Mackey, go ahead. Thank you, Mr. Warden, and I'm not sure who can answer this, but in regards to ranked ballots, it's still up to the individual municipality to decide which way they want to go, correct? Yes. And I'm not sure who to, maybe the clerk can answer that for me, please. Um, oh, sorry. No, go ahead, Councillor Desai. The, the clerk doesn't, we, we don't run elections every four years. We participate with our local clerks. So um, I, I do believe that it is up to the municipalities, but certainly I'm sure Councillor Desai can speak to that. Thank you, Madam Clerk. Thank you, Mr. Warden. 
Um, so as of right now, uh, without the passage of Bill 218, it is up to individual municipalities uh, to decide on whether they run a ranked ballot election or a first past the post election. Um, if Bill 218 were to pass without any changes made to it, um, we would no longer have a choice. Uh, all municipalities would have to use the first past the post system. Okay, thank you. And just, um, you made, Councillor Sai, you made a comment about the uh, municipality of Meaford. I would like to give the municipality of Meaford an opportunity to sort of to add clarity to that, just so it's clear. Madam Councillor Columbus or, or Deputy? Thank you, Mr. Warden. Yes, indeed. We had, uh, as the council had, uh, uh, had decided on the Monday, um, council meeting to allow a uh, referendum question on the next ballot uh, coming up in 2022 with regard to ranked uh, ballots. And then the very next morning uh, came the news that uh, ranked ballots would not be permitted. So we have now um, issued a, a, a further discussion on this and have uh, offered our objections as well to uh, exactly what is proposed here, section two of Bill 218. With regard to um, the election um, timing as well, the timing of, of the various component parts, but mostly uh, with regard to the ranked ballot. So that uh, information will be coming forward to all of our lower tier colleagues, as well as the um, ministers and involved and uh, uh, county council as well. Okay, thank you. And uh, we will be talking about it later on the meeting with regards to Roma. And I don't know if this is something as a delegation request as, as well. I'll just, yeah. I'll just sort of park it there for now. And, and that's something that uh, we can talk about later in the meeting. Okay, uh, Madam Clerk, is there anybody else wish to speak? If, if I may make a last closing uh, statement, Mr. Uh, Mr. Warden. Go ahead. Thank you, Mr. Warden. Um, since we, we spoke about Meaford last, uh, I, I did see the uh, the video from that council meeting, and um, one of the one of the issues that has been raised is the cost of uh, switching to ranked ballots. And uh, something that the clerk Matt Smith from Meaford said uh, was quite resonating. And it's a quote. And the quote goes, "It's easy for me to say as the clerk." Um, I don't believe you should ever make a decision about an election based on money. An election is the fundamental principle of our democracy. And so you should do what's best for our population and not what is cheapest for our population. And I think that's a great note to end, um, end my uh, speaking on this, uh, on this motion. For us. Thank you. Okay, well, thank, thank you, you for those words. Uh, thank you, Councillor uh, Columbus. Okay, uh, Madam Clerk, is there any other comments? No, sir. All right, I think uh, Councillor Burley had asked for a recorded vote, so I'll leave it up to you to do the uh, honors of that. Okay, thank you. Councillor Mackey. In favor? Councillor Gamble. In favor. Councillor Burley. Opposed. Councillor Carlton. In favor. Warden McQueen. In favor. Councillor Desai. In favor. Councillor Patterson. In favor. Councillor Hicks. Yay. Councillor Klumpus. In favor. Councillor Keaveny. In favor. Councillor Boddy. Uh, in favor. Councillor O'Leary. In favor. Councillor Woodbury. In favor. Councillor Millen. Yay. Councillor Soever. In favor. Councillor Potter. In favor. Councillor Robinson. In favor. Councillor Hutchinson. In favor. Motion is carried 84 to 6.
Okay, well, thank you very much for that, uh, Madam Clerk, and thanks for bringing that notice to motion forward, Councillor Desai and Councillor Mellon. So I think we're just a little past um, 11.15, Madam Clerk. I think we could maybe roll into our second delegation. Absolutely. And, uh, Mr. Warden, House. if I might. Okay. Yeah, go could, ahead, Councillor. Could we have... Could, could we have a five minute recess before we go into the next delegation, please? Absolutely. So we'll come back. What time, Madam Clerk, do you have? I have 11.20, do we come back at 11.25? Or is that 11.30? Yes, 11.25, we do have a full agenda as you noted earlier. Okay, so yeah, five minutes. Thank you. Council, uh, cameras and, and microphones off then, please.
All right, welcome back everyone. Let's see if my Madam Clerk is here yet. There, there you are. Very good. Are we ready to, do we have, do we have quorum, Madam Clerk? Uh, yes, we do, sir. Okay, people are signing in. So, all right, because we do have a long day, we'll, uh, it is on my phone, 1127, so we're, we're due to come back. All right, we'll call this meeting to order and moving on our agenda then uh, for our second delegation, uh, uh, Dana Howes and Jerry Glover, co-chairs of the Grey Bruce Ontario Health Team Planning Committee. And there was a presentation in our package. So I'll move right on to our delegation. Welcome. Uh, good good uh, morning, um, uh, Mr. Warden, uh, council and, and staff. It's a pleasure being back here before Grey County Council. It's been some time with the recent developments of COVID has had everyone preoccupied. So we uh, appreciate this opportunity to circle back and continue our engagement and, and update. We do have a presentation today um, and um, just uh, looking for guidance. I, I believe that um, the county is controlling the slide deck. Is that accurate? Um, I thought Dana was, but we can certainly do that if that's the preference. Oh, I can, oh. I can oh. do that. Tara has Perfect. started sharing the screen, if that's okay with you, Dana. Hi. Great. I apologize. I'm at home under the weather, so I, uh, in terms of coordination, I apologize for uh, any disconnect I might be creating. So I'd like to introduce, uh, obviously, uh, myself, Jerry Glover, and, and Dana House from uh, Hanover District Hospital. And, and joining us as part of this delegation today are uh, your senior staff, Jennifer Cornell and, um, and Kevin McNabb. Uh, next slide, please. So as uh, many of you uh, may appreciate that through legislation, the government in 2019 announced the creation and introduction of Ontario Health Teams. Uh, the auspice and premise of the Ontario Health Teams is to essentially uh, bring everyone together so we have the best coordinated care within a defined uh, geographic region. And, and in this case, we're proposing Great Bruce. Next slide, please. What is an Ontario health team? So uh, at the mature state, which is years away, um, we're looking at uh, an Ontario health team for Grey Bruce that is able and eligible to provide a full and coordinated continuum of care from A to Z for a defined uh, population within, our, uh, within Grey Bruce. We want to look at being able to offer patients 24 seven access to care coordination and system navigation services, and to really work to ensure that patients experience those seamless transitions throughout their care journey. We hear catchphrases like warm transitions and pass offs, but it really is important that a patient understands what the right hand, left hand is doing, more so that the system understands what we're doing so we can be better and more responsive to the patient. We look to improve our performance across a range of outcomes linked to the quadruple aim, and this is a ministry mandate, to achieve better healthcare outcomes, better patient and client and resident experiences, better value for money, and better uh, provider experiences. We want to measure and report against a standardized performance framework that is aligned and competes against the quadruple aim. So we're always holding ourselves accountable to the best standard. We want to eventually get to a single clear accountability framework, be funded through one integrated funding envelope and reinvest any redundancy and cost savings back to the frontline staff and frontline care so the patients really just truly experience the best care possible. And we want to take a digital first approach in alignment with provincial digital health policies and standards, including the provision of digital choices for patients to access care and health information and the tools uh, that go along with that. And one of the advantageous things about COVID, if there is such an advantageous opportunity, is the opportunity for the system to be responsive and put into place virtual care technology and that had been fragmented but this really uh, sped that up and that has been quite welcome. Uh, next slide please. So where have we been? In July 2020, the Ministry of Health informed Grey Bruce that our readiness assessment um, had been reviewed and approved and we had been invited to submit a full application. And I believe that's where we sort of left off with Grey County that we had submitted our readiness assessment and had been waiting for next steps. So we were invited to submit a full application September uh, 18th. However, we recognize that that uh, invitation was provided to us uh, in the middle of COVID and everyone was uh, quite busy. So we recognize that a competing priorities, we have not done enough uh, regional engagement to feel confident to submit our application forward. We're really trying to be cognizant of any tick box that we click off that we have really done the heavy lifting and the work and we don't want to provide lip service. So we requested the ministry defer our acceptance or our invitation and we landed on December 11th. Um, we're looking at all participating organizations will require board approval prior to uh, 
that we submit the full application. We want to ensure that all stakeholders have an appropriate time to review and provide some consultation into the document before we submit it. We also recognize we have to complete stakeholder engagement over the next five weeks, and that has been a, a tumultuous task. And I have to mention that, you know, even though we are providing this uh, ramp up in terms of uh, regional engagement, engagement is an iterative process that would be fluid and, and last the life until we get to maturity and then uh, thereafter to ensure that we're holding ourselves accountable and being responsive to the local demographic. Next slide, please. Thank you. Uh, the Gray Bruce Ontario Health Team Planning Committee uh, has, was created as a working group of the Bruce Gray or Bruce uh, Gray Bruce Integrated Health Coalition, in an effort to continue the health system collaboration that has already existed in Gray Bruce for the last 25 years. The purpose of this committee is to provide uh, early oversight and direction on the creation of an Ontario health team in Gray Bruce, and membership will evolve to include patient, resident, client, caregiver, and community leadership as the Ontario health team matures. And if I could just pause there to say, you know, the, the committee is to put together to provide early oversight, and we take this quite serious. And there is a distinction between, say, uh, collaborative uh, working relationships and governance. And when we look at governance, it's very easy to get bogged down in, in terms of reference. But when we look at collaborative decision-making model, we all have a vested interest and we keep things fluid and iterative. So when we progress, everyone feels heard and we try to hit the best pulse every time out of the game. Next slide, please. The current Gray Bruce Ontario Health Team uh, Planning Committee is composed of the following list there. All member organizations of the family health teams and community health centers in Gray Bruce, all executive leads of the three hospitals in Gray Bruce, the executive leads and operational leadership of the uh, Canadian Mental Health Association for Gray Bruce, Keystone Child Family Services, the executive director of home and community support services for Gray Bruce, the vice president of home and community care for the Southwest Lynn, three lead physician representatives, and the county director of uh, Gray for uh, long-term care. And I should say that that uh, um, committee um, is not exhaustive or exclusive. As we grow and as we continue our consultation, people put their hands up that they want to participate. There's always opportunities at the table. And currently the population that we're striving to accomplish that we signal to the ministry in our readiness assessment that we're committed to as a regional to advance as part of our first year objectives are two patient population types, improving care transitions between feral seniors, essentially hospital home, home to community, when you're being repatriated back home, is home oxygen there or the doctor's order there? Is home nursing going to be there, personal support? Um, and when you have to come back to the hospital, do we know that you're coming? Do we know why you're coming for? And do you have the transportation? So all those little pieces along the care continuum. And we also want to look at supporting patients living with mental health and issues. Next slide, please. So governance. Um, so I'll be sharing this presentation with my colleague, Dana House, and I'll turn it over to her at this time. Thanks, Chair. Um, so Jerry and I had the opportunity to uh, be educated a little bit more on governance this past uh, July. And really, um, it has somewhat been the elephant in the room uh, as there's different interpretations of, of what that means for an Ontario health team. So we were very happy to hear that the Ministry of Health um, released a document regarding uh, collaborative decision making. And so really, uh, there is clear direction for Ontario health teams regarding collaborative decision making. So collaborative decision making arrangements uh, rather than governance is the term that the ministry is using because this reflects that the OHTs are still very early in their development and their implementation. And it also recognizes that um, individually uh, as a group, we're all still individually funded and that we haven't determined our true scope of, of, um, of decision-making assigned to our OHT. And that will look different uh, amongst OHTs across our province. Further, uh, I, I think it's important to note that this term recognizes that um, the community context difference from region to re region. Different regions will take different approaches to uh, collaborative decision-making based on the roles, responsibilities, and the feedback that they receive from their individual communities. The intention of using the term uh, collaborative decision making is to focus on uh, defining one mechanism through collaborative decision making can build to support and enable progress towards a more mature state, um, including delivery of an integrative uh, model. The ministry has been very clear that they are not requiring that an OHT establish a new 
not-for-profit corporation, a legal partnership, or any legal entity. Further, they're not asking us to adopt a type of agreement between, a particular type of agreement between uh, members. So uh, they're not asking us to form an alliance, a network. They're asking us at this stage as leaders of organizations to uh, be the decision makers and to work on engaging our community and transitioning to a model. The ministry has been very clear that when there are leading examples of, um, of uh, shared decision-making models and um, they will share those with us. Uh, I do think um, it's important to recognize that this, this is not, um, this is a, a coalition of the willing, the Ontario Health Team, and Jerry sort of alluded to that as well. We will, um, you know, move forward. And it does not mean that anybody who hasn't um, been at the table at this point isn't welcome in the future. So we recognize that um, for various organizations that governance uh, can be um, interpreted differently and that collaborative decision-making uh, arrangement isn't necessarily comfortable with all. But uh, that doesn't mean that it, um, as we move forward, that organizations can't join in. Uh, next slide, please. Um, next slide as well. So I think this is a, a really significant slide with respect to decision-making that in the in beginning where we are in our development of becoming an OHT, uh, so the introduction phase, it truly is administrators that are uh, working towards uh, creating engagement with our community, as well as our um, patients and caregivers and various organizations uh, and making the, the early decisions. But as we move further, further down in becoming an OHT and as our OHT uh, becomes uh, more mature, it will eventually flip to be a community-led um, um, collaborative decision-making model that has uh, more community members than it does administrators. Next slide, please. And I think um, we've included the timeline. So uh, just as a reminder of where we are, just to demonstrate, um, we are truly in the beginning stages of um, becoming an Ontario health team. And um, the next sort of, um, doc, um, I guess, chart uh, de demonstrates that that shift from executive directors, health providers, physicians, and patients in Ontario uh, health team boards from decision makers and being informed to as we go to maturity to a shared leadership um, look. Um, next slide. And okay, and so pa pass it back to Jerry for engagement. Thank you. So uh, moving forward, uh, when we look at the Grey Bruce uh, uh, geography, we're trying to understand what we're trying to improve or what we want to accomplish. So in order to do that, we have to obviously uh, continue our engagement efforts. So just to be transparent with this group, uh, before COVID, we had uh, seven engagement sessions that we had just scheduled through Grey Bruce. And we had a big collaborative of about 160 attendees. And uh, the day before the event, uh, the uh, uh, ministry made us uh, cancel the event. So uh, we are now uh, getting back to basics, for lack of better words. We have uh, some standing committees on the uh, OHT planning committee that are already active. They include uh, provider uh, engagement, so when we look at physicians, nurse practitioners, community engagement, we look at our Indigenous communities, we have a governance committee that helped us get to where we're at in terms of collaborative decision-making model. And uh, that is also a, a subcommittee that helps us put together the slide presentations to engage uh, community organizations and, and municipal leaders such as yourself. So moving forward, we know that uh, we have to continue to do engagement with upper and lower tier municipalities. Uh, I think most have almost, and Bruce and Gray have uh, have some understanding of who we are and what we're trying to do. As recently, I think as November 4th, there was a presentation or delegation at Gray Highlands. So we're also looking to engage uh, uh, all the small grassroots organizations. We, re we recognize we don't have all the answers. We recognize that these are almost sometimes impossible timelines. And that's why we're trying to really have a phased and approach have a wait and see. Let's not rush this. Let's try to do this as best as we can. When we're just realistic with each other and look at capacity, you know, for the last 50 years, this system has been a, a patch of band-aids. 
So do you think conceivably that we'll be landing on governance or fixing all of the problems within Grey Bruce for all of our defined patient population within a year or two, or this term of uh, this government is, you know, impossible. It's going to take us probably 50, 60 years to get out of it and get it right, hopefully, uh, for once, once and for all. So when we, what we're trying to accomplish in improving Grey Bruce is wait times for home care. Uh, you know, I'm preaching to the choir, probably to uh, the broader public that, you know, when you get out of a surgery, uh, there's not probably going to be somebody there that has a role, role leader for you, despite all the best intent intentions based on supply and demand. The system's just not uh, set up and designed uh, to care for so many people. So we have to do business differently. We want to reduce the number of patients with mental health and addictions showing up in emergency departments. That's not an appropriate place. Neither is a police station. We need to have uh, people on the ground to be able to have the services that they need in a timely fashion. You know, four, five, six months for uh, an urgent referral is unacceptable in many instances. We need to improve access to primary care. Um, uh, physician recruitment, uh, we need to look at provider recruitment. And we look at uh, the mayor uh, from uh, uh, Meaford's on the line, uh, Barb, you know, she's been very helpful uh, in leading this charge up in her area as well. We want to look at increasing the percentage of hospital patients um, who, um, who see their primary care provider within seven days of discharge from hospital. It's very important to have that follow-up. And when what is probably most important of, of all things in creating a, a bit of a bottleneck is the reduction of the ALC rates uh, from hospital. Uh, many patients uh, in hospital, uh, for lack of whatever it's uh, occupying a bed, are, are able to be repatriated back to the community, but there's no place to put them. So their home is, essentially becomes the hospital, and that backlogs the system for mental health and, and same-day appointments. So it really is a domino effect, and we have to do better. And uh, having uh, a, a broad view and a big consultative uh, framework, we're going to try to narrow the focus. You no, know, Year over year, we'll accomplish more, but uh, like we said, we can't accomplish everything overnight, and it's just going to be a series of iterative engagement opportunities to make sure that we get it right out of the gate and really bring the patient to the focus. That way, they are at the center of all the care. You know, uh, for so many times, we can go to the hospital and you can see somebody down the hall and across the hall, and they're always asking your name and they don't know why you're there. How about we change the narrative? Would it be nice to know why you're there and 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 what you're who you need to see, as opposed to always feeling as you have to sell yourself and repeat your story? And we've heard that uh, time and time again. Uh, next step, please. Next slide, please. So questions for engagement that we want to put out to the broader public and, and to as elected leaders and not looking for, you know, all the feedback today and would certainly circle back uh, and, and and offline and would like to have uh, more of an opportunity to have some dialogue and also like to send you the guidance documents the ministry has sent us in terms of collaborative governance and the RISE uh, framework that we're accountable to and that would really help to provide maybe uh, a broader understanding of where we have to get to and what the, the systems and channels are that we have to work through so that way transparently everything that we know everybody out there uh, is aware of it. So we want to look like, we want to understand what does a successful Ontario health team in Grey Bruce, what does it look like to all of you? Um, it's not for us to understand that. That's why we need the public's feedback. How do we care that uh, caregiver and provider experience in that journey? Um, what can we learn from others in terms of best practices? And uh, what do we think are the biggest challenges facing our patients and our residents and our families you know, this year, next year, and the year to come? We know we have aging populations and young populations, and we're just not set up in the right uh, uh, aspect of coordinating care for everybody at the same time in the current framework. How do we look at our health equity uh, and social determinants of health and what digital solutions would we recommend for moving forward so we can really try to provide the best care to patients in their home if that's where they prefer to get it. Um, but certainly um, we know there's a lot of heavy lifting to do and we'd be naive to think that anything's going to happen you know, in the next year or two because it's a iterative process. We need uh, everyone's feedback and consultation. So at the end of the day, when we are mature, uh, approved Ontario Health Team for Grey Bruce, everyone has a vested interest in it because we've all helped form and carve out that, uh, that journey together. Uh, next slide, please. Um, so when we look at the engagement for our first year population and priority populations, we have to understand how are we going to be improving those care transitions and what supports are we going to be promising to people to make their experience better? Um, what uh, you know, opportunities for potential barriers uh, do we have engaging those year one population? Is transportation an issue? Is uh, you know, food security or instability an issue? Is housing an issue? Is homelessness? Really an onion uh, analogy, when you start to peel away the layers, you really help to understand um, the patient's uh, experience and view things through the lens and how the system can work a bit more effectively. Next slide, please. 
so that's, that concludes the, the presentation. I know that we had some time uh, allotted. To, I know you guys are running busy, but we'd certainly uh, enjoy an opportunity to have any questions and help hopefully provide some clarity or answers and, and looking for opportunities to come back uh, in the future to engage uh, uh, Great County, as well as any of your local municipalities. We certainly would like to keep, uh, keep you up to, to date as we move forward as well. So Dana and I stand uh, too for questions. Okay, well, thanks, Jerry and, and Dana. Uh, we'll need a lot of a lot of information there, and uh, it uh, looks like it's it could be moving in the right direction. So, is there questions from uh, from council, kind of councillors? Yes, uh, uh, Councillor Desai, Councillor Soever, Councillor Potter, and Councillor Millen. Okay. Okay, I'm writing them all down here. So, okay, we'll start off with Councillor Desai. Go ahead, Councillor Desai. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Warden. Uh, thanks, Jerry and Dana, for the presentation. Uh, one question that I had was, we're increasingly looking at rural medicine uh, changing uh, how it's administered, really. Uh, we were getting a new hospital in Markdale, but at the same time, the new hospital has fewer beds than the one we have right now. Um, so more, more and more home care is sort of coming forward as a... Uh, uh, as, as a uh, great way to administer uh, medicine and healthcare uh, to our population. So can, can you tell me a little bit more about how the OHT uh, would be uh, looking at making home care a priority? Thank you. Okay, Jerry or Dana? Sure, um, maybe in the first instance, I can turn over to Dana because it has the hospital connotation and uh, to just try to stay in my lane when it comes to that. Uh, so certainly home care is definitely uh, something that uh, we are we are definitely hearing from our engagement. Uh, we have um, had surveys sent out to seven surveys on our on our social media platforms and uh, so far 775 have been um, uh, filled out. Um, so so in terms of uh, your point in less hospitalization and and um, more push to the community. It is certainly something that we are aware of that we know needs to be changed. We are um, looking at how can we better integrate home care? Where does it best fit? Does it fit better with primary care so that there's that seamless transition um, so that your primary care provider and your home care provider are working in lockstep? Um, is there opportunities to ensure that um, there is adequate feedback. Oftentimes, uh, what we know is uh, we're not, patients aren't uh, able to share that, that things in their home aren't working as well as they should. Um, and, you know, then they unfortunately end back on the doorstep of the hospital. Um, you know, having that one number to call if there are issues, and especially with respect to home care, is something. The other thing that I think we would be uh, remiss if we didn't acknowledge with respect to home care is uh, health human resources. And I think this is something that is also plaguing, you know, hospitals and, and also long-term care, but ensuring that we have an adequate workforce to provide uh, that, that home care. And further to that statement is ensuring that it's... Um, adequate conditions around that employment uh, that uh, we don't see, um, um, you know, movement from one from one job to the other, that there's consistency, all of those things. So um, to Jerry's point, uh, home care is multi-layered multi and um, it is certainly something that our OHT is looking at and um, are hoping to work very closely with primary care and service providers mm -hmm. uh, to look at how we can do this. Okay. Any follow-up on that, Councilor Desai? Uh, no follow-up right now. Thank you, uh, Mr. Warden. Thanks, Dana. Uh, moving on into Councilor Sorever. Yes, um, and I think this is a great initiative. Um, just a question of, like, obviously we can't deliver healthcare without having doctors. And I think you just touched upon the other, people that we need to deliver it. So where does doctor recruitment fit in on all of this? Um, that's the first question. And then I have another question. We do have a doctor recruitment committee, but it's actually um, done in collaboration with other municipalities around some of which are in Simcoe County. And being on the border here, um, 
many of our, uh, well, even the doctors that are in Clarksburg in Gray Bruce are members of the Collingwood Family Health Team. And I think they're working on an Ontario Health Team that is um, uh, based out of the Collingwood Hospital or not based out of, but you know, it's, it's being organized largely by that. So many of our residents, uh, myself included, uh, do have medical uh, practitioners, doctors and, and stuff um, in Collingwood. And so how do these Ontario, where are the boundaries of these uh, Ontario health teams gonna be? And, and how do communities like the town of Blue Mountains, which look, maybe to Collingwood and Owen Sound. I know I recently had some health issues and it was great to pick and choose. You know, I, I went to the Meaford Hospital initially and then I ended up in St. Mary's. And But then when I had issues with the wound, then I was over at the Collingwood Hospital. So I was actually in the new system, I would be dealing with two Ontario Health teams. This time I was dealing with two Lynn's, which was great fun because uh, it caused a great deal of consternation when I was filling out forms. And he said, well, you're not in this Lynn. I said, well, yeah, but my doctor is. So how does that border issue get resolved? Yeah, I can start if that's okay, uh, Warden. Um, I would start backwards. And so I, the, those very, that very example of what you described, a counselor, is a, a big challenge uh, in the whole system that we're trying to redesign. So looking at uh, the virtual and the e-technology, so that way, if you are traveling between, say, previous Lynn jurisdictions or the proposed uh, geographic boundary of Gray Bruce for our proposed Ontario Health Team, is that no matter where a patient travels to access their health care at any point in the system that they have to touch or may need to come and touch, everybody within the system understands who you are and why you're there. And right now, the systems don't even uh, communicate. So, for example, uh, I'm a King Carden and the family health team is 30 minutes away. Another family health team is 30 minutes away. We share some of the patients. Our computer systems do not talk. We're still back to archaic uh, paper faxing. So we understand this is not working and people fall through the cracks and this is all these examples are how it's easy it is to fall through the cracks and it's unintentional, but the system has been designed for uh, maybe more bureaucracy and administrative tasks than it had been for the patient journey or the patient experience. When we look at uh, provider recruitment, we wanna look at you know, a, a great opportunity that was held in Owen Sound about two years ago. And it was led by the, uh, uh, in part by the previous Lynn and all of the uh, stakeholders and uh, Mary Clumpus was there. And we, we came away from that with a great understanding that maybe as part of succession planning, we should maybe have a blinders off approach and have a regional uh, a, a plan to uh, provider engagement to include physicians, nurse practitioners, specialists, and other allied health staff. Everyone has an important role uh, to play, whether they're cog or spoke, left hand or right hand, uh, it's all complementary service. So looking forward and how we how we need to uh, approach this is that if you're receiving care in one jurisdiction, hopefully through the virtual technology and the uh, one digital platform, hopefully getting all systems and all providers on one uh, EMR system. So we always understand where the patient journey uh, lies and where you're at in that continuum. Um, and the second part is, is how do we recruit doctors here? And part of this exercise with Ontario health teams is that so there's not necessarily a whole bunch of new money right away. We have to operate within our existing funding envelope. And as we try to restructure uh, these care pathways and understand the patient journey, and through a term called resource dilution, we'll understand where some of the sensitivities and pressure points are. And that puts us in a position to petition and make application for additional funding based on a business case. So it will be slow and iterative, but uh, to your point, counselor, this is one of the motivations of why the Ontario health teams have been created because of all of those sensitivities that you've expressed. Thank you. I think it's important to know, just to add on, that you know um, we may we may not have the answers today, but the, the point of the Ontario Health Teams is coming together, recognizing these these problems that are being raised by by our community leaders and working on them and advocating for funding. So I think what's important is we're talking about health solutions like we've never talked before. And we're talking from a broader system perspective. We're not all in silos looking out for our own communities. We're looking out for, for everyone, especially the, all across Grey Bruce and how can we make it better? It sounds like you're gonna get the left hand and the right hand talking. <laughs> Councilor Swerber, did you, uh, any follow up there? No, I'm fine. Uh, thanks. Okay, I think Councilor Potter. I'm going to compass. 
to the list. So I got Councillor Potter, Mellon, and, and Councillor Columbus on the list. So go ahead, Councillor Potter. Uh, thank you, Warden. Uh, through you, uh, uh, a comment first. Earlier in this meeting, I left for six minutes, and that six minutes was to confer with my uh, one of my doctors in Owen Sound, who was able to tell me the results of an MRI, a CAT scan, and blood work. Uh, in a matter of six minutes via a phone call instead of me having to go in, and sit in, in the waiting room in Owen Sound, uh, which I think leads, tomorrow I have another doctor from Barry that I have to, uh, via OTN. My point there is that that is at least in part the future of medical care. And, and we can't do that. You mentioned digitalization and we can't do that without, without a serious effort to improve our broadband uh, across our area. We are an area where we have a lot of rural uh, communities and small communities that, that don't have good broadband service. Uh, I have visiting nurses every once in a while. They rely on broadband to get treatment orders and that kind of thing when they're out in the field. So uh, that's going to be more and more important. And I hope that that will be an important part of uh, of what you uh, put forth in the future, because it is going to be an, an answer. We we struggle to recruit doctors, but one of the ways we can we can perhaps fight that is by making doctors more available, doctors and practitioners of all kinds, more available digitally and and through virtual meetings. And maybe you could comment on on where you're going with that. I, I can offer, uh, I, I don't know if it'd be uh, the best answer, but I certainly can offer that this has been a sensitivity uh, specifically raised, you know, the vast uh, rural landscape that we have, especially closer to the north. Um, when we look at, you know, opportunities that are amazing with community paramedicine and remote uh, patient monitoring, these really become hampered, uh, even though they're well-intentioned. So in terms of the Ontario Health Team, Gray Bruce, we know that a uh, recent announcement by the Ford government, uh, or the current government, sorry, is that uh, there is a huge investment coming to broadband for rural areas. Areas. And we're hoping that that's also going to be part of this strategy. So to your point, uh, Councillor Potter, I, I do believe that there is some uh, mediation or some recognition of these uh, 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 remedial opportunities in the rural area. And we're hoping to capitalize on that as part of our digital strategy. Um, but uh, thank you for raising that. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, uh, Councillor Potter. And if, I don't know if anybody has seen that new commercial on TV, the new Fitbit and all the health related things that can do uh, by wearing that Fitbit. And uh, I think it's even got a thing on there about stress and that. So, okay, so moving on to uh, Councillor Millen. And I think uh, Councillor Keebney is on the list as well. So go ahead, Councillor Millen. Thank you, Mr. Warden. And uh, thank you, Jerry and Dana, for your presentation. Um, you're absolutely correct. The challenges in the healthcare system are legion, and they're well documented and they're well discussed. And this, uh, hopefully, this initiative, the Ontario Health Team, will, will sort some of that out. But my question and my concern is it, it keep coming back to governance. And I, and I know uh, the, the, I think there was a comment in the presentation earlier about we don't want to get bogged down into the weeds of governance. But at the end of the day, somebody has to be a to the patient and to the taxpayer. And so, you know, I'm wondering, you, you, you indicated that the government has made it quite clear that they're not asking for a new corporation or an alliance or a, an amalgamation or whatever you want to call it. They're not asking for that. But my understanding is that the government is saying, we want to hand a health team one check and they will disperse it to the various service providers. So if that is indeed the case, what organization within the health team is going to receive those funds and disperse them? Because if the health team itself has, or the committee, or whatever you want to call it, has no authority, where is the accountability for those funds going to lie? That's my fundamental concern. And, I, and, I, and I, I've asked it a number of times, and I believe I asked you good folks the, the same question the last time you presented. And I still have not heard a real good answer to those concerns. Oh, Can you help I me? <laughs> Sure. So um, I hear you um, because we, we definitely get this. And that's certainly something that we have had that conversation with the ministry because we hear it uh, from, from all of 
from our community, right? Um, so the government has said, um, you know, a collaborative decision-making arrangement. And part of that is right now determining, um, you know, who is, because we actually do have funds right now that all of our uh, participating participating organization have put 0.1% of our budgets to. So those funds are actually being managed by the planning committee as, as such right now. Um, with respect to your point about one, one drop, that's what they wanna be able to do is one drop of money instead of dropping it to HGH, then to the Kincardine Family Health team, team and so on and so forth. That is at its most mature state. And if you go back to that um, decision-making framework by then, there will be um, a, a collaborative decision-making group of community leaders. We are too early in the stage uh, for, to determine this because we actually don't know our scope of decision-making. That has yet to be determined. There's lots of unknowns at this point that we can't just land on, um, on, 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 a, on a governance model. It will come. And, and I know that's probably difficult as someone who uh, is uh, very, very familiar with governance, um, that it's going to come, it's going to grow. Uh, right now, when you, when you ask about accountability, who are we accountable to? Our boards, our individual boards who are saying, who are overseeing um, my work as a CEO, Jerry's work as a CEO, and how we are using those funds. We are providing um, our boards um, with updates ongoing. Uh, our boards are getting together and they are talking about this kind of thing. So um, I don't want you to have the impression that it's, that it's sort of willy nilly with, with, with all of this, it's not. Uh, we are accountable to our boards and we will be, once we move to the next phase, we will be accountable to the public for um, moving and hitting targets. And as we move along, we're going to switch. It's not, it's not going to be a bunch of administrators. It will be community leaders with some administrative um, represent, representation. And how that will look, I'm not sure, but it will get there. If, uh, if I could ask. Go ahead, Jerry. Sorry, uh, uh, Mr. Warden, just to add to Dana's uh, point as well, that uh, in the documents that we have uh, from the ministry that are, are prescriptive, uh, the only um, uh, understanding at this point that they've been very explicit uh, with is that we have to figure out if we get uh, approved to move forward, where does the implementation funding land? And so that would probably go through the same channels that is being managed right now uh, with the hospitals because we have our trans, uh, transformation lead that we just hired. She starts actually on Monday, Jennifer Keyhole. And so that is a first full-time employee of the Ontario Health Team. And she's gonna be doing this full-time as opposed to all of us off the side of our desk. So she'll continue that engagement. Her job is to look at the best business practices in terms of governance and really help to drive the ship to get us there. And as all the operational leaders come together to support that one employee, we take all of our direction from all of our vested interest stakeholder member boards of directors. And through our board chairs, they're looking at, you know, how do we have a path to governance and what are the options to get there? Uh, to Dana's point, a mature model for Great Bruce might be five, six, seven, ten years out. So to put the cart before the horse, uh, it might be a bit premature because we haven't engaged everybody yet. And to assume that we would uh, um, be um, um, qualified to assume that we have ca uh, caught everybody around the table right now and formed governance around that uh, as it would probably maybe exploit to risk management opportunities to figure out how we're going to onboard other people. How do other board chairs get decided? So while all these uh, points certainly are not lost on us, we recognize with the broader uh, consensus is in the province that is collaborative decision making, higher transformation lead, rally around that person to support the work on a full time effort to go forward, look at all the best business practices and best approaches out there, synthesize that data, bring it back to us, and operationally with our board chairs will determine how to best to get there. And there'll be many tweaks, so it's probably not the best answer, but certainly it's one of the things we're most uh, acutely aware of. Okay, thank, thank you. you. Okay, thank you. Uh, next. Uh, uh, Councillor Compass. Thanks very much, Mr. Warden, and uh, good to see you, Jerry and Dana. Thanks for your presentation. 
um, obviously, uh, physician recruitment is is uh, is a big um, source of frustration in our rural communities, as is uh, somehow access to specialists and the distance we have to travel and the time involved and all of the rest of it. Councillor Parler really. Um, uh, uh, nailed the uh, comments that I was going to make with regard to um, distance at our uh, digital and uh, uh, virtual um, access to, uh, 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 you know, accessible access to physicians and um, specialists, particularly. Um, the rural medicine is really uh, something that, that, that needs an overhaul. And I think you folks are well, well on the on the way to, to making that happen because there are so many other options um, to be looking at expanding a, a, the special, or not, not necessarily the specialist, but the types of um, primary care um, workforce in terms of home care needs, in terms of uh, nurse practitioners, physician assistants, all of those individuals who can um, help streamline uh, the personal care and, uh, and access to primary care. So I'm wondering, um, and this is a tall order because it's a, it's a fundamental shift for, um, for rural medicine and is going to take a long time, we know that. But it seems that th this uh, Ontario Health Team's focus and uh, uh, movement forward is, is headed in the right direction on that. Will you be including that in your in your looking at uh, providing that care, uh, diversifying the types of care that's needed in terms of um, and instead of just uh, not instead of but in addition to um, the physician recruitment that we are all needing in this area. But what else can we do to supplement that to make the um, access to primary care so much more effective and so much more efficient. So a lot in there. Um, thanks, Barb. Uh, Dana or Jerry, your sure. thoughts there? Thank you, Warden McQueen. Um, uh, Mayor Klump, as you, you, you hit a, a couple key points, I'd like to sort of uh, just spend a, a moment or two. So when we do look at the, a distinction between uh, uh, family physicians, and uh, I say this loosely, so in an herb, uh, in a, urban context, you have a family physician who, you know, uh, might just have a family practice and, and they go home. And uh, I'm not trying to uh, uh, dumb it down, but for my understanding, when you look at a rural context, you have a family uh, physician who not only provides clinic uh, access, but typically they are the eMERGE physician. They also provide a weekend inpatient rounds. So that's a 24 seven job as well. In addition to providing eMERGE coverage, they're second on call. So there's always a doctor who's always uh, uh, local to, to back up. And then when you factor in those, uh, you know, that's about like maybe 95% of the role. Then you look at, we have coroner services. We have a long-term care that we uh, have oversight of. Um, we're teaching, teaching facilities, uh, uh, teaching institutions. Most of our rural physicians are adjunct professors at universities. So um, it's very difficult to understand the work of a rural physician. And so when we look at, you know, how to try to free up some more time with the primary care providers, we have to look at how we're going to do things a bit differently. So a couple of regional uh, initiatives that are happening right now it's certainly not going to solve the problem but just show you contextually or illustratively how we can get there so there's a copd a chronic uh, pulmonary obstructive uh, a program that we pilot here help pilot in gray bruce the ministry has now supported that and that brought funding that didn't take away of our existing services to embed the respiratory therapists and most of the primary care teams so now you're always being followed up and monitored with a, a pulmonary respirologist as well as an rt and they provide those reports back to our doctors when we look at uh, community paramedicine program and, and folks know and sound in Great County are really on the cusp of this in terms of providing that in-home support and those community paramedics, whether they're paramedics or nurse practitioners down the road or a, a combination uh, depending on the model, they are really the eyes and ears, uh, and ears of the family doctor, the nurse practitioners that, and that care team, as opposed to coming into the eMERGE, the you know, most expensive cost might be $300 just to walk in the door, but it's $32 mm -hmm. to walk in doctor. So we have to look at the synergies and how we can uh, accomplish this. We look at Gray Bruce, we have congestive heart failure, we have you no know, COPD and, and some of these other big ticket items that are comorbidities that are overflowing the emergency department. The people still need help. So to the point of the COPD strategy, there's a, a heart failure strategy that's trying to be initiated from the same company or same organization out of Western that just got approval for the COPD program. So I think it's how we work collectively together. We had a frail senior strategy that really was instrumental with the 
between Dana's Hospital and Southbridge Great Health Center and the Frail Senior Strategy of uh, uh, St. George's Hospital in London. And what that included, that had one social worker, two occupational therapists, and a geriatric nurse practitioner who was also a specialty in geri not only geriatrics, but uh, nephrology. What we saw was a huge intake to try to pilot a local demonstration that care transitions from when you're leaving the hospital, going to home and, and back and forth, make sure you didn't get caught. It broke down the service, the amount of referrals, it was so popular, but what it did is it proved, okay, three people can manage multiple facets that are cross-trained and are talented and working collaboratively and integrated in other sectors, typically not to inherent in, in, in our own business. Right. So those are good demonstration uh, pilot projects that we can bring forward. And some of these don't really uh, include uh, a lot of investment off the hop. It's just a redeploying of existing assets to follow some of these organic uh, uh, streams. So uh, to your point, uh, uh, Councillor Mayor or Clemens said, this hasn't been lost on us. And certainly I think it's how we uh, approach it through a different lens and rejig the systems so that we free up some of those rural physicians and nurse practitioners times to focus on those most acute patients. Okay. Thank you for that. Uh, Councillor Keaveny, I think maybe you uh, had a question. Thank you very much, um, Mr. Warden, and I really appreciate this presentation. Thank you. And I wanted to ask uh, Dana and Jerry, if I may, to expand a little bit on long-term care and what your role, your responsibility, your uh, relationship will be in terms of thinking of all the issues that have come to light through COVID uh, in long-term care and retirement homes. And, and also certainly acknowledging that thankfully we have had none of those uh, serious type issues that we've heard in the nude in Gray Bruce County, but we do are going to be building two new long-term care homes. And uh, I'm just wondering um, where you sort of fit into the planning process for those homes in terms of uh, the care that will be provided and the design itself. Okay. So I'll, I'll, I'll start with, with that. Um, so first of all, I think um, I want to, um, there has been some silver linings because of COVID um, in that hospitals and primary care and long-term care are working together like they've never worked together before. Uh, the communication has been exceptional. And, um, you know, certainly I would be remiss if I did not acknowledge the leadership of Jennifer Cornell. She has been instrumental throughout Gray and Bruce County. I want to uh, emphasize that in, in really ensuring that patients in our region uh, that I, 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 I call them patients, residents in long term care, uh, their needs are are represented. So with respect to the Ontario health team, uh, and if we marry it back to uh, the focus of our first year, which is um, transitions of care of frail seniors. That's where I feel that we will be working closely with long-term care um, uh, homes. Uh, with respect to your, your last question, with respect to design and uh, the care of the actual long-term care, um, that, is, that is not going to be something that the, the Great Bruce OHT really is involved in or comments on. Uh, we'll, we'll be looking as partner organizations as to how can we best support them and how can we work better together. Um, and, and these last few months, um, you know, have really demonstrated that um, we're in good stead to continue with that and as we further develop into our OHT. Did that answer your question? Yes, thank you. Yeah, I think um, long-term care is a, is a specialty that uh, truly uh, needs the experts in their field to comment and uh, lead the design and, and the care in that area. And I think, uh, you know, there is a ministry of long-term care for that very reason. Okay. Thank you for all those questions. Any, any further questions out there, uh, Madam Clerk? Yes, I have Councillor Woodbury. I think he's the last one on my list. Okay, go ahead, uh, Councillor Woodbury. Thank you. Uh, thank you for the presentation. Um, it uh, definitely heading in the right way. Um, and, and I think the way you're doing it is, is great. My question is uh, about, or comment actually, is, is about the uh, decision-making um, uh, framework. And uh, um, it, it does kind of have me wondering, um, problems we've had with healthcare in the past is that it was run by uh, bureaucrats that we we couldn't uh, didn't seem to have much input with and uh, couldn't get across what our community wanted um, and in your decision making 
uh, it, it's executive directors and CAOs that are making all the decisions along the way. Um, most other groups are just consulted. Uh, and the, uh, <clears throat> the chart before it that shows it's uh, administrators all at the first and community leaders coming into it more later. Um, from my experience, the more we have involved at the grassroots at the beginning, the better direction it, things take uh, in the, going in the right direction. Is, so it, it does kind of bother me a little bit that, that um, the community leaders don't have more input um, or more decision-making abilities near the beginning. <clears throat> Thank you. Well, I'll go back to that governance question a bit. Uh, Dana or, or Jerry? <laughs> Um, yeah, so it, it tends to be the hot potato in the room, that's for sure. Um, so I want to be very clear that, um, you know, we are like, we are so in the early phases of this, like, we are just trying to get into the theater to sit down to watch the show. We're not at the show. Um, when we are at the show, that is where um, we will have patients and community leaders at, helping to um, make the decisions of what it is that we're going to see at the show. Um, right now at, the, at this very grassroots level, it is the administrators just trying to get this off the ground. And we are doing this with uh, information uh, through engagement from, from, from um, various communities, uh, various stakeholders and patients and residents and caregivers themselves. So I, I don't want you, anyone here to walk away with the idea that um, there isn't uh, even community and stakeholder involvement at this stage because there very much is. Um, but right now, we're just at the very, very um, initial stages. We are being informed. This certainly isn't going to be um, uh, something that a, a group of stakeholders or a group of um, decision makers, executives, uh, just move forward with their own agendas. Uh, we're too diverse of a group. If you think at, if you if you look at the slide of our planning committee, uh, we're too diverse of a group. Uh, from hospitals to primary care to CMHA to um, to um, uh, CHCs, we're too diverse of a group to to drive one agenda. And I think that's important. Um, and we. And we know that if we're going to be successful, we have to engage communities and we have to listen to them. And that's what these, these uh, few weeks right now we're doing. And, and we intend to listen to them and we intend to transition to a model that they are at the table. So I, I can't stress that enough to this group because I think there is this misconception if we're not at the table at the hop, then it's, then it's all for naught. And, and that couldn't be further from the truth. Maybe, uh, Mr. Warren, if I could add to uh, a few moments. So uh, to Dan's point, when we when we look at where we're at right now, the ministry has been very clear in that uh, they don't want us to focus on governance for for the first year for the application. What they've asked us to do is focus on two first year uh, patient priorities or first year objectives. And so when we look at the decision making, we recognize there's an operational component and a governance component. And the reason why the operational leaders uh, at the start around the table is that for uh, you know, 15, 20, uh, however long years, We've been sitting across the table in silos, not even able to share hundred dollars with each other, even though we know that we can help each other out. So the reason why around the table right now is we know what our existing capacity is. We have the staff resources and we're hoping that we can move the pieces of the chess game around on the board in such a way that's gonna benefit the patient first. And with the operational leaders there with the decision-making authority, we can affect that change to allow and enable that process. Recognize that the transformation lead is on first and we have a governance committee that is resurrected. The governance committee with the transformation lead with the support as resource only from the uh, operational leaders will help to review and to refine the best governance approach that we need to work towards for that mature state. Right now, we're not at the mature state. We're trying to figure out, A, are we approved to go to the show to watch it? And B, once we get there, how are we going to affect some change with those transitions of care so we don't fall through the cracks? And how are we going to look after the mental health and addicted uh, patients who you know, have been exacerbated, especially during COVID? You know, uh, people are committing suicide and those overdoses more and more than they have been uh, in the past eight months. So while there is a focus on governance, we're back to patient care and patient focus and allow our board governors to help work with the transformation lead to look at the best way to get us to governance and what is the best framework for us to work under in the future. Okay. 
Are there any other questions in from county councilors, Madam, Madam Clerk? Okay. No. Well, I'm going to maybe uh, stop there then and, and thank uh, this is sort of the uh, we just want to get to the show. So this is the talk about getting to the show as it's been uh, described. And uh, I think probably we all want to get to the show. We just got to figure out how to get there. And and uh, I think that governance part is very important. And, uh, and Councillor Millen and Councillor Woodbury is to keep that uh, in mind as this goes along that process. And uh, we'll certainly um, it uh, will work its way through. So. Uh, at this time, I got uh, 1222. I think we need to take a break for everyone to go and uh, sort of replenish themselves. We do have a big afternoon. And, uh, and uh, Madam Clerk, when would you suggest we come back? Um, I'm going to say no later than 1245. That gives us uh, about 25 minutes. Okay. Yeah. So we'll do that. If everybody can be back here at 1245 sharp. We'll uh, keep moving things along for today. Thank you very much. And make sure you put your system on mute and uh, shut your camera off.
Well, welcome back, everyone. And I trust that everybody had a quick but enjoyable lunch. Madam Clerk, do we have everyone back? No, sir. <laughs> we do not. Oh, dear. <laughs> okay. The, you did mean 1245 today, right? <laughs> All right. Yes. Let me just save one. Well, I know here at the uh, county building, there was a lineup for the microwave, so. <laughs> we do have quorum, Mr. Gordon. Okay, I uh, just don't wanna miss anybody when we get into that consent agenda, if there's anything that people do wanna pull. Um, all right. Um, Okay, well, we'll get started because we've got a long day here and uh, need to keep whittling away at it. <clears throat> so at this time, um, we, uh, item five, no, item six, um, consent agenda. Are there any items on there that uh, wish to be pulled separately? I see counselor so ever. Okay, Councilor yes. Sewerver, go ahead. Yes, I'd like to pull item F, which is the correspondence from Mo and Sal regarding the countywide waste management program. Okay. All right, and uh, is there anything else that uh, wish to be pulled? All right, so uh, if not, it's just the one I have then, I made a note of it. So it's moved by uh, Councillor Carlton and Councillor Millen that the consent agenda be approved with the exception of the one is pulled. Anybody opposed to that? Hearing none, that is carried. Okay, so that uh, item will be, we'll come back later on in the agenda. So the first item uh, on uh, discussion and direction is uh, the um, with regards to the community safety and well-being plan and uh, barb is going to be speaking to this and it's moved by councillor robinson and second by councillor o'leary barb uh, do you have any comments i know we got a really good explanation there earlier on today and uh, i don't know if you have anything to add good afternoon can you hear me mr warden i can Oh, Not that's great. Okay, very good. So um, today I'm presenting a report. Uh, thank you for the opportunity to um, have the delegation this morning. Um, Sarah did a great job of summarizing the 18 months of work that we as a collective have been doing. Um, this uh, community safety and well-being plan um, is now in its uh, uh, final draft. It's attached to this report. Um, we're very excited. It's a 90 plus page uh, plan that we now um, can use as a baseline. Still lots of work to do. It's not uh, fulsome um, in that it uh, contains all of the information about Bruce and Gray with regard to the five indicators, but it does give us quite a bit of information. Um, so today what I'm looking for is um, approval of the recommendation that this, this report be received, that the plan itself be circulated to the local municipalities and for their endorsement and adoption as per um, the Ministry of Solicitor General. And then further that um, $55,000 from reserve be allocated from Gray County uh, to, um, to go along with the $50,000 that has been committed from Bruce County for a total of 105,000 um, to continue this work into 2021. And so I'll just give you a bit of background uh, in addition to what Sarah provided today. And, and I hope that you'll take the time to uh, go to the link and see the final draft of the report. Um, lots more that we're planning to do. And as you heard from Sarah, we are doing a roadshow. We're bringing this plan to each of the municipalities that are involved. We're coming to the health unit. We've been to Bruce County. We're here at Gray County. Um, we are going to um, go to the police boards and, of course, work with other networks and tables, including that um, 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 
particular uh, comment that was made this morning by um, Councillor Keeney about uh, the affordable uh, housing. There's lots of opportunity for engagement, and we've we've just got out of the gate with it. And there's there's a whole lot more to be done. And we are very excited that we are um, tackling this during the time when we know the most vulnerable in our community really need us to look and work at solutions. So um, rather than go through the entire report, I know you've read it. I think I just wanted to point out that um, we do still have um, quite a bit of engagement to work forward to, uh, on with our uh, networks that are in place. We don't want to look at any kind of duplication. Um, we are working on building on the momentum that's already here. There's been lots of collaboration that's taken place um, we're, we're historically known for collaborating in Bruce and Gray, but even more so during COVID, we've really worked hard, um, certainly in the social services sectors and others, including health. Um, but uh, we, we wanted to make sure that during the COVID response that we capitalize on how we are, how we've built an infrastructure to support people in need. And certainly the, the community safety and well-being plan will help us to connect everybody, even in a, in a more deeper and more entrenched way. Um, we know that this is obligation. Uh, we have to do this. And we're um, having the, the joint proposal and the joint um, plan itself is taking us um, in, a, in a direction that we have never actually gone before. We, we've done, as I said, we, we are historically known to collaborate across the two counties, but this is even a, a, a far deeper reach. It does require the um, services of a facilitator. Um, I sit at the steering committee as well does my partner in Bruce County, along with a, a representative from victim services, a representative from the health unit and a, and a policing representative. And so we're just the steering committee. Uh, Sarah spoke to that larger entity um, many, many representatives around the advisory committee. We already have um, our plans in place for the next steps, and we're looking forward to that indicator report. The indicator report is the, 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 the drill down into the data, um, even more information than what we've already got in, included in the plan. So um, you're, you're going to hear more from us. We are, I, I believe my schedule is already full with the municipalities in Gray County, and I'm trying as well to support our neighbors in Bruce and vice versa for them. So uh, lots more coming on this. And um, we are, even though the, the date was extended, we were originally required to have our plan in place by December 31st of this year. We had moved along in such a fashion that we were ready to keep going. And having had the dedicated resources, it's, it's put us in a position to keep this, um, keep the momentum moving. And that's what the next phase looks like for us is to have a, a dedicated resource to keep us all um, moving forward and, and building bridges and ensuring that we have a, an infrastructure in place to support people. Looking forward to any questions. Well, well thanks, Barb, for your You're excitement welcome. and your enthusiasm, and that's fantastic. Um, I'm going to go to County Councillors. Is there any questions, comments? Councillor okay. Millen, Councillor Soever, and Councillor Mackey. Okay. So, Councillor Millen, go, go ahead then. Thank you, Mr. Warden. Hey, Barb, great to see you. Hi. <laughs> The, the, the second point of your uh, the recommendation there in the report, uh, mm -hmm. you're going to circulate it to the local municipalities for endorsement and adoption. What sort of a timeline are you looking for to have it turned around? So I believe we're actually scheduled on um, each of the municipalities before the end of December. We've already got um, an opportunity to be a delegation and Sarah will present the very same presentation that she provided today, as well as she did to Bruce County last week. And and the um, we have a municipal... Um, a municipal folks, um, I forget, it's not the advisory committee. Anyway, it's the municipal committee. I believe they're meeting with us next week so that we can firm up what the motions need to be at the lower tier so that we get this um, done right the first time. And it doesn't take us nearly so long to circulate because we're actually coming to you. Excellent. Excellent. Okay. Looking forward to seeing you. Good. Good. We are too. Thanks. Thanks, sir. Councillor Millen and uh, Councillor Sawyer. Yes, um, th thank you, Barb, for the, the very comprehensive report. And um, so I'm just looking at the budget implication here. So it says 105 to be included in the 2021 budget, but that's the budget for the um, for the plan. So um, so we I understand we're we're only putting in 55,000 as Gray County. Correct, Lars. Yes. Yes, and. Um, so on that, we have one municipality that doesn't isn't participating, and um, certainly 
their taxpayers have contributed to the reserves. So um, when it comes out of the reserves, um, I guess uh, their taxpayers are contributing anyway. Yeah, and you know, as much as they're doing, um, me for just doing this on their own, we have been um, working closely with uh, their party when um, along the way, I'm not sure what their status is now, but we have staff that are engaging and trying to support them as well. And, and we've been sharing our information and engaging with um, their dedicated staff so that they could be brought along and um, ensure that they have a, a access to the resources that we do too. Yeah, thank you. So they are getting okay. some good value. They are, yeah. Yes. And so what, what kind of costs do you see going forward in the implementation beyond 2021? Good question. Um, we were, we know that this, um, for us to see the, um, the outcomes that we know we're looking for, there can, we expect there to be almost a five year uh, time frame uh, where we have now established the baseline. And as we implement um, the changes we want to see, and we continue to work with uh, the parties that are important, that are already involved. We know that it's going to take a bit of time for us to do some assessment and some evaluation. And so, um, in the coming year, uh, my thought was that after this year, so the implementation gets off the ground, the following year may be what what could be the five thousand dollar commitment on an annual basis per lower tier municipality, and that would allow for us then to still have. Um, touch points, it would allow for us to do the, the surveying, it would allow for us to gather the, gather the data and have it um, reviewed by the epidemiologist, um, stuff I can't possibly do, that's not in my purview, and so we do need some outside resourcing to help us with it. Okay, hey, thank you. I okay. just wanted to get a feel for the yeah. kind of the size. Sure. Okay, thank you. Okay. Okay, thank you, uh, Councillor Swerver. Uh, Councillor Mackey. Thanks very much, Jordan. And uh, I just wanted to pass along uh, my sincere thanks, Barb, to you and the other committee members for doing all this heavy lifting. When we first heard about this from, uh, you know, the Solicitor General, you know, smaller municipalities, we were kind of in awe of how we were going to pull this together. So, uh, you know, again, just thank you very much for, uh, you know, all this hard work and getting it to this point. And, uh, you know, I think uh, member municipalities can maybe be helpful uh, to the committee, we've had our we're having our police services board come to the council meeting so that you won't have to do it twice right, in our municipality. So I would encourage uh, other municipalities to maybe invite their police services board so it's uh, not a duplication. Thank you. Thanks, Scott. That's a great idea. It's it's actually um, exciting for us Go to ahead, share Bob. with both those sectors. So it, it'll be good to have both in the same room. And and the questions are really they're just that much deeper then. And, and it goes back to what Councillor Mackey says that we're all, and you said, Barbers, we're all Absolutely. working together. So, um, other questions? Other questions out there? And then, oh, uh, Councillor Patterson. Uh, just a comment, Mr. Warden. Thank you. Uh, Barb, you used all my words. I was going to say <laughs> pooling resources. There's uh, momentum happening, reduction in duplication. And uh, I think it's just great that we've got 72 partners involved. That's a huge amount of resources. So I'm in favor of this report. Thanks, Barb. Thank you. Very good. I hear, see no more, no further questions. The motion is here and it's been moved and second. Are, is there anybody opposed to that resolution? Hearing none, that is carried. Thanks, Barb. Oh, thank you very much. You have a nice day. All right, moving on to our second item on our uh, action item agenda. We have the corporate financial update and year end projection as of September 30th. And uh, Kevin Wepler is going to bring this forward. And we have it moved by Councillor Patterson and Councillor Woodbury. So good afternoon, Kevin. Thank you, Warden. And, uh, good afternoon, Council. Yes. Uh, um, this is our uh, third quarter financial update and, and our year-end projection as of, as of September 30th. Uh, we're projecting a year-end surplus of about 1.7 million, and, and, uh, but that does incorporate the use of any specific COVID-19 funding announcements, along with the use of the, uh, the federal provincial safe restart uh, municipal operating funding phase one to, to get us to that position. 
I was planning just to go through and highlight some of the, uh, the various departments and just uh, a few few notes of what, why their positions are the way they are. So um, for administration, we're projecting a deficit of about $82,000. Um, we've had uh, staff vacancies and staff changes, reductions in staff training, conferences, travel, which would be with those items, we'd see about a surplus of about 123,000. That's being offset by a loss in investment income of uh, roughly about 205,000. So uh, council uh, council budget is anticipated at the end of the year with a surplus of about one hundred and twenty thousand dollars, and that's the savings and salaries and benefits, travel, meal and accommodations, as a result of COVID requiring virtual meetings and uh, virtual conference uh, uh, occurring, virtual conferences occurring. Our information services budget is anticipated at the end of the year with a surplus of about forty one thousand savings in computer software expenditures, computer hardware costs, and reduced staff training and development costs being the main contributors. Our weekly indemnity costs uh, are anticipated at the end of the year with a shortfall of about $69,000. This assumes that the, the number and length of these weekly indemnity claims remain at our, our current level. Our workers' compensation budget is projecting a year-end deficit about 148,000. Um, biggest cost driver here are the claims and, and the length of time uh, these claims, are, the employees are being off. And um, COVID-19, again, has impacted the employee's ability to receive treatment from physical chiropractors, et cetera. Um, if your end projections are correct on this and, and if, if funding is needed, which I don't believe it will be, we do have uh, reserves for these because um, these are self-financed plans where we set the premiums each year as part of our budget process. Assessment is uh, projected to, to end the year on budget. Um, provincial offenses, uh, we're projecting a deficit of about $40,000 after cost sharing with Bruce County. Gross revenues are about 399,000 lower than budgeted as of the end of September and uh, with Gray County share being at that about 234,000. Ticket volumes and revenues are, are difficult to predict, and uh, there was a, a significant decrease in tickets written during the pandemic, and, and we're also in the uncertainty of when some of these the tickets that have been wrote will be paid. So approximately uh, 1,971 fewer tickets were issued as of September 30th as compared to the same period in, in 2019. Um, the, the, the decline in all that revenue is being offset by there was a reduced cost with court proceedings and other savings and salaries and benefit lines. So overall there, we're saying the POA, uh, we're projecting a deficit of about 40,000. Health units uh, and other funding initiatives are projected at the end of the year on budget. Um, the health units expenditures related to COVID-19 have been projected to be $250,000 for 2020. Provincial government has announced that the expenditure related to COVID-19, these emergency expenditures will be funded by the province if they exceed the health units 2020 total budget. Property uh, projecting a small surplus of about 20,000. Again, uh, savings and salaries and benefits um, from an unfilled student position. And then we have some lower maintenance costs and staff training development uh, and et cetera. Uh, taxation, um, supplementary taxation and write-offs, uh, the 2020 budget projection for minted subs and, and uh, write-offs will be a balanced position. Um, this projection is based on the estimates that I've received from the local municipal staff and, and the projection of, of a year-end accrual for any assessment at risk still. Planning, I anticipate to end the year with a surplus of about 56000 uh, savings as a result of staff being redeployed and their wages being and wages being expensed to other uh, departments as part of uh, redeployment. Uh, application revenue received to date is higher than expected and exceeds the 2020 budget estimate by approximately ten thousand dollars at this point in time. Agriculture anticipate the end of the year with small surplus of about thirty two hundred dollars. Um, this is um, surplus is projected based on fewer beaver grant expenditures occurring. Forestry and forestry trails, uh, budgets are anticipated of a slight surplus, about $5,100. Um, majority of the surplus is a result of the forest festival not being held in 2020, and uh, therefore the uh, 
$5,000 contribution to that festival is, is not occurring. Trails, trails budgets anticipated the end of the year with a surplus of about 43,000, largely due to trail maintenance projects being delayed in 2020 due to the pandemic. Economic development tourism, um, these budgets are anticipated to, the, to end the year on budget. As a result of the pandemic, economic development and tourism budgets have been combined to best serve our stakeholders through a refocusing of projects and initiatives to support economy to support the economic recovery. And uh, that was, um, Savannah brought that back in, in end of June on that. Uh, Green Roots uh, anticipating the end year with a surplus of about $200,000. While revenue will be down considerably to the closure and limited reopening of the COVID-19, there's budget savings due to staff redeployment, the decision to forgo hiring a summer students, and the postponement of the traveling exhibit. Um, Ontario Works projecting to end the year with a surplus of about $206,000. Um, that's primarily from the uh, OW and MIN and employment support budgets. Uh, um, where the big big portion of that, about 147,000, is savings and salaries and benefits with staff vacancies and uh, retirements. Uh, staff who have retired or resigned were not immediately replaced this year due to the pandemic. And as well, we didn't hire a student in, in the Ontario Works Department. Childcare uh, projecting to the end year with a surplus of about 61,000. Um, savings there, uh, again, elimination of part-time salaries, savings and staff training, conferences, travel, and building maintenance during the closure period for the early on center. Uh, housing department is anticipating a $279,000 operating budget surplus. Um, biggest portion of that we're anticipating salaries and benefits to be underspent by about 300,000. Um, we had unexpected staff changes and then later hiring of, of, of uh, two staff positions. Um, also, again, it's a, a theme through most of these budget is the reduction in staff training and development, travel, meals, and, and stuff that are occurring because of uh, things moving to virtual or, or things being canceled. Long-term care, I'm just gonna speak as a portfolio overall. It, it's estimated to end of the year with a, a balanced budget. Um, this balanced budget is based on using 700 and approximately 773,000 in the federal provincial safe restart funding, a phase one funding, along with 1.1 million in prevention and containment funding. And also there was 1.1 million in temporary pandemic pay to, paid out to the employees in long-term care. Um, the uh, pandemic, uh, our par par pandemic, paramedic services um, is projected a year-end operating surplus, about $190,000. Um, we received uh, 140, almost $141,000 more in uh, provincial revenue in this budget. Um, we've in, there was temporary pandemic pay costs of about $308,000, which have been funded by the province. Um, COVID-19 related wage benefit and supply costs have totaled about $578,000 at the end of the, uh, September. And now the Ministry, have, Ministry of Health has request, requested projected 2020 COVID-19 costs, uh, what we think those will be for the year. Um, so we're still waiting, that, or we're assuming that we're gonna see a funding announcement from, from the province on this to help paramedic services operations in the province. But uh, at this time, we've not received anything, uh, any announcements on that. Um, Transportation services uh, projecting a year-end operating service about 100,000 and a 700,000 dollar capital surf, uh, surplus. Um, the biggest thing there is uh, the, the tendered award amounts for two jobs come in under under what we had budgeted. So, um, transportation services is in a good position. So, I wanted to, to finalize up about the COVID-19 impacts and funding. Um, the COVID-19 pandemic has had a significant impact on the finances and the operations of the County of Gray. Expenditures related to COVID-19 have occurred as a result of provincial directives that have been received from either the Ministry of Long-Term Care, Ministry of Health, or the Chief Medical Officer of Health for Ontario. This has increased, and this included increased spending related to additional staff, personal protective equipment, cleaning supplies, equipment to support infection, prevention and control measures, and screening and testing initiatives. 
Due to the measures that must be taken to mitigate the impact of COVID-19 on the public's health and financial well-being, well -being, all levels of government has stepped up to provide assistance. The table in the, in, uh, in the package on pages 45 and 46 represents a summary of the COVID-19 related funding announcement as a date of this report. As again, additional funding is expected from the province to support the county's COVID-19 impacts and recovery and any future funding announcement for reported to council and future updates. Um, the funding estimated to be utilized in the 2020 budget is based on the financial tracking expenditures related to COVID-19. Where COVID-19 departmental specific funding is projected not to be sufficient to cover these COVID-19 operating costs, the, the allocation of funding from the Federal Provincial Safe Restart Agreement, the, the phase one funding is being allocated to these budgets to assist these expenditures. The county is expected to report back to the province in March, 2021 with details on the county's 2020 COVID-19 operating costs and pressures. The overall 2020 financial visit, as well as the overall 2020 financial position and the use of these provincial funds in a template to be provided by the ministry. No guidelines have been provided by the province on what expenditures are deemed eligible or non-eligible COVID-19 costs and pressures. Staff have allocated costs to COVID-19 cost centers based on what we believe to be costs and pressures incurred as a result of the pandemic. To summarize then, too, that we've been very fortunate to have received upper levels of government of funding to help weather the immediate impacts of COVID-19. A number of projects, um, annual maintenance work and filling of vacant positions necessary for normal operations will be a challenge in, in 2021, in the 2021 budget. And, and we're very appreciative um, of all the upper level gov government's help with funding and stuff. It's put us in a a good position here. Um, I'm still um, waiting to see what the province provides in a template that we report back. Um, a bit concerned about when we have surplus in some budget lines that they'll want the municipal surplus to be used ahead of their COVID funding. But I think we can, the way we've expensed, these are true COVID costs that we've had to up staff or buy protective equipment, et cetera. But it is a it is a caution when I'm, I'm looking at. The, I know some of the maintenance savings that we've had, for example, in long term care, where we couldn't do stuff in those buildings, bring outsiders into those buildings due to lockdowns and stuff. That maintenance work is still outstanding. So these surplus funds need to go forward to help fund these in the future. So that's how we've based here our, our how we've tracked and recorded all this COVID nineteen costs and. I feel they're appropriate what we're, we're asking to use that money for. And, and I think it's appropriate these other surpluses will be brought back to council in a future report for recommendation and how to utilize those. So that's my report and uh, I'll try to answer any questions if possible. Okay, well, thanks very much for that uh, in-depth uh, report there, Kevin. Uh, questions from council? I have a question from uh, Brian, uh, Councillor Millen. Thank you, Mr. Warden. And uh, hey, Kevin, how's it going? Good to see you. Good to see um, you. <laughs> notwithstanding the uh, <clears throat> impacts uh, or the the uncertainty around the COVID nineteen impacts to our final financial position at the end of the year, um, I, I I just wanted to say I don't really have a, well I don't have a question. Other I just wanted to say that I really do appreciate. Uh, your clarity in this report and it's not surprising because you've always done a really good job at least in my opinion of of presenting where we're at and what the implications uh, might be going forward uh, I just noted there was one uh, one thing there about uh, the uh, provincial court offenses uh, the uncertainty about revenue around tickets I'm just wondering with all this nice weather, whether there's some outstanding tickets from a certain Mustang that should have been ripping up and down the road. Uh, is that a, is that a possibility, Mr. Wepler? It's been put away. Spring's coming. Anyway, thank you very much, Kevin. You always do a great job. Thank you. No, no thank you. And, and yeah, Pete, trying to, to predict revenues for POA and when tickets will be, 
written and when they'll be paid has always been a challenge, but um, it just made it worse with it's different. We had a different attention in society for that during a period of time. And that's totally understandable We're trying to protect people from, from this pandemic. So that's totally understandable. What, you know, the, the lack of tickets were, they were written at that period of time. Well, maybe Councillor Millen, maybe the, the, the type of ticket, because there was a lot of high speeder tickets, maybe the, they'll make up the difference. They're, they're higher amounts. Maybe that's why the Mustang's been put away. Maybe it's in, a, maybe it's in an impound somewhere. There, there you go. There you go. Well, you're the gatekeeper down there, Councillor Millen, so you'll see it coming by. You can inform everybody it's coming. On Highway 10, that is. <clears throat> okay, uh, other questions, comments? So just a, on clarity, Kevin, 1.687300, right? Yeah, and, you know, 700 of that is from good tender results on yeah. the capital side for transportation. And then the other I'd say is a, a general theme of, of, you know, staff. We didn't hire students. We had staff that had were planning to either retire or we had some that resigned that those positions took us well, it was difficult to bring someone in to train on a position during lockdown of, of COVID and stuff. So a lot of those went unfilled for a period of time. And again, the theme of less travel for conferences for and, and, use, and using the new tools of, of virtual meetings and stuff of save, save funding and stuff here. Um, so that's, and I, we all, when this first happened, we were not clear on what provincial or federal funding we were going to get. So we, re, we, you know, staff, we discussed and decided we were going to try to, to reduce our spending where we could, because we were unsure or unclear how much money we were going to get and, and we trying to reduce any deficit that could happen here at the county. So um, I, I thank all the staff for their participation in that. So. So good job, Kevin, and staff for, for doing that. I would say next year we're going to have a, a negative 5% budget. Is that right? No, that's not right. <laughs> but, no, it'll have its challenges with all the work that needs to be caught up on here as well. So, And okay. I, I think you've mentioned we've had issues with insurance and other things that are going on and, as well. So there are always, there's always challenges with each budget. So. I, don't know. I was just I was just trying to see what you would say on that one. <laughs> We're still um, working on it. it. Nice We're still working on it. Yeah, it was nice to see that surplus in there, and and uh, and it's a it's, it's money well. It's going to be used somewhere along the way for sure. So, uh, seeing there's no other um, discussion, and you're going your budget day is January. No, when is that? Uh, you're coming forward with uh, a budget. I, I'm, I'm, I plan to bring on the, the next council session another report and update where we're at with budget and, and some of the, the impacts and, and implications right. to give council a feel and, and get your feedback on where we're headed. So that's that's the you know the next on the 26th of November, I'm planning to bring a, a budget report and then, uh, yeah, our full day budget meeting is at the end of January then. That's right. That's right. Okay. Well, we look forward to that and seeing there's no other questions out there. Um, it has been moved in second or second. And so is there anybody opposed to uh, moving this report? Okay, that is carried. Thanks, Kevin. Thank you, Council. I can I can hear you I can hear you humming through the wall here in the office here. So <laughs> you're working hard. Very good. Okay, so the next uh, report is um, uh, from uh, Tim and it's uh, with regards to the CAO report. CW 17-20 and it's been moved by Councillor Klumpis and Councillor um, Potter and uh, Madam CAO, the floor is yours. Thanks very much, Mr. Warden. Can everybody hear me okay? Yeah, all right. Before I start this report, just uh, one comment if I could uh, back to the community safety and well-being plan. Um, one of the things that I know that uh, or maybe meant to mention was how this all got started because I'd like to recognize somebody who played a really important role. The county not having a police services board um, wasn't really privy to the original correspondence from the Ministry of the of Solicitor General and it was actually Ann Elliott, the uh, executive director for um, victim services that brought this forward and asked if the county would take a look at assisting with all of this and I 
I know that um, many of your own people are part of that victim services organization. And I just wanted to give them a shout out for the wonderful work that that they do. And um, really how well it's turned out that that Anne was able to bring that to to my attention and that we were able to pull together a group of people to, to do some really good work. So I just wanted to recognize there are some people in the community who are doing really great things. So turning Thanks, our Alicia. attention back to uh, the strategic planning follow-up report. So this report is on the agenda for your information, but of course, if you have any further direction uh, for myself and the staff team, we're very uh, open to that. Um, on October 15th, um, and you've seen the minutes already, um, you told us a few things. And I just wanted to highlight those, those key points, those takeaways that we're using to build on our planning as your senior leaders um, going forward. Um, you asked us to be very conservative with any um, levy increases and especially those that would result in increases um, to taxes for our residents and businesses at this time. You asked that um, staff prioritize investments that will have a meaningful impact on the areas of greatest need in our community. And under the healthy communities part of the, of the project, it really speaks to a number of those things. It's an interesting time. We have housing um, issues, um, attainable housing, affordable housing, seniors housing. Um, we spoke about broadband at the meeting and I, I know that we're all anxiously awaiting the uh, um, results of the recent uh, SWIFT procurement and, and what projects that might mean for, for Gray County. Um, we have a, a tremendous um, asset base in the county that um, we want to ensure that we continue to maintain and to be good stewards of for the future and for our all of our residents. And so all in all, I, I think we took away some very good information from that session. There were a couple of questions raised in the session and I've answered those in the report. Um, the question about how the tax levy was allocated and the fact that there's differences in allocation between our member municipalities. So just revisited and summarized that just for uh, your information. And um, <clears throat> I, as I say, I appreciated your, your input, everyone that day. If there's anything more that, that you need on this, I did include all of the detailed information on each one of the projects on that priority list that we looked at. So where there's costing, that's noted there, as well as some further explanation about each one of those initiatives. Um, and so you, we'll use the information that you provided to us as background when we're um, making some decisions as staff about the budget that we're bringing forward to you for 2021 and into the future. I'm happy to take any questions. Thank you very much. <clears throat> Thank you very much, Madam CEO. And uh, uh, any questions from county councillors? I see Councillor Robinson. Okay, go ahead, Councillor Robinson. Well, thank you, uh, Mr. Warden, and through you, I, I must say, uh, I certainly enjoyed the strategic priority setting uh, discussion. I, I appreciate the facilitator style, mm -hmm. and uh, we really we really had the discussion of uh, doing that priority setting, but also clarity. So, um, Kim, thank you very much for for ensuring that uh, that success for, for all of us. Uh, I do want to just um, bring attention to um, one of the items that's listed under current initiatives list. I, I'm mm -hmm. sorry, I don't have a page number. It doesn't show in the agenda, um, but okay. this is dealing with um, the planning section and it is talking about growth management. So I hope that gives enough indicators for everybody uh, to follow. Um, it does talk in paragraph three on the first column, settlement area slash boundary facilitation staff directed to work with municipalities, local and neighboring on identifying future growth and infrastructure needs to bring back a staff report summarizing findings and um, recommendations for next steps. In the following column, it does speak about um, a settlement area expansion, but it does not reference infrastructure needs, uh, specifically um, looking at water sewer through cross uh, borders of municipalities. And I know that was the intent 
way back when this report was uh, first put forward. I do not want to lose sight of that. So okay. I'm wondering if, if there is an ability uh, somewhere to adjust the language to uh, put as much due diligence on the um, focus of uh, the need for infrastructure to be expanded from one municipality to another to provide success for uh, Gray County overall and contribute overall to our Gray County success. So uh, through you, Mr. Warden, I'm wondering if that is uh, uh, a comment that uh, Madam CAO could um, help me with, please. Of course, thanks very much, yeah. Councillor Robinson and through you, Mr. Warden. Um, I'm wondering if, if Randy, do you wanna speak to what's in um, the growth management study terms of reference? Um, is there, for sure. I uh, think that we've covered uh, this and I just want you to, <laughs> I just want you yeah, to verify for sure. that for me. That. Yeah, the growth manager study, um, it is specifically looking at, um, at um, you know, in terms of based on what we're seeing in our communities from a growth perspective, it's more looking at the numbers, but on the settlement, so this, but the settlement area boundary facilitation discussion, um, Councilor Robinson is correct in that part of the analysis will be looking at infrastructure um, you know, in order to support any settlement boundary expansion, that's one of the key requirements for what's what we call a, a comprehensive review exercise, which is to um, one of the criteria is to look at the infrastructure and whether or not it's uh, going to be sufficient to support any future growth. So that'll be part of, no doubt, the discussions that we'll be having with uh, with various local municipalities, just to identify and quantify where where we're at with current infrastructure what's planned in terms of infrastructure um, capacity increases just to determine how best that fits in with the overall discussion around settlement area boundary facilitation. Thanks, so Randy. Mr. Warden, that, that's great. Is there is there an ability to have it adjusted in the language here? Um, just wondering if that's a possibility. I just don't want to lose sight of that. Uh, it's an important component for Gray County and uh, certainly for municipalities that would be uh, considering that option of expanded infrastructure resources. Perhaps what I can do is in the final version of this, I'll put a link to the report that talked about the growth management study and just make sure that that, that is all reflected there. Sorry, I didn't have a lot of room in my table. So, so I maybe inadvertently edited out something that was important and I apologize for that. Thank you. Okay, thank you for that then. And thanks Madam CEO. Any other any other comments questions? <clears throat> um, Madam CEO, there's a picture of the at the very beginning here of your report. It shows uh, the sign that's out front of the building, and it talks about. Um, or I'm just going back to it. County services. Um, yes. I, I, I was looking out the window, and somebody's taking our rocks. We may have to update yes. that sign. <laughs> we'll have to uh, follow up with that. Uh, Absolutely. Where are those rocks? <laughs> yes. I'm just teasing. <laughs> anyway, that's all fine. Okay, so see, seeing there's no other. Uh, oh, no other yes, Councillor Mackey. Mackey. Oh, sorry, Councillor Mackey, go ahead. Thanks, Mr. Warden. And uh, Councillor Burley may not like this, but I, I see the Wyarden Keppel Airport on as an emerging, uh, emerging uh, part of the uh, upcoming workload. And I guess, you know, we've not seen anything as far as a business case you know, to rationalize why we would need uh, this airport. And uh, so for a vast number of people in Gray County and the average taxpayer, I just don't see the, the utilization of that. So I'm not sure it should be on our, uh, our business or work to be done over the next little while. Um, if I may, Mr. Warden, there are a couple of things in that section of the table that were noted at the, at the meeting as things that were had been discussed or were on the horizon. So they're noted as unplanned or not yet started. So I absolutely, you're absolutely correct, Councillor Mackey, that there has no, been no direction on that um, from this council to move forward with anything. I, it was simply noted on the page as, as something that had had some initial discussion. Okay, we couldn't you. move, That's we wouldn't move forward unless, the, unless we had direction from you. 
No, I appreciate that. Thank you. All right. Uh, I see Potter. Councillor Potter. Yep. Okay. Go ahead. Thanks. Uh, Thanks thank Potter. you. I, just going back to the question Councillor Robinson asked, um, is this sort of a general direction regarding settlement areas that we're talking to all the municipalities or are we, do we have anything specific in mind? I, I don't, I'm just wondering where this, where this is arising from or why it's, why it's on our horizon. Madam CEO. I'm, I'm going to continue to let Randy because it's this, there's a number of things that are intertwined here. So it, it's probably best if I, I let Randy speak to sure. those relationships. Yeah. yeah we, we, can, we can share a link uh, back with, uh, with council and the report that was presented earlier this year with respect to this topic. And essentially it's, it's to um, the intent of the report was to identify um, that we know there's a, a number of settlement areas uh, throughout the county that um, in some cases border, border municipalities. Um, we know at some point in time there's going to be a need for um, some settlement areas uh, to, to expand. And, and as pointed out in the report, these things take time. Um, we know that, uh, that um, and in some cases, you know, some of the need may be now. Or, or in the near future in terms of some of those areas. And, um, and we identified a list of, in the report, uh, um, I think there's about a list of 10 uh, settlement areas in the county that, um, that run up adjacent to uh, other municipalities. And that, that's where it can uh, be uh, even more of a challenge because we have multiple parties then uh, that we have to look at potential solutions and options uh, for how we address uh, future growth within those settlement areas. And, and so the, the point of the report was to, um, the county through the principal policy statement has a role to play in terms of facilitating some of these, uh, these discussions and conversations. And so we were seeking direction from council whether or not that's something that uh, you would be interested in us exploring further. And at that time, uh, council provided the direction to staff to, to look into this further. Uh, and so we've been doing some background research with respect to looking at what other municipalities have done with respect to what we're calling win-win solutions in terms of um, working together with uh, neighboring municipalities to try to accommodate and address some of the growth challenges that some settlement areas have been um, uh, experiencing in the past and, and to see what those options could look like. Um, not every option will work for each settlement area. Um, and, and so we want to explore uh, what, a, what a multitude of different options that could uh, work and be successful in this area. So that's what we've done to date. Uh, this all ties in as well with the growth manager study update in terms of uh, just having some more up-to-date numbers in terms of what, uh, what we're going to need in terms of to accommodate and, uh, and address our growth. Um, so that is, is still also in the work. So as Kim mentioned, some of this all ties together. Um, and, and so we're waiting for the results, of course, of the growth management study update. We hope to receive that before the end of this year. Um, with that, then obviously we'll be having some further discussions with municipalities about what that looks like. And we've already had some discussions with municipal staff about that. Um, and then uh, it's looking at um, uh, opportunities within some of these settlement areas. And I think some settlement areas um, are maybe um, in higher need than in others at the moment in terms of those adjacent uh, settlement areas or adjacent to municipalities. Um, but no doubt, uh, we think that a global uh, approach of looking at here's some options or here's some opportunities, and then looking at, as Council Robinson noted, where are we at with infrastructure planning in order to uh, accommodate some of this growth? I think we've experienced some of that in the challenging uh, challenges with some of our settlement areas where we're seeing high rates of growth. Um, and to be able to accommodate that for each local municipality is very challenging um, in that in some cases it may not have been in the capital uh, budget to accommodate that growth. And then the, we're, click, we're quickly playing catch up uh, in order to try to address some of those infrastructure challenges. So again, it's try to get ahead of all this um, because like I said, this, this stuff takes time. And so we want to look at it as a, an overall global approach of how can we better 
address and plan for our growth for our communities so that they can grow and thrive successfully. Thank you. If I, if I can just follow up with a, with a comment, I'm, I'm just, uh, I, I would like to see, I'll look forward to seeing something more specific so that we know uh, what areas we are talking about uh, and, and just what we have in mind because uh, to do any of this at the county level without the local municipalities being involved in the first place uh, just seems like we're putting the cart before the horse. So I, I hope that uh, this will all go hand in hand. Uh, yeah, uh, through you, Mr. Warden, it's, it's absolutely critical to have uh, local municipal staff and local municipalities involved in these discussions. So we've been doing some, uh, some of the background research in terms of what other municipalities have done uh, with, with respect to these uh, similar type of, of challenges. Um, and so we've been able to bring that to, to the table when we have these discussions with the, with the various municipalities. Um, so that's um, in the list, like I said, is, is in the report. I uh, can just go through that list. And so it's Hanover West Gray, uh, West Gray, Southgate, Mount Forest, Blue Mountains, Collingwood, Georgian Bluffs, Wyerton, Dundalk, Melanchthon, Own Sound, Georgian Bluffs, Meaford and Own Sound, Meaford uh, and the Blue Mountains, and Markdale and West Gray. And so the, those are the ones that were named, uh, identified in the report as, as areas or sediment areas or growth areas that run adjacent to municipalities where at some point we are, we're likely gonna to have to have these discussions and conversations in terms of um, what this looks like in terms of, uh, um, in terms of how we, uh, what options there are for those settlement areas and growth areas to grow and thrive. Okay. Any other comments? So, so basically, Randy, it's sort of based on your report that you brought forward in, in January and also along with the growth study you're doing. Yeah, it, yeah. It's a report back in March 12th, 2020. March. March. PDRCW 17-20. And we can share we can share a link back to that report. It seems like a lifetime away. <laughs> it's a long ago when we and that was done in the chambers. I remember. Okay. So any other further comments then with regards to the CAO report? All right, that was moved and second. And I know Councillor Robinson, you've made uh, the point of maybe some tweak, some tinkering there or, or tweaking on, on all that wording is yeah. to the Madam CAO. And there's gonna be a final report coming back as you're saying, uh, Madam CAO. So if there's no other discussions then for this motion, then anybody opposed to this resolution? Okay, I hear none and then that's uh, carried. Thanks, All right, <clears throat> so moving on. Thank you, Madam CEO. So then moving on to the uh, next item then is, um, this is with regards to the uh, economic development impact on Gray County businesses or businesses three. And this is, uh, is, is moved by Councillor Hicks and second by Councillor Robinson. And we have Savannah, Steve, Jacinda, and uh, yeah, they're, they're going to speak to this. So. Welcome. Excellent. Thank you very much, Council. As you get a tag team this afternoon uh, between the three of us. Um, wanted to bring back this third report. We've been to you twice now with results from a survey we've done with Western Ontario Wardens Caucus. This is the third and final survey um, that we have done with them. No surprise, survey fatigue has certainly set in. Uh, it is the lowest response rate we've had to date. But given the tremendous consultations we've had one-on-one -on -one with businesses between our own staff and our working group staff, we're very confident in the results that we're seeing here. So that's why we, we still want to bring these forward and share them with you and are still using them as part of our work plans. Um, so just mind council that our economic development uh, and tourism working group that has all of your representatives as well as our community representatives and provincial representatives continues to meet. We're still meeting monthly and we are going to continue that straight through uh, because we're finding it's working very, very well. They have all been very involved in uh, the collection of this information as well as the recovery plan. And then internally, staff-wise, it's been a real team effort between economic development, tourism, and communication staff. So I we're here to represent as three, um, but really this is a much wider body that's been involved. 
So I'm going to hand it over to Jacinda because she's really the one who was tasked with going through all of the business survey results, all of the narrative and all of the comments. Uh, so she summarized them and has a, a presentation for you, which was linked at the end of this report. So Jacinda first. Good afternoon, Council. Uh, I'm just going to try and share my screen. Hopefully this works. Okay. Are you able to see my the screen with the business survey map? Okay. Yep. Okay. So this was our third survey that we launched to our Great County businesses in partnership with the Western Wardens Caucus, and it uh, closed on October 16th. Uh, with the help of our planning data analysis coordinator, Brad Noble, we can uh, share these results with you. So, just trying to hold on a second. Wait, okay, so the uh, top three industries that are uh, representing these results include hospitality, tourism, and arts, and then their retail and uh, professional services. Uh, some of the businesses also identified more than one location, so you'll see a multiple uh, category in this graph. Sorry, I'm having trouble changing it. Not that I want to. Take your time, get it right. Okay. Uh, so uh, we di we divided the different um, we found four main the uh, themes, and it's uh, we divide them into offering level, workforce, supports, and outlook for 2021. And um, looking at the offering level for respondents during this time, 35% uh, of businesses surveyed are working at less than 50% capacity, and only 14 businesses expressed a current increase in revenue compared to the same time last year. And then um, when reviewing the workforce, the majority of businesses respond with a decrease in workforce with an estimated average of 20% uh, decrease. And the hospita hospitality, tourism and art uh, industries have suffered the greatest job losses uh, locally with a reduction of 172 jobs from pre-pandemic levels. On the same note, 84% uh, of the businesses surveyed did not anticipate or, do, or, or did not know whether or not they would be hiring in the near future. I'm trying to manage both screens here. Uh, when asked about workforce challenges, 41% experienced barriers in bringing their employees back to work. And some of the, the top three reasons were uh, COVID restrictions, uh, you know, physical distancing, uh, not enough business, and then also CERB was also mentioned as the top three. When asked what type of positions they were struggling to fill, um, the top three again were entry level came first followed by mid-level management uh, or supervisory uh, positions, and then trades. Uh, so in this question, we wanted to find out what provincial and federal uh, government supports they had accessed, uh, their eligibility, and whether or not they needed assistance so that we could all follow up directly with the business owner. Uh, business, businesses continue to ask for assistance in applying for queues, the uh, emergency wage subsidy. And uh, when speaking with businesses, we found that many businesses are, are just so overwhelmed with the workload that they're not finding the time to just sit down and review uh, or apply for some of these supports. And then the uh, top three supports that uh, our businesses were using uh, were able to access were uh, SEBA, the business loan, the wage subsidy, uh, CUES, the wage subsidy, and then uh, serve the, the response benefit. Um, municipal, municipal supports that have been most helpful during this time include uh, PPE funding and small business grants. Uh, the supports, the resources that require that they require most during this time uh, were uh, mostly around the need to support uh, 
the support with financial grants, cash flow, emergency funds, and that continues to be the number one response for all three uh, surveys. Uh, the next two to follow were uh, supports in promoting marketing assistance and then information updates on business supports. Um, oh, sorry. And then the other one was, um, no, that's it. That's it. Promoting marketing assistance and information updates on business support initiatives. And then the last slide I have is uh, more of an outlook. Uh, a pessimistic outlook for 2021 appears common for almost 50% of the surveyed companies. Um, moving forward, the top concerns for surveyed companies of, of the ones that we surveyed are uh, financial impact on operations and our li liquidity of capital, uh, a decreasing consumer confidence and uh, slash spending, concern over global or Canadian recession, and then the last was uh, employee stress and uh, or health. Um, having reviewed the narrative responsible responses of the surveyed uh, businesses, there were a few common trends that were highlighted. The uncertainty of additional restrictions and closures um, has had a detrimental effect on decisions moving forward. For example, uh, workforce needs, employer and employee stress and mental health were highlighted within many narrative comments. Uh, the need to focus on broadband internet in our region was more evident and actually that was rarely mentioned in survey one and two. Uh, new residents moving to our area from the urban centers uh, provides an opportunity for us to highlight uh, what our region has to offer. Uh, the businesses that continue to struggle in everyday operations are those whose services rely on uh, large gatherings, uh, the very small businesses with a yearly revenue of you know, under 100,000 or less, uh, tourism operators and some restaurants, especially going into the winter. And I just wanted to say that despite the struggles of this pandemic, um, uh, that many businesses are experiencing um, Sorry, during this during this pandemic, there are still um, and talks with our team, with Business Enterprise Center and our counterparts at our member municipalities. Um, there have been many conversations with entrepreneurs who have started their new businesses and are looking to open uh, new businesses. So there are some there is some light at the end of the tunnel, and uh, there are some uh, very hopeful businesses out there. And that's it for me. Thank you, Jacinda. We know it's a lot of information and not a lot of time, but you have those survey results are in your uh, package, so you can absolutely go through them uh, and we will continue to use them in everything that we're doing uh, among staff. So we're gonna talk a little bit now about um, what the recovery plan looks like, an update of where we are right now. And before I turn it over to Steve, we just wanna start with the Starter Company Plus program because this has been a really, really key program uh, during COVID for our small businesses. It was geared specifically to businesses who have started up in the last one to five years. It was a transition of the funding that we received from the province with their permission through the Business Enterprise Center. Uh, they allowed us to take our entire Starter Company Plus grant program and put it towards this transition program. And then on June 25th, through our council report and recovery plan to you, you helped us double that money. So we were able to support 45 small businesses who have all been in operation for less than five years. And what a difference it has made uh, to see. It was a $2,500 grant plus advisorship opportunities and very specific training, which included time with Dr. Era as part of a webinar. Uh, so the businesses had that one-on-one -on -one opportunity to talk directly to the people who have the help. Um, so we have seen just Tremendous results from that. It's really helped us look at what 2021 and beyond looks like in terms of the importance of mentorship and advisorship, uh, having heard the feedback from our businesses. And we wanna give you a, a quick little sneak peek of one page that is coming up in uh, Made in Gray magazine that will be at the end of November. But this is just a very beautiful picture of all the faces. Well, not even all the faces. This is only a portion of the faces that this money has directly helped and it has gone right across uh, our sectors in Gray County. So we wanted to share that because it's really nice to put faces to names and realize that these are the folks that are really returning to the community and how far $2,500 can go. We heard from one business in particular that took this opportunity, took the $2,500, was able to transition their entire business model and as a result, hired 15 people and supported seven local businesses 
for $2,500. So it's that type of support that can really go a long way. Um, so we wanted to make sure that we could share that with you. So you'll see a beautiful little spread coming up at the end of November on the starter company, but it is certainly changing the way that we're looking at how we deliver those services to small businesses as we move forward. So Steve's gonna talk a little bit more about uh, the rest of the recovery program update and where we're headed now that we're going into winter. Thank you, Savannah and council. So uh, it's been a team effort uh, at Gray County when we say a team effort that includes all the economic development and CEOs of our member municipalities. They've been involved in a strategy and implementing, and I would say listening. Uh, one of the things we have to do is be able to listen and pivot quickly uh, as things change. So originally we were trying to get information out, factual information out. We still have all that information and we have a 1-800 line that's, that's, uh, that we maintain and keep. But in terms of the campaigns, our activity, outdoor activity map uh, did very well this year showing what was open and where you could get PPE. And we really pushed the patios and really pushed our, our green spaces and monitored those. And that led into the Rediscover campaign, really encouraging people to get out and buy local. And that was, again, very successful through social media, radio campaign and, uh, and video. And in, in terms of radio, there was a variety of messages, uh, including thanking the community for buying local and adhering uh, to, to public health messages. Um, if you get a chance to go on and look at those videos, they've been very well received. Having said that, we're going into the winter season and uh, we're going to continue on with that message, maybe with a little bit different creative, uh, trying to stay local, buy local, but also balance uh, the messaging on attracting people and, and guiding them as they come up. Uh, we have to be careful when we in, invite people up uh, normally in a tourism, that's exactly what we're trying to do. But we know people are going to come up anyways, and we have to try and direct them to those places which are, are capable of handling them. So again, just like in the summer, we're going to be monitoring our winter recreation areas. We're having discussions across the team, you know, what areas are going to be plowed. We've talked to the snowmobile clubs and other clubs on how they're dealing with it. Uh, and hopefully we can manage that and get our messages out. Um, we've also had our business reopening toolkit, which had posters, cards, and guidelines, and hopefully we don't have to revisit that. Hopefully uh, our region stays, stays safe and we can keep our community and businesses going. Uh, and finally, we had our um, infrastructure kit where each municipality was given quickly $2,200 to purchase what they thought they needed to help keep their downtowns vibrant and um, and going. And we've had a number of examples where uh, uh, I think Meaford bought sanitation stations and Hanover bought branded masks and on sound had out, out, outdoor patios and we have others uh, participating in that. Going, going forward, we're going to continue working with our team, our communication team. And if things change, we'll have to, to move quickly. Uh, but again, we're also talking to other levels of government about further uh, assistance that may be coming to certain sectors, certain sectors in our economy and our in our in our business community, and hopefully those can get it announced at some point soon. But uh, in in a summary, it's all the details are in the report, and um, hopefully uh, you're hearing good things and keeping us uh, keeping things moving forward. Awesome. Hey, thanks, Steve. Savannah, anything else? That's the, the end of our report. We just wanted to, to bring this back and we held it off a little bit after September. We were going to come back originally in September, but as those numbers started to increase, the sentiment really started to shift. So we wanted to make sure we captured what was happening before we did come back to you. So um, as Steve and Jacinda said, we are still actively listening. That is the number one part of our job is to listen first before we act on anything. And then it's to make those quick movements uh, so that we don't keep our businesses waiting because they don't want to wait for us and they don't want us to get in the way either. So it's, it's dancing on that fine line to make sure that we are here to support and doing it as one cohesive Gray County team with all of our member municipalities on board as well. So that is our update and we'll be back again in December with the 2021 work plan for you that will go to both of our advisory committees and then come back to council uh, for approval so that we can move forward in 2021. But that's it for today, unless you've got questions. Okay, well, uh, thanks uh, Savannah and Steve and Jacinda. I know that uh, uh, Kathy Nuno kept me busy all summer signing those you know, $2,500 <laughs> yeah. grants and that's great. It was, I think it must have been close to 50 of them. I don't know. There was a lot there anyway. Yeah, 45. But that's great. 
Yep. So I, I know it. Uh, I, I, she kept me busy. And she kept she kept me working. That was good. Um, and I will say one other thing. I know this past weekend with the with the, or the past week with the warmer weather, it seemed to bring an influx of people back into our area, which I guess would maybe help the tourism or the restaurant part maybe as well, um, which is maybe an, an added bonus. But uh, uh, we do have that unfortunate thing called winter coming, and that's going to be harder on businesses, especially in the tourism part or the restaurant business. So questions from County Council. Uh, Mr. Warden, I have uh, Councillor Desai, Millen, and Potter. Okay, go ahead, Councillor Desai. Thank you, uh, Mr. Warden. I, I want to start by saying I was a little disappointed that we didn't have some of the family feud style survey says, uh, but uh, anyway, moving. Thank you. <laughs> um, the, the, a couple of great points were raised in there. Uh, one of them was with regards to uh, pessimism in general for next year with regards to consumer confidence and so on. I wonder if that may have changed with the, with the news of course, this past week that Pfizer has developed a vaccine with a, with a 90% success rate. Uh, again, very early stages, uh, but that is some news in the right direction. So I don't know if, uh, if the ECDEV team has heard uh, from, from members of the business community on, on whether their opinions on the, on the consumer confidence have changed or not. Um, the other uh, question I had was with, with regards to the Rediscover program. Uh, I believe that was the program. Uh, it was right at the start of the pandemic, and it 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 had a list of all the um, uh, all the businesses that were that had sort of shifted their service provision to the online uh, platform, where you know you could either call in and uh, place an order and they deliver, or something along those lines. And it was it was a great tool uh, in that in that sense. Um, is that is that still continuing? Like, is it still seeing the same level of success, the same level of participation um, today that it was seeing right at the start? Because I remember uh, my my fiance uh, worked at Coffin Ridge, and there was a number of weekends where we, we sort of just went out on a drive delivering uh, orders. So, is are we still seeing that level of success, or with the economy reopening a little, has that sort of died down a little bit? Savannah, Steve, uh, just. I'm thinking that you're talking about the business and resiliency map, the one where we listed where. We... Yes, yes, sorry. The one? Yes, yes. So it is certainly still live, uh, very much a part of the work that we're doing. Same with the outdoor activity map. Those we don't anticipate are going to go anywhere. Uh, we have full plans to keep them up and going and they are still getting traffic. I couldn't tell you exactly what the traffic is uh, on a daily, but I. I mean, we could certainly look back and find out um, and see what that looks like. And then your other question about the vaccine, I think we're too early uh, to know because that is kind of just happened. But if Jacinda and Steve have heard otherwise, I haven't haven't heard much around that yet. So, uh, I presume my only my yeah. only comment on that, if I could, would be that. Uh, I think from a business, what I'm hearing from businesses is that they're not doing any long-term planning. Uh, maybe that's a reflection of, their, of uh, the risk. So it's just short-term. And, and of course, you always like to do long-term planning. And I think hopefully in the spring, if the vaccine starts to come out, people start to make longer-term decision and investment decisions. But it's everything is very, very short-term at this point. Okay, you need one Facebook page that you can only post positive things. <laughs> <laughs> well, John Krasinski had the uh, the good news uh, uh, yeah. podcast or something for a bit for a bit there. I don't know if he still does that. Uh, well, thank you very much for answering those questions. And uh, my final question, uh, again, with, with with the news of the vaccine coming out and things uh, looking like they might probably change. Uh, over the next three months or maybe four months, are we looking at having a, um, a, a another survey? Um, I, don't, I don't know, sort of at the end of uh, the first quarter in 2021, uh, that looks at you know whether there's been any changes in consumer or, or in business pessimism uh, regarding 2021. Through you, Mr. Gordon, that's a, a great question. And we would normally be doing the Employer One survey in January, but um, Ford County is taking a break from that one this year. So it gives us an opportunity that if we want to go back with a survey, 
Uh, we certainly could. It probably makes sense in the new year. Definitely for 2020, we have no more surveys planned uh, because we've been told, please no more. So we will not. Uh, but in the new year, I think when people are refreshed and they've come down off of you know Christmas holidays and all of the rush that we know our businesses are going to see uh, over the Christmas, January is that catch your breath moment. So very much uh, we are looking at different opportunities for business engagement. Uh, so a survey could very, very well be part of that. Perfect. Thank you. Thank you very much. And I think it'd be a great time sort of, uh, you know, middle of March or somewhere at that point, because it would be one whole year since, uh, since we originally shut down. Uh, so it'd, it'd be a great uh, year in review, sort of a survey as well. Um, but I'm glad, I'm glad you guys are thinking of that already. Um, thanks. Uh, great report. Thank you. Okay. Uh, Councillor Millen. Thank you, Mr. Warden. And real quickly, uh, I want to thank the three uh, presenters here today for their positive uh, uh, attitude. Uh, it must be difficult, to, you know, because of the uh, atmosphere that you're maybe working in. But in, in respect to that, I'm wondering, are, are you keeping touch with businesses that are succeeding uh, because of their efforts to either pivot to, to, to a different way of doing business or indeed even to a different business? Uh, because I, I think there probably are important lessons to learn from those businesses uh, that can help others as well. Because, uh, you know, an example I was reading this morning was about the small independent bookstores across the country. Uh, some of them, if they have an online presence, are, are just booming. They can't keep up with the work. Uh, so I'm, I'm, I'm hoping that there are, and I'm sure there are some success uh, stories out there in Gray and Bruce counties uh, that you're keeping touch with and, and boost your own, uh, your own spirits, I suppose. Uh, I, I have to say Steve's making me a little nervous because I think he's standing up and he's, he's almost pacing there. Uh, I don't want to say he looks like Sean Connery, but he almost looks like him uh, when he was alive, of course. But uh, anyway, uh, those are my comments. Thank you. Sure. Through you, Mr. Warden. Certainly keeping touch with the businesses who are doing well. Uh, actually, Courtney in Business Enterprise Center is probably connected the most to the businesses who are succeeding very, very well um, and sharing those lessons learned and keeping touch. And right from the beginning of this pandemic, when we were talking to all of our businesses, we really encourage them to please don't forget everything you're learning. Please don't get rid of everything you've just done to get through this short term period, because there's probably a lot of lessons to be learned and opportunities in what you've just accomplished. So that we are seeing continue. We are hearing some businesses are having their best year ever. Um, we're hearing others that have been trying to go through succession uh, who were successful in the pandemic, the years and years and years of no success. And now all of a sudden there's that growing appetite again. Uh, for that business renewal and that opportunity. So we are definitely seeing good things. It, uh, it helps with all of the, the not good things that we are seeing and hearing. And I really have to uh, commend our team because they've taken a lot of very difficult phone calls and a, very, a lot of difficult emails. And it is really hard on individuals when we know these individuals because we are so close-knit in our community. So they're not easy calls to take um, so we, among our own staff, are just such a resilient group, and, and I owe them the world because we've done a lot because they're strong um, that we've been able to get through that, but we really do appreciate those positive messages, and we're collecting all of those lessons learned and all of those things that we're seeing, so we don't lose sight of any of that, and it's all going into the 2021 work plan, since we have kind of a plan A, B, C, and D, because you have no idea which way we're going to go. <laughs> Most excellent. Thank you very much. And take care of yourself, Sean. I mean, uh, Steve. <laughs> Still standing. That's good. Okay. Uh, thank you for that, Councillor Potter. I think you were next. Uh, thank you. And a couple of questions. One, as always, Councillor Milne is a step ahead of me uh, because I was going to talk about the, the positives. Uh, but we have had some new businesses open in our area, and I think we can learn something from them as well by finding out why they're opening and what they're looking for and, and how they're dealing with 
opening a new business in a pandemic or even expanding, I know in one or two cases. So uh, it sounds like you, you have that on your work plan. So I'll leave that. Uh, the other one is that I went to the, in the industry summary uh, and I only see four businesses from agriculture and food processing. And I just wondered um, whether we should be, and, and if there's a good reason for it, you can explain that, but I just wondered whether that is a little underrepresented for that particular industry, given its size and its importance in our in our county. Certainly, through you, Mr. Warden, uh, very much uh, you know not included to the level that we would like in the survey. But a lot of the feedback from our egg community has come through those one-on-one -on -one consultations with Philly specifically. Um, so. Again, we look at these survey results and they're very skewed because they are very low. Uh, but because of all of the conversations that staff are having, we still do feel confident. So um, I would say on the survey results, yes, certainly underrepresented. But on the overall notes that we're able to bring back to you in those themes, definitely represented in that. Um, and that's through those those one on one consultations. Okay. Are there any other questions, comments? Uh, I have a couple. Uh, I see Councillor, I'm sorry, Mr. Warden. I do see Councillor Keaveny. Okay, go ahead. I'll wait. Councillor Keaveny, go ahead. Thank you very much, Mr. Warden. And uh, Savannah, you spoke to jobs lost, but I just wondered if you could speak a little bit to uh, unemployment rates in relation to uh, as best as you know, where they were previously and, and where we are now. Sure, absolutely. Uh, so through you, Mr. Warden, they are continuing to decrease. Before pre-pandemic, we were hovering around 2% unemployment rate, which was the lowest in the province uh, for our area. We are sitting around, I believe, 6.4% right now, which is down significantly from the 12% we were at a couple months ago. Uh, and we still lead the province in lowest unemployment rate in the region. Um, that story has not gonna, gone unchanged. Uh, it's not any easier to find employees today than it was pre-pandemic, uh, right at the start of the pandemic, the challenges are just as great. So for Kelly Market Planning Board has been doing a wonderful job. They produce that number for us monthly, which is great, but we can't tell what it is specifically to gray. So when we get that number, that is, um, Gray Bruce here on in Perth area, right up to Bruce Peninsula. Um, it's the Stratford Bruce Peninsula area that we're covered in. So, yes, the good news is that our employment rates are picking back up, but the bad news is we're still not going to have enough people to fill the positions that are available today or that are coming down the pipeline because we do continue to hover around a lower number than the province. We're about 5% lower consistently than anywhere else. Okay. Anything else, uh, Councillor Keaveny? I know you are a retail business yourself, so you could probably relate to a lot of different things, right? I certainly do. And uh, yeah, certainly I'm feeling the same pain that Savannah is mentioning in terms of uh, still struggling to find staff. And it's, uh, yeah, it's curious. And, and I know Savannah is aware of it and is certainly doing everything that she and her department can to uh, help attract folks into our workforce. And certainly from the trades sector as well, there's a shortage, as you mentioned, Savannah as well. I know that there's a lot of a lot of construction going on and, and a lot of stuff like that, that they just can't find enough people to run a shovel or a hammer or whatever. Councillor Hutchinson. Thank you, Mr. Warden, and thank you for the report. I just have a question to Savannah. Just do we know, like our numbers have uh, been pretty consistent like this. Do we know how... Um, basically the affordable housing are attainable, how much effect it has on these numbers? Do we know that stat? Mm. I would not want to hazard a guess. We know it certainly has an impact, but to give you an actual percentage of what is impacting, that we would not have the information for at this time. And I'm not even sure how we would gather that um, besides what we hear from our employers and, and from our individuals who are trying to get here and from our developers who are trying to build but can't because of that cycle of not being able to find the labor and now not having the supplies or the cost of supplies increasing so greatly in such a short period of time. 
Um, so we know it has an impact, but I couldn't tell you to what level. Okay, I just appreciate that. Just I, because I'm hearing people want to come this way, but that's the biggest challenge. They just can't get into the market here. There's just nothing for them. To, well, there's no rental on it. We have a zero vacancy rate. Exactly. And that, that's the biggest challenge. So they could certainly flourish here, but we have nothing to offer them for accommodation. So thank you. That's why I keep saying about the secondary units is so important to, to create those opportunities for, you know, uh, rental or, or other people to live here. And we just need to keep spreading that word, Randy. <laughs> Any other comments out there? So a couple of things I heard this morning. Uh, one was uh, Mike Apple on on Breakfast Television 680 News. You'll probably hear him. He was saying that there was some survey out or some stat that with the Christmas season coming up, uh, there's some survey they did that Canadians are going to buy more local or more Canadian. And I think that's a positive thing going back to Councillor Millen and what he was saying. Uh, yesterday, I was just in a, the Rusty Star that's in Maxwell. They sell a lot of Mennonite furniture. And I was looking for something for my wife for her birthday. And I went in there and I said, you guys don't have a lot of inventory. And she said, the long week and the past week with the good weather, clean them out. So people coming up here and, they, and she said, they don't want to wait eight weeks. They want it now. And it's just interesting the you know, people want it. And so that was, a, I guess, going back to Council Miller, a, a positive thing. The only thing is, is, is to get more inventory, it's going to take time, you know, to do that. So I just find that there is a lot of people coming into our area and we see it from the real estate part and, and a lot of that aspect from that. And, uh, you know, it's and so and the other point I question I, or comment I have is we're coming up to the Christmas. We've got the Black Friday and we've got the Christmas season coming up. Is there any way to have a postcard type idea where businesses support businesses in the sense of gift cards or so, so they go to one business, but then they can buy something for Christmas that supports another business or a restaurant or takeout, you know, so it's sort of, you know, because I think we, you know, everybody wants to support our area. Is that, is that something or that along that line we can be doing or, or thinking about? Sure. Yes, I'll turn that over to Steve. And I think you'll all be very excited to see Made in Grey magazine when it does come to your doorsteps at the end of the month, uh, because it is like a mini Grey County wish book. And we're continuing that online as well with that wish book. I really miss the wish book. So I was a big proponent of let's do something local. And Steve is working with the teams every day to get ready for that holiday and winter. So I'll let him continue on. Great. Thanks, Steve. Savannah. So, so we are coming up with a, you know, it's a, it's a version of the shop local campaign and it's all about uh, highlighting, uh, you know, unique finds uh, and how we're going to do that. The creative around that, we're just, we're just uh, working that out. Before we had, uh, you know, the Rediscover campaign was each municipality. Uh, this campaign will be more of a broader campaign on social media, but it, it, it will I think we also want to compliment our businesses and our citizens for uh, buying local and staying local. Uh, we hear that from businesses that they appreciate that. If you see one of our videos where you see the business owners waving, inviting people in, that's a continued message that we want to give. So, you know, uh, we have a lot of uh, baby boomers that aren't going south. They're going to be around, uh, hopefully spending more money. So a big shift, pandemic shifted a lot of things in the economy. and. Uh, it, where we can capitalize, that's what we, we got to do. And where those who need help, we need to help them. There just seems to be, I don't know, a certain sector, there seems to be lots of disposable income. I was talking to Kevin earlier this morning. There seems to be a certain sector, whether it's those age, aging baby boomers or people coming up, they seem to spend the money. They say you can't get a new snowmobile right now. So <laughs> from that sports side, right? Yeah. So, hey, good, you know, you know, and we as ourselves need to support all the local businesses and, and do our best as well. So that's great. That's so we're calling it the Great County Wish Book. <laughs> we didn't call it that. It's shop local, period, is what it's called. Oh, right. uh, yes, yeah, a good statement. But that that's how we're going to look at it because it very it really is. And it's full of amazing stories. So I think you'll really like it. OK, so seeing there's no other comments, we. Uh, I hear any comments, so, so it's been moved and second. And is there anybody opposed uh, to this report? Okay, that is carried. 
So uh, then moving on to our next item, which is the Agricultural Advisory Committee appointments. I understand, Savannah, you're going to take this uh, report. And uh, it is moved by uh, Councillor Robinson and Councillor Keeveny. So uh, Savannah, the floor is yours. Thank you. As Philly wrote this report, so I can take no credit for it, but I'm going to present on her behalf. Uh, her and Steve worked together on this report. So this is the follow-up from the August 13th uh, committee meeting where council passed to bring an Ag Advisory Committee to Gray County and uh, based on the terms of reference that was approved on that day. So this report is looking at six candidates uh, have been recommended and to be confirmed for membership on the newly established Ag Advisory Committee. So we've got John, Kathy, Brenda, Amy, Lori, and RJ. Um, really appreciate the chart that Philly and Scott helped put together to demonstrate how many uh, of the candidates actually have multiple areas of expertise and knowledge that they can bring to this committee. So that was just to help visually identify. Philly also made a note that uh, four of these members were born and raised in Gray County and two came here specifically because this is where they wanted to start their farm. So those are that's a good mix uh, of people to have around the table. Um, so on, uh, on September 18th, the county solicited applications. It was online for three weeks. Uh, there was two different e-blasts that went out direct to our ag and economic development uh, subscribers, as well as a posted online uh, public ad that went through communications. So that was all online. It was a three week period, 12 applications were received. And these are the six uh, committee members that are being recommended for your consideration. So I don't think we have anything outside of that. Um, but if there's any questions, we just wanted to to provide that uh, that chart so that you could see, you know, who's at at the table and why. Okay. Well, thank you, uh, Savannah. Are there any questions uh, on this report? Is that Councillor Robinson? Thank you. Um, thank you, Mr. Warren. Yes, I did put uh, um, that I would like a comment, but I also have a question. So thank you very much uh, for the report, uh, very thorough. And um, uh, certainly I'm, I'm moving the motion for the, the appointments. Um, I would also like to um, consider having a Gray Federation of Agriculture representative on. Uh, certainly that is, um, is something that, that I, would have expected uh, there be some participation. I don't know whether there was uh, uh, perhaps a disconnect in terms of communication, uh, communicating out to them. Gray Federation was um, uh, aware that this um, uh, committee was being formed as, um, uh, you know, and they were anticipating the excitement of it. So I'm just wondering if there's an ability within um, appointing the existing uh, recommendation for appointments, but also uh, consideration for uh, a Gray Federation representative. Um, Warden McQueen and I have uh, a meeting tonight with Gray Federation of Agriculture, so certainly that could be addressed this evening and perhaps a response as early as tomorrow morning. Um, if that is something that uh, this council would um, entertain, I would certainly appreciate my colleagues around the virtual horseshoe um, supporting that. Thank you. So just before you leave there, Councillor Robinson, are you looking at moving an amendment? Oh, yes, uh, yes, Mr. Gordon. I, I would absolutely continue with uh, my, uh, my support for the staff recommendation but I would move an amendment that uh, would uh, seek um, an appointment for the Gray Federation of Agriculture on this committee. And thank you for your time. Okay, do I have a seconder? Okay, Councillor Keeveny is on there. Okay, I got, so moved by Councillor Robinson, second by Councillor Keeveny. Um, just before we get the questions, Madam Clerk, uh, so we're doing an amendment, is that correct? For, that we make sure we follow through on that process? That is correct. So the amendment would be to add a Gray County Federation of Agricultural Rep um, to the committee. Um, if I may, Mr. Warden, um, just for council's clarification, the terms of reference did indicate a member of Gray County Federation of Ag, Christian farmers or national farmers. So it would be also a change in the terms of reference because those have been endorsed by council as 
one representative from any of those three so, so help me out here for help me out here for an amendment so the amendment is from the appointment but do we need to go back and amend the terms of reference if that's well? council's that wish then the terms of reference would need to be amended because it was a, a one of the three not um more than one okay so so we have the motion uh, an amendment motion on the floor right now to add but do we need to amend the terms of reference first before we add that person or that body we could do it all in one motion okay. and we could do it so here because me... because committee and subsequently council has the authority to amend those terms of reference they endorse them so they could amend them so if um councillors robinson and and Keeveny are are acceptable we could add the um the, and the terms of reference be updated to reflect that as part of the amendment Okay, I'll ask them in. So, Councillor Robinson and Councillor Keeveny, is is that okay with part of your your amendment? Yes, thank Councilor you. Robinson and Councillor Keeveny. Okay, I think I got the nod. Okay, I think I got the thumbs up. All right. So, so the amended motion is on the floor. I thought I saw some hands come up. Uh, are you keeping track of the order of that, Madam Clerk? Yes. Yeah, so I do have um, Councillor Gamble, Councillor Soever, and Councillor Desai. I thought Councillor Millen also, did he not, did he have his hand up as yes, well? Yes, he did. Okay. Okay. I'll go through those names. So, so okay. So go back. Councillor Gamble, Councillor Gamble, go ahead first. Yeah, I, I think we're headed down a road which maybe shouldn't go uh, on this one. Because <laughs> we do have these other organizations there that do represent the, the farming community, the agriculture community. And to pick one out of that, I, I just... I have a, a really strange feeling that that's not where we should be going. Uh, that's my feeling on it. Okay. Thank you. Thank you for that. Thank you. Uh, next, Councillor Soever. Yes, um, I, I can understand uh, Councillor Gamble's concern, but the Great County um, Federation of Agriculture has a very long history of working with the County Council. And certainly, I think if they weren't included, um, it would not be well received by the, the population. Um, so uh, I think we, I, I would be in, in favor of including them. Okay, thank you for that. Councillor Desai. Thank you, Mr. Warden. Um, I mean, I'm with, I'm with Councillor Gamble on this. Uh, we, we do, our, when we passed the terms of reference, uh, we knew there would be representation from one of those uh, groups. Um, I feel if we're going to go ahead and, and say that we, you know, we, we have someone who's representing one of those three groups, but we also want to add a member from the Great County Federation of Ag, which I agree with Councillor Saver has a long history of working with the county. Uh, but then, then we should be looking at adding a representative from each of those three instead of, you know, saying uh, only Great County Federation of Ag, especially after the terms of reference uh, said one of the three. Um, so which is why, if, you know, I think uh, we should focus on having a lean, mean uh, uh, group. Uh, and we, as we pass the terms of reference, we... Uh, we knew we would have representation from one of those. And I would imagine like, like many um, uh, community groups, uh, you know, there's people who wear different hats at the, at the table that, uh, there as well, uh, I would imagine. So um, I'll, I'll leave it at that for now. Thank you, Mr. Warden. Okay, thank you. Councillor Millen. Thank you, Mr. Warden. And I, uh, I, I agree with uh, Councillor Gamble. I, I, I just, uh, I think the terms of reference were agreed to by the council uh, and you know there was going to be a representative from one of those three organizations if you go down to the third term of reference there commercial livestock grain or fruit vegetable producer if we're going to have a representative from every ag organization you're going to need somebody from the corn producers you're going to need the tulip producers you're going to need the raspberry producers the apple producers it goes on and on and on and we simply can't do that all of these people as has maybe been already mentioned i believe all of the people that have been their names have been put forward i'm sure network with other organizations the ag community is well known within their own organizations 
So I don't think we have any lack of representation from the six that have already been put forward. And I'm sure we'd get a great cross section of the uh, opinion of the egg community from those that have already been uh, put forward. So I will not be supporting the amendment. Thank you, Mr. Warden. Okay, thank you. Are there any other comments? Councillor Hutchinson. Go ahead, Councillor Hutchinson. <clears throat> Thank you, Mr. Warden. And if I go through you to uh, Councillor Robinson, I just, during your um, your speech there, did I understand that they were not approached or there was a disconnect there? If I just have some clarity on that, please. Well, through you, Mr. Warden, I, I would ask you, Mr. Warden, to address that. Um, you had, some, you had uh, uh, some dialogue. Yes, uh, well, I, I can communicate what I was communicating to me was is from um, Jackie, who is the secretary for for the Great County Federation of Egg. I thought or I think she communicated with uh, Philly on on the they have the understanding, but they never actually got contacted is what she told me. And I don't know if Madam CEO, if you had any conversations with Philly, because I'm sort of I feel like I'm getting a conversation from a conversation from a conversation. But I know Jackie did uh, talk to me the other morning when she was out milking about 5.30 in the morning and said that um, uh, they were aware of it, but only in the sense that they didn't know any details. And uh, had they been approached, they certainly would have put somebody on there for sure. Because I know they had talked about the enthusiasm of it and looking forward to having a representative. So I, I think there might've been a, a little bit of a communication issue maybe that's happened and so um because i don't think they did put a name for it from that simple reason um so i, I mean in the default and I, i'm only I, i'm not trying to take a position i'm trying to communicate what is being asked by councillor hutchison is i think from the communication had they been approached they would have had somebody on there that's mr uh, warden that's if i if i may um i believe that that all of the organizations were contacted. Heather, was that through an email through your from yourself or from um, Savannah? An e-blast went out. I think Savannah can speak to that, but it was through our um, uh, email yeah. listings that we have. We do have an economic development email listing, and we have an agricultural listing, of which members from all of those organizations are on there. So would have received both the the email blast on the advisory committee along with the terms of reference. And I can confirm that all were on that e-blast and all did receive that invitation and information in terms of reference. And that, and the e-blast Savannah that went out asked them to submit, asked everybody who was interested to submit their expression of interest. That's correct. So maybe after that, maybe you can just let me know who you contacted on that so I can communicate with that to, to them. Sure, we can give you the names after, sure. Okay, thank you. I know Councillor Hutchison of that. Well, they just, yeah, there seemed to be, there was a little confused on how that worked, but I am gonna support the, the motion to, to uh, extend it myself, thank you. Okay, is there anybody new? Because I see Councillor Gamble on there. Is there anybody new that we wish to speak before I go back to second? Huh. Councillor or Madam Madam Clerk, is there anybody new? Councillor Keaveny. Okay, Councillor Keaveny, I, I will get you, Councillor Gamble. I'll come back to you. Councillor Keaveny. Councillor Keaveny, uh, you're, you're on mute. Sorry, I'm now on my phone because somehow my internet dropped. <laughs> so um, I just wanted to add that I do feel it's important that the Federation be represented on this committee. They do uh, represent a number of agricultural groups. And if there has been some uh, confusion or miscommunication or whatever happened that they didn't uh, uh, have opportunity to respond to the uh, request for applicants, then I I hope we can rectify that and uh, and allow them the opportunity to participate because I just don't want to start this group with potential uh, bad feelings that somehow, uh, however it happened, that somehow there was uh, um, a situation where they were overlooked. So I will certainly be supporting this motion. Okay. okay. Is it 
Thank you for that. Is there anybody new, Madam Clerk? Or I'll go back to Councilor Gamble. No, sorry. Okay, Councilor Gamble. Okay, Councilor Gamble. Uh, yeah. I just, yes, I just want to refrain to what I said. I have nothing against the Federation. They're a great organization. That isn't why I said that. But I have a lot of faith in those names that the Jews have picked. Those six have been involved in the agriculture community for some time. And they're very involved. And I feel very confident in what they will do for us. And that's all I want to say. Okay, th thanks for that clarity, Council Gamble. Okay, is there any further questions? Councilor Desai. Okay, sorry, Councilor Desai. Thank you, uh, uh, Mr. Horton. Uh, question, there, there is a um, uh, council representative on this committee, uh, correct? Who would that be? That is uh, Council Robinson. Right, uh, Councilor Robinson also sits, uh, also represents us on the Gray County Federation of Ag, doesn't she? That's, that's who I'm referring to, yes. Right. She's, um, she's, a so, she's a county of great appointee for, for this, that's right. Right, so she's the, sorry, sorry, I'll, I'll try to be more clear. She's the uh, county representation on the Agricultural Advisory Committee. Uh, as well yes. as the uh, Great County Federation of Agriculture, correct? Correct. Right. Uh, so, I mean, I'm just, I'm not, you know, uh, wondering if Councillor Robinson could be, could serve that dual purpose of being the uh, Federation of Ag um, uh, representative as well as the county representative. I will let Councillor Robinson speak to that if she will, Councillor Robinson. Well, through you too, uh, Councillor um, Desai, thank you very much. That's a very positive uh, approach and question. So I'm, um, I'm appointed through uh, Gray County to be on Gray Federation of Agriculture. And certainly I'm uh, one of the appointees on um, the council appointees for our Gray, uh, County Federa uh, Gray County Agricultural Committee. So I have a... Um, representative role as a politician. And I'm suggesting that the uh, Gray Federation of Agricultural role uh, sh certainly should come from the membership. Uh, but uh, definitely uh, the, the idea of having Gray Federation of Agriculture on this committee, I think is a very positive approach. And I, I think it, it's something that I would really ask this, uh, this virtual horseshoe or my colleagues to support. And, um, and then we look forward to the first set of minutes and initiatives that come forward from this committee. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you, Councilor Robinson. Uh, is Mr. that, Mackey? okay, just, I just wanted to go back to Councilor Akash. Is that, is that, did that fulfill your, your question? Thank you, Mr. Warden. Uh, yeah, that, I mean, that answers my question. Um, my position uh, remains unchanged. I, I feel, uh, uh, I feel like we're almost showing playing favorites uh, if we're going to, uh, you know, yeah. go, against go against the terms of reference we passed. So, you know, it's it's I'm a little uncomfortable uh, passing, uh, you know, being in support uh, of Councillor Robinson's uh, motion. I, I don't think uh, it's wrong to have Great County Federation of Ag, but we in our terms of reference we said we would have. Uh, representation from one of those three groups. Uh, they all had an equal chance uh, to to name uh, or to put in an expression of interest. Um, you know, I, I yeah, uh, that's all I have to say on the matter. I have no further new information. Thank okay. you, Mr. Ward. No problem. Councillor Mackey. Thanks, Mr. Warden, and certainly a good discussion. Uh, I also feel uncomfortable, uh, you know, picking one one group out. That uh, I was glad to hear that everyone had the opportunity to uh, to apply for the, these positions, and it's unfortunate that uh, the Gray County Federation of Agriculture somehow didn't apply. But for us to only pick one when there's other organizations that. Uh, also may want to be involved. I, I don't think that would be the best way to go. I don't, I don't think we can play favorites one over the other. Thank you. Okay. Uh, I, I just to 
follow up on that, Councillor Mackey, what we, I think somebody else raised that, Councillor Desai has also asked the, or raised the question about fairness. Is that what you're, are you referring to I, I the all three? I, I think, Mr. Warren, if we're going to, the three federations, if we were going to amend the terms of reference, then all three should be invited to attend, not just uh, picking out one. Thank you. Okay. I just wanted to get Sorry, uh, Madam Clerk. Councillor O'Leary. Okay, go ahead. I haven't heard from you today. Councillor O'Leary, how are you doing? Good, thanks, Mr. Warden. Uh, just some clarity from uh, the clerk. It, we're, we're voting on this amendment separately, correct? Could we have that recorded, please? Yes, you could certainly have it recorded. And yes, we are still just discussing the amendment. Thanks. Okay. All right, are there any other questions and I'm going to have you read the amendment just so everybody knows what they're voting on Madam Clerk. <laughs> I'm actually going to have Tara read it because she's <laughs> taking the minute so she'll have it documented. She's actually going to pull it up on the screen. So okay. there's the amendment um, that you're voting on and Councillor O'Leary has requested a recorded vote. Okay. All right, so okay. everybody understands the question. So I guess uh, I hear no other comments, Madam Clerk. So you may proceed with your vote. Okay, so if you're voting in favor, you're voting in favor to amend or to have a rep from the Gray County Federation of Ag on there and amend the um, terms of reference. I will start. Councillor Mackey. No. Councillor Gamble. No. Councillor Burley. Opposed. Councillor Carlton. Opposed. Warden McQueen. In favor. Councillor Desai. Opposed. Councillor Patterson. Opposed. Councillor Hicks. Nay. Councillor Clumpus. Opposed. Councillor Keaveny. In favor. Councillor Body. Opposed. Councillor O'Leary. Opposed. Uh, Councillor Woodbury. Opposed. Councillor Millen. Nay. Councillor Soever. In favor. Councillor Potter. In favor. Councillor Robinson. In favor. Councillor Hutchinson. In favor. The motion is lost 34 to 56. Okay, thank you, Madam Clerk. So we go back to the original motion, um, which is also, I guess, we, do we consider it still moved and second as well from the, what was that? Okay. So the motion that was uh, in their staff report with the recommendations of the names, is there any, any other questions or uh, comments there? Okay, if not, is there anybody opposed to that motion? That is carried. Okay. So then uh, moving on then. Uh, are we doing all right? Everybody still wants to keep going? You don't need a, a break or nothing? Uh, our next item is uh, item level ser of service policy. And this is moved by Councillor Mackey and Councillor Patterson. And this is being brought forward by Steve. Steve uh, Delamire. So, welcome, Steve. Thank you for uh, having me, Warden. Uh, good afternoon, Warden. You're not very loud. You're not coming in very loud. Hear me now? Yeah, that's better. <laughs> good afternoon, Warden McQueen and County Council. Transportation Services is currently looking for 
the new proposed level of service policy. Steve, you sound like you're on the moon. <laughs> or uh, Mars, one or the other. I'm in my office, so. Um, okay, I don't, I'm not sure. Just, I guess you can keep you're trying. Steve, if you're fading in and out, um, Mr. Warden, I wonder if we if we go to the next report, and we'll get Steve. Um, I'll get him a headset so that he doesn't do that because you have to be able to hear him. Okay. Is that okay, that Mrs. So, Madam Clerk. Oh, Madam Clerk, how do we do this? <laughs> we yeah, we do have a motion on the floor. Yeah. I can um, take a, we can take a five minute break. We can take a five minute break if you wish, and then get him set up. Okay. If, Rob. Rob has a portable mic that he'll take to to Steve's office right now. Okay, five minute break, 246, be back. <laughs> Thanks. Mics and screens, please.
Okay, Madam Clerk, do we have a uh, quorum back? Do we have a guy with a mic? <laughs> we, yes, we do. Okay, so, so yes, we have quorum, but do we have a guy with a mic? <laughs> okay. Steve, right. are you so, on? Steve, how are you doing? His microphone icon is missing, so I will be right back. I'll go see if I can help. So just while we're waiting for Steve, um, Mayor Woodbury and, and Councillor Millen, I see you've got a Stars of Southgate coming up. It was to, to, to me today. Yes, we do, but uh, do not be concerned. I'm pretty sure John is not going to be tap dancing, and I will not be singing. Oh, you'll be watching. Oh, I'm not tap dancing. Oh, maybe you are. Um, I maybe you are, <laughs> but I know I'm is not it, singing. Is it too late to get refunds of the tickets now? <laughs> you paid for your ticket. Well, I got an email from a Nigerian prince. <laughs> Mr. Warden, <laughs> Steve has yes. joined us. Okay. <laughs> Just well, in the we'll time. come back to that. We'll, we'll come back to that. Thanks, uh, thanks, Madam Clerk. Steve, welcome. Uh, thank you. Let's try this again. Can you guys hear me now? Better, yes. Got IT and communications here helping me out. Good stuff. It right. still sounds like you're in outer space, but that's better than the, than the moon. <laughs> oh, interesting. Um, good afternoon, Warren McQueen and County Council. Um, Transportation Services is looking for county enforcement of the new proposed level of service policy that is attached to the staff report here. Uh, we're also looking to rescind all previous policies that we made. Proposed policy that we're how is the transportation service to identify what it will do to attempt to look expectations of its roads? So, so I gotta stop. I'm gonna stop you there, Steve. You're coming still in and out. I don't know if, if you can go and, and, and sit beside somebody's computer or, or you're just not coming in clear enough for us to hear. Um, sorry about that, Steve. We, we, we wanna hear every word you have to say. Okay. Um, I, Where are you, I anyway? wonder if um, I wonder if Pat could. Speak. Yeah, he's about he's about twenty feet from me. Can you hear me clear enough? <laughs> yeah, you're 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 right here. Okay, I'll get him. I'll get him. He can come in here. Okay. Fantastic. Steve, hear me now. Yes. Yes. Okay. So there. Start again here. Um, currently, Transportation Services is looking to uh, bring a, forward a new policy for the level of service for uh, maintenance of the transportation roads and bridges. Um, Right now, we are uh, trying to look at rescinding all our current policies that were relate to previous level of service enhancements and policies that were brought forward in previous councils. Um, bear with me here for a second. Transportation Services Department um, is looking to identify what it will do in an attempt to meet public's expectations for maintenance of its roads and bridges and how it will respond to summer and winter maintenance events considering available resources and local historic experiences with normal summer and winter events. Um, the policy also is not a reduction in the current level of service that the county provides, um, but the pol proposed policy ensures residents and visitors will continue to receive the same level of service that they've historically received in the past. 
So basically, we're just trying to bring you guys back up to compliance of what was done. Um, the provincial minimum maintenance standards were revised in 2018. Staff did bring a report to council back in the fall of 2018, and we're just trying to get them formally into a new policy for the county to have. So is there any questions? Okay. Any questions? So, so this is sort of like... Uh an update because uh, the minimum maintenance standards used to come from OGRA at one time. And yeah. So you're, you're upgrading them. So, okay. Any questions from County Council? Councillor Mackey. Councillor Mackey, go ahead. Thanks, Mr. Warden. And uh, through you to Steve, just wondering what the term near the end of the report, it says marginally enhanced risk. Can <laughs> that get narrowed down for us? And has that term been, uh, you know, floated past our insurer. Yes, um, through you, Warden McQueen to Councillor Mackey. This report has been flowing through our uh, insurance department. It's also been flowing through the legal group as well. Um, we've gone through a fine tooth comb and we're just kind of making sure that we have keywords there that will keep us available for, for us to defend ourselves with litigation or claims down the road here. So it's we're, any any actions we do, we want to make sure that we have proper policies in place to make sure that we can defend the county and show our due diligence. Okay, thank you very much. Okay, thanks, uh, Councilor Mackey. Any other comments, questions? Yes, Mr. Warden. Go ahead, Councilor Swarver. Yeah, so um, I'm looking at the definitions in the, the uh, document that you provided, which showed the red line um, um, changes from 2013 to 2018. And in particular, I'm looking at bicycle facility and bicycle lane. Now, previously, before we had a bicycling uh, plan, I think we'd be fairly safe in saying that the paved shoulders um, are a bicycle facility which means that they're on road and in boulevard cycling facilities that are listed in book 18 of the Ontario traffic manual because it does refer to, the manual does refer to um, a portion of the uh, road, a uh, shared roadway. But when you look at the definition of bicycle lane here, it says a portion of the roadway that is been designated by pavement markings and or or sorry pavement markings or signage for the preferential or exclusive use of cyclists. So my question is, um, if we do put up signs that say bicycling route and it's part of the bicycling master plan, have we then turned a bicycle facility into a bicycle lane? And then are we going to be covered by the provisions um, in that talk about um, maintenance of, the, of that on the lane and, and clearing snow and everything else? Steve? And, and Steve, you may want to, to have Michael speak to this or Pat. I could, I could speak to it, I guess. Thanks, Pat. Yeah, Steve and I are rotating chairs here now. I hope this isn't an ongoing thing. But anyway, um, yeah, basically, when we brought forward the, the um, even this policy a couple of years ago, we mentioned in there that um, it is the bike lanes specifically, as you said, uh, Councillor Sawyer, for the specific and preferential use of bikes that need to be maintained. So the bike lanes that we actually have, which we have three of them, we do close in the winter. Um, the other paved shoulders are basically for everybody's use. So they're not really preferentially marked for um, bikes themselves. Um, and they're not, um, uh, they're signed as a cycling route, but a, a cyclist, for example, does not have to drive on them. It is kind of their own, at their own um, judgment, whether or not they can still drive in the lane. They don't have to drive in the, in the bike or in the paved shoulder if they don't want to. So, um, you know, we, we kind of say we don't maintain them in the winter, our paved shoulders either um, for walkers or for cyclists. So that's kind of where we're at with that. I don't know if Michael has more to say, but that's kind of where we're at. It's only, the only ones we officially close are those uh, book 18 bike lanes. So 
Well, Council Swever, do you have a follow up to that, or do you need? No, no, that clarity? that explains that. I think um, you know, as long as we're happy that we haven't turned, like at what level of signage, and we have to be careful, I guess, with the words we put on our signage. Well, you know, at some point, the if we're directing people onto those, somebody might say that it's preferentially used by cyclists and then we're going to fall under the the bike lane instead of a bicycling facility definition so that's Learned a, a legal question but i just wanted to pick that up the other thing is that in here they talk about the they've changed average annual daily traffic to average daily traffic and it seems like the um, definition of that is 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 far looser so I'm kind of happy with that um, because as I understand it we we kind of tend to do our um, traffic counts on shoulder seasons so previously when it was called annual average daily traffic count I don't think we or any other municipality actually collected data for 365 days and averaged it as was implied in the definition. And, and now I guess we don't have to. So um, I guess I just uh, want to know, like, because we are doing most of our counts on shoulder season, are, are we actually reflecting the, the correct uh, class of roadway then with our traffic counts? Sounds like a pat question. I can answer that too, Mr. Warden. Yeah, you're, you're right that um, a lot of times the industry uses that AADT. Um, but as you said, an AADT is really all 365 days and hardly anybody does that. Like an MTO counter might, uh, you know, somewhere. Um, but we really use average daily traffic. And uh, the counts that we do in the shoulder seasons um, are basically to reflect what an AADT would be. So you know, typically more in the summer, less in the winter, spring and fall is about your average. So that's kind of, yeah, we really kind of use, uh, even we, we call it AADT sometimes, and really we shouldn't, it should be uh, ADT. It's just a kind of um, interpolated average of what the counts would be if we had taken them every day all year. Thank you. Okay, uh, any, other, any other comments, questions? Okay, so it's been moved and second. And uh, thanks, Steve. Is there anybody opposed to this resolution? Okay, that is carried. All right, uh, moving on then to um, report. I think, Pat, I think you're going to take this one, yes, uh, with yeah. regards to TRCW 2720. This is with regards to the roundabout. And it's moved by Councillor Sewever and second by Councillor Potter. And Pat, you have the floor. Just gonna try to uh, share my screen here. Okay. Can you see that? Sure can, yep. And you're coming in loud and clear. All right. Now I just need to find the other part that uh, I can turn the page here. Okay, let's see. <laughs> oh, there we go. Maybe okay, you Steve. All right, here, <laughs> here it is. Here, if everyone's okay. They can see that that uh, title page, right? Yep. Okay, so this is about the uh, Gray Road 19 and 21 intersection, specifically really dealing with the water booster station. So I'm going to go through this PowerPoint here, and uh, like I said, any questions we'll uh, we'll field. I'll try to go as quick as I can here, but basically this is the purpose of the report. Uh, the first part dealing with uh, just that we're looking for some council direction. The, the estimates that we've gotten are uh, climbing uh, with the water booster station uh, 419 and 21. So we're just looking for some, some guidance on uh, who is going to pay for what, who pays for the potential of land that we have to buy to maybe move it possibly, and then who's paying for engineering services and leading the design. Then I'll go on to answer some questions uh, from the town of Blue Mountains from their motion that I'll, I'll uh, reference. It references it in the report, um, just about uh, future needs 
um, gateway features, and then a presentation for the, the uh, town, and then a little bit about the project timing, which has, which has been a struggle. Um, so firstly, uh, the last report we had that came through mentioned about a $1.5 million um, amount for the, for the water booster station, which needs to be moved as part of the 19 and 21 roundabout. This is our latest estimate or the latest estimate from Town Blue Mountains, actually. Um, as you can see, it's, it's over 2 point, you know, up near 2.1 now. Um, so that's just where we're not feeling real comfortable. It's climbing. Uh, we had originally put about 700,000 in our 2021 uh, draft budget. Um, now we're, you know, we don't have enough to pay for this. So we're just looking for a committee's uh, feedback. So here is some things to consider. And some of this was outlined in, uh, in the report Matt and Mark brought in September. Um, there was no original agreement in 2004 regarding the future costs. So, um, you know, they, they put it in the right of way, which made sense. There was room at that time. The intersection was, was a set of signals. So, um, you know, uh, it wasn't in the way of anything. So it kind of made sense then. But we didn't really make an agreement then, which we would probably do if we were doing it now on who pays for it, you know, 18 years later or 17 years later or whatever. Um, and of course, the town of Blue Mountains, you know, feels this way with number two, which, you know, I can see what they're saying. If the intersection wasn't being reconstructed into a roundabout configuration, we would not need to move the water booster station. If it had just stayed a set of signals, although there was some options for, you know, a lot of additional lanes that would have eventually got there, um, a short-term reconstruction of signals wouldn't have necessarily required moving the booster station. Uh, one other thing to remember is just that the water booster station is an upgrade. Currently it's below ground and the new one they want to uh, construct is above ground, which is makes sense for confined spaces and safety. And um, you don't see as many below ground ones built now. Owen Sound recently did the same thing uh, working with us about um, they were, they were um, going to put a new above ground station in. Uh, our point number four is just, um, you know, would we have known in, in 2004 when this went in or maybe 2002 when the design on it started um, that the, the intersection was gonna be a roundabout in the future? Probably not, or maybe we would have had to buy extra land then and put it farther away. Um, one other thing, Simcoe staff, point five here, they've expressed their belief that they should not contribute to the booster station. Um, now that isn't uh, a motion passed by their council. That was just what staff told us dealing with the project. So um, whether you point back to number two and say it's part of the big project, so we should all chip in, um, maybe looking for some leadership from uh, council on that as well. Uh, point six was in the motion, if you read the motion in the report on page 60, it mentions about the town um, wanting to be given fair market value consideration. So it seems to be talking about land. Um, there's some land that we've already gotten uh, through the development process. Um, it doesn't seem like the water booster station is going to be on that land. It, we might have to acquire additional land. So uh, they're looking for um, fair market value consideration. Uh, this is our latest estimate. So then you can see before and our source of funds. So it was 1.5 million we were using for our estimate. And now it's you know almost 2.1. So um, when you go through and figure out our development charge uh, ratio and our net funding from levy, it's just about up here, you know, just about 300, almost 300,000 or 185,000, I guess, um, additional funding or 285, sorry, somehow that we're gonna have to find for this. This is the other, um, this is from the 10 year capital. So this is money to be spent on the project um, as of our last 10 year capital. So this million uh, dollars in 2021 was basically for uh, utility relocations. So we weren't really counting on um, what we were gonna spend on the booster station at that point. Um, and, and, and we still have no idea, I'll talk about it later, what our total utility relocation costs will be. And then we had our three million price here shared with Simcoe um, for the eventual roundabout construction. And then just for reference, in 2023, um, if the Gray, nine, Gray Road 19 four lane expansion happens, um, we're into about a five million dollar project there that is um, that is just ours and and other sources of revenue. But it would it would be uh, all gray. 
Um, so here's some things about engineering and design. The town requested that the, the water booster station be added to our consultant design work. Because right now we have a consultant uh, contract um, with a local consultant to design the roundabout. When that um, tender, or I guess it was a proposal, was completed in 2011, the, the water booster station design was not included. So the town feels that if, uh, if we were maybe to add a change order to our contract with the consultant who's designing the roundabout and dealing with the utilities, there'd be some advantages um, that would make it easier for the project to move forward. So here's the advantages. They feel that um, one, one consultant would be well-equipped to handle both um, rather than have um, you know, the, a new consultant running back and forth, trying to figure out where the roundabout design is at. If something had to be moved in the roundabout, say, um, you'd have to go, you know, for your lighting or something, you'd have to go back if the booster station wasn't um, where you wanted it to be. So they just, they're just um, figuring it would be easier to have it with one consultant, which makes sense. Um, so there it would avoid having additional consultant brought in. And the other thing is uh, you wouldn't have to go through an, the town wouldn't have to go through a big process to award the work. Um, and it would, in theory, complete the job more quickly. Um, it's hard for me to talk about this job and talk about it being more quickly completed because it's been so long to complete. But from our point of view, the disadvantages are just, we would be leading an infrastructure project regarding an asset that wasn't ours, which is peculiar. Um, we, we've, had, we've done it in the past. Um, Hello, everything okay? Um, everyone can hear me okay? Yep. Okay. We've done that in the past with some of our urban jobs where, the, where uh, the lead would be us on a road job, for example. And we just found with sanitary, it didn't work that well because um, we were kind of the middleman and it was really the town, the water and the sanitary were really the towns were leading a project. Um, and that's why when we do urban projects now, we usually let the town lead because water and sanitary are just way easier for them to handle. It's their people, their operators, that type of thing. So um, we've gotten away from that underground infrastructure we're not responsible for. Um, and that goes to point two here that we've, you know, we're not into water infrastructure. We don't have any. So uh, it's just a new risk that we don't currently have. Um, and the other, the other thing is, it, it, and this is kind of, these last two things are a question of timing, I guess. Um, until the utility relocations are, are designed, it's going to be hard to get a real big start on the water booster station anyway. Um, they're nearing, um, we'll talk about the, uh, the relocation designs, but um, I don't know if the timing is, you know, we're hoping to do relocations in 2021. It's kind of a tough go anyway, and I don't know if we're going to gain anything. Now, that being said, just back to point number two about risk. Uh, we would have to develop an agreement with Blue Mountains if they were leading uh, all the water booster station stuff through our process. So they're not as concerned about that as maybe we are. And then of course the consultant wouldn't necessarily be bidding on the work if we were to award it to them directly. Um, so seemingly there might be some higher prices there you might pay for, but so that's kind of the advantages and disadvantages of, of, uh, of basically us procuring the services of the consultant on behalf of Blue Mountains to do the water booster station design. Um, the next kind of group of, um, of uh, this slide here is, is dealing with some questions uh, from the Blue Mountains Council. Now this was, these were questions that came through their August 25th meeting. It was before Matt Mark presented his report on the roundabout. So some of these questions I think he's already answered. Um, but I thought I'd go through them again just because they were in the motion that, that the Blue Mountains passed. So there was a lot of discussion about the roundabout not having a big enough capacity looking forward. So I think there's a general misunderstanding because it is a two lane roundabout. Um, as traffic just flows in the counterclockwise direction, um, a two lane roundabout basically matches a four lane road and a one lane roundabout matches a two lane road. So I don't know if there's a, a general understanding that um, you know, people see the term two lane roundabout and they feel like it's only matching a two lane road. Really a two lane roundabout is matching a four lane road, if that makes sense. So it's always, it's always been assumed that it was going to be a two lane roundabout um, all the way through the EA process, etc. So um, the capacity we feel is very good. Um, 
it's in the report that it could be possibly up to 45,000 cars with a two lane roundabout operating efficiently. Um, the largest count we've ever had was 19,000 on a family day weekend. Um, that being said, maybe that count was low because cars were backed up. So uh, we feel very strongly that this uh, roundabout is, is uh, gonna be adequate. The other thing we've done is got Burnside to do a uh, traffic study. And basically they said by 2030, you're still level of service A, which is as high as you can get. So uh, we know it'll be good until 2030. By 2040, potentially, there could be some, um, some delays, you know, on a, on a peak day, uh, family day weekend would be another one to guess, or maybe a, you know, a, a Sunday afternoon, people leaving to go home after day of skiing or that type of thing. Some of those would be addressed by a potential eastbound or westbound uh, bypass. So um, basically an additional lane um, that would kind of keep cars out of the roundabout. So that could be a potential for 2040. We'd have to go through and add that at that point. Um, that being said, we should probably, Simcoe and ourselves, acquire some additional land um, moving forward with an eye towards 2040. Uh, the other um, thing in the town's motion was about a gateway feature. So this is just a picture that I got from St. Thomas. I guess I didn't know it was the railway city, but um, they had built this, uh, this um, art piece in the middle of their roundabout. So we, we've been uh, dealing with Blue Mountains on this. They asked us if we'd be okay with a gateway feature. We have no issues with it, other than it is also the gateway for Gray, Simcoe, and Collingwood. Um, Gray has basically, um, you know, Gray Road 19 and 21, Simcoe Road 34 is there, Mountain Road from Collingwood is there. Um, Blue Mountains doesn't have any roads in the intersection. So um, for them to get the gateway feature, if others wanted it, could be an issue. So it would have to be something that uh, we need to work with the town on and with our partners um, as it's not really Blue Mountains Road. So yeah, um, I can understand why a gateway feature would be, uh, would be uh, recommended for tourism and just noticing that you're coming into Blue Mountains, um, you know, it's, it's uh, a nice tourist destination and uh, it'd be nice to have a feature there. Whether or not it needs to go in the middle, I don't know. Um, we have uh, Blue Mountain Resort still does maintenance on our roundabout middle in uh, at 119 and 19. So we would need an agreement to take care of maintenance and that type of thing, but that's probably the least of our worries really. But uh, the other thing we mentioned was we wouldn't want it to be a hazard. Um, you wouldn't want it to be something people were crossing the road to look at, and you wouldn't want it to be something that a car could maybe smash into and um, really do some damage to itself. Um, it'd be pretty rare that would happen, but um, it's just another concern. So the other thing in the motion, and it's not in our uh, uh, motion, um, just about the town uh, requesting that we go to their uh, transportation committee and make a presentation. Um, I didn't really feel it was my place to, to you know, work on a presentation and uh, get it all together and go over there and do a presentation for their committee. If, if this committee wants me to go do that, I'm ready to go do that. Um, but it will take some resources and time. So this is our challenging schedule. So step number one, uh, the temporary signals of crosswinds are going to go this fall uh, very shortly. Um, where we're into to trouble is at step number two. So the utility locations in 2021 and the pumping station relocation upgrade in 21 is quite a challenge. Um, Simcoe is still waiting for the final confirmed utility relocations uh, plans. They don't wanna start buying land before that because we're not sure if it'll work. So. They don't want to go out and, you know, agree to buy half an acre from somebody and then it turns out, oh, no, it needs to be 0.7 of an acre or whatever. So um, I think those those 2021 dates on utility relocations and the pumping station are going to be pretty tough to hit. I think we'll be into 22 um, with that, P potentially starting in late 21, but um, it's going to be difficult. And then that just pushes the whole schedule. Um, step four, five and six or step four and five, I guess, would be pushed to 23 and maybe we try to do a huge. Uh, job in 23 with all our all our work over there, which would be good anyway, really. Um, just to talk about the utilities. So um, basically everyone's waiting on Hydro One. Most of the intersection is uh, Hydro One utilities. When Hydro One gets their design complete, the rest of the utilities are going to kind of work around it. And sometimes they have to tie in um, with some of the utilities. So um, just for a cost sharing, just for curiosity. So with Hydro One and Epcor, 
we pay 50% of labor and labor saving devices, which is equipment. Uh, Rogers basically is on the hook for moving uh, for themselves. And uh, Bell, we pay 50% as well. Union Gas and Enbridge, we pay 35% of the total. So that includes uh, the equipment and um, material. So we don't pay material for hydro and uh, EPCOR. Okay. So back to our motion again, this is um, that the report be received. Um, council provides some direction regarding the cost sharing agreement and some potential allocations and property costs, whether we include the property costs in. Uh, that being said, we don't even know what they are or where exactly it's gonna go. So that uh, that's a tough uh, thing to put a number on right now. But um, And uh, council provide direction of the staff regarding administration, which is about that consultant. Um, do you want us to uh, procure the services of that consultant for the booster station or would you rather have it go back to Blue Mountains and um, whichever you prefer. But And then uh, last, just that the uh, the council basically supports, um, you know, our design and, oh, active transportation was the one thing I sort of missed. That was one of their notes that they had put to. Um, we've always had active transportation uh, in our facilities lately. The three meter trail is included um, in the Northwest corner of the, of the roundabout. And uh, there'd be uh, paved shoulders to the roundabout. Then you would either, you would get off your, off your bike and you could either walk it through the intersection or you could go through the roundabout uh, slowly uh, on, your, on your bike. That was one thing I forgot to mention, sorry about that. So that's it for my presentation. Okay, uh, Pat, and, and you're asking for some more than one item here for direction. Um, and just a quick question. The current lights that are there now, how long have they been there, the signal lights that are there now? Uh, I'm not sure. I, yeah, I'm not sure exactly, as long as I can remember. But um, So they've been there as long as the pumping station is there? I'm assuming before like the pumping that, station. most likely. The oh, okay. Are, they're, okay. they're a temporary installation, like they're not a, but it, you know, which are only supposed to last a few years, but they've been there a pretty extended period of time. Yeah. Okay. Okay, so um, there's a bit of direction here need to be given is what you're asking for from your motion. Uh, just one other comment is um, you mentioned that uh, the Simcoe County staff is sort of saying, well, they don't want to really be a part of it, but uh, you're suggesting that maybe it needs to be taken to a higher level of a political level and having that higher higher conversation or maybe a letter sent to the, the council part for maybe Gray County and Blue. Would that be the process on that, uh, Pat, or how would you suggest to, to sort of tease that out further to the... I think, I think that the, would be uh, appropriate. I think that would be appropriate, yeah. Okay, so maybe a letter could be drafted and uh, because I think they certainly Simcoe County and the town of Collingwood benefit just as much as Gray and Blue, right? It's a two-way... It's going both ways, right? Yeah. Okay. All right. So you heard the presentation. Uh, comments? Because there is there is a couple spots and there's, there's looking for some direction. I know you brought this forward to us um, uh, a couple months back, I think it was, maybe six weeks ago or two months ago or something like that. All right. Councilor Swever. Okay. Start off with Councilor Swever. Go ahead, Councilor Swever. You're, you're representing Blue Mountain, so you may have some other input here. Yes, so thank you, Pat, for your very uh, comprehensive report. I know this is not a simple project and, uh, you know, it suffers from, you know, there not being any clarity years back on when, when we were actually allowed to put a booster station in a county road allowance without an agreement. So that makes things a little more complicated. Um, so um, I think this is one of the highlight this highlights the problems that we identified earlier, both as a county in the town of Blue Mountains and the need for an integrated regional transportation strategy. Because, um, you know, anybody that's familiar with what happens at the mountain, um, at, even at lunchtime, you see a stream of vehicles heading into Collingwood to pick up some fast food because if you've got four or five people and you were to go somewhere in the village, it would actually cost you considerably more to have a burger and um, that what you could get at McDonald's in uh, Collingwood. And, and you see the same thing right immediately after skiing. So people use this route and it does, you know, provide a quick route to Collingwood. Uh, 
for people to be able to do that. So, you know, there is a big, a big benefit to the businesses and the revenue that Simcoe uh, generates from them. So I think we, we, do, we do need to deal with uh, Simcoe County on this. Now, one of the things um, in the cost allocation that you mentioned, there's a, a net levy funding requirement. Um, would not um, most of this be covered with um, development charges? I know there's, I forget how many, well, windfalls right next to it. And there's like 700 units there. And uh, I know there's, a huge surplus of unspent development charges in in from the everything that's going on in Craigleith, and clearly the need for a roundabout, and all of this is is growth related. If there wasn't this development, uh, certainly the current intersection would be fine for years to come. So I'm just wondering why we're showing a, a net levy funding required when there is the huge amount of development charges there. Do you wish to? Yeah, I could answer that. I guess I should. Um, yeah, I guess in the slide program, in the slide we had, uh, I had pictures of the of the exact DC. This we just were focusing on the levy because that's money that um, you know has to come um, really through the taxpayer. So um, uh, we do have millions and you know millions of dollars assigned to this DC project um, as well. So. Um, so yeah, you, we could include more detail as far as how much DC funding is needed because um, I had it in my slide here, but um, yeah, the majority of the project is, st is still DCs, yeah. quite a bit. Okay, and then uh, you also mentioned um, that I know our transportation committee has, has asked for a presentation because they're working on our transportation master plan um, with our staff and um, so I don't see anything in the recommendations or the motion there that um, you, you said you'd like council authorization for that in your presentation, but there's nothing in the motion on that. So uh, I'm just wondering whether we should perhaps put that into the motion. If I yeah. may, Mr. Warden, I think, um, I think that um, what we were really hoping to get was just confirmation from council that um, we had your support for the, the design as far as it's come and the information that's come before you. Um, so that when Pat and his team went to Blue Mountains, they could be speaking on uh, and, and from a place of confidence that what they were presenting was what had been discussed with county council and that, that you folks were supportive of it. And that's where the, the last uh, part of the uh, resolution is, is meant to, to deal with that, that we have your support and that Pat and his team can go and speak confidently to that effect. Well, thank you. So, so just, there's three parts to this motion that we do have on the floor. I'm just trying to figure out here. It says that, uh, again, the allocation or relocation of the booster and, and Pat has raised the part about the shared cost or who pays for that cost. <clears throat> and then one question that, that Pat did raise was, should Simple County uh, pay some of that cost or should they be uh, one third partner or the town of the mountains and the town of Collingwood be half the partners on this as well? So Madam CAO, how do we tease that out? Do we need a, a separate motion that gives us give staff or give somebody the authority to, to, to have that conversation at a high level. It's, it seems to be coming back for what Pat said that at the staff level, they're sort of saying, well, you know, we don't need that, but should we, do we, you know, take it to the high level in the sense of that particular part of the cost sharing because. I think um, in the earlier resolution, in the previous report, you're, you asked us to negotiate an agreement in principle and to bring it back to you to review. I think through our discussions today, if, you, if what I'm hearing and seeing around the table is that people feel that there are other conversations to be had with Simcoe or with Collingwood, then um, we, can, we can take that and we can, um, enter into those discussions from a, a place of this is what council has directed us to do. I don't know, Heather, we could 
put a we could amend the resolution here slightly to be explicit about that if councils it's council's wish um, to go that far it certainly would strengthen our negotiating position if we had a, a specific direction from you in the form of a resolution yes i i agree uh, with kim i think at an amendment to the motion uh, directing staff to approach both the county of simcoe and the town of collingwood on um, cost sharing allocations uh, being supported by council would provide staff with that um, authority then to go and, and write that formal letter to both entities. Right, it makes it, it makes it formal and then you get a formal answer back. I think that's very important. If it has to take it to the next level of, of the political side, well then that could take that next step, right? Okay, so can we, is that okay, Pat? And okay, I got a question from uh, Councillor Burling. <clears throat> Maybe he's looking to move that motion. <laughs> looking to move that motion. Makes perfect sense. Okay. Yeah. Why should we all have to pay for it, right? Okay. Do I have a seconder for that amendment? <clears throat> do you want an amendment or is it sort of an amendment to the amendment? Is it an amendment to the motion or how are we doing this? Yes, it will be an amendment to the motion. And I okay, see I Councilor Potter. Potter. Yeah. Councilor okay. Potter on that. Can you just sort of clarify what that is then so everybody understands what the amendment is? Sure. Um, Tara's typing it down, but it will be for uh, to direct staff to um, formally approach the County of Simcoe and the Town of Collingwood on cost sharing um, allocations related to the 1921 roundabout. Okay, uh, so we'll deal with that one first. I see Councillor Millen has a hand. Okay, Councillor Millen, I don't see it, but go ahead. Thank you, Mr. Warden. I, I think uh, the amendment uh, demonstrates very clearly the importance of maintaining good relations with our neighbors and staying in our own lane and not messing with their business unnecessarily because I don't think you're going to get a very positive response from Simcoe on a, on a request for any kind of money on any kind of a project. Uh, but uh, I, I will support the amendment and I have no doubt that Matt will do her uh, Pat will do a, a great job in uh, putting our position forward, but I would be absolutely shocked if they said, oh, sure, Gray County, here's a check, help yourself. Anyway, we'll see what turns out. Okay. Well, and there's also conversation with, uh, as Councillor uh, Soeber has said, is more of a regional approach as well. Okay, any other comments? Any, it's moved and second the amendment. Is there any other comments? Seeing none, all in favor. Or sorry, is anybody opposed? Anybody opposed? Okay, that's that amendment's carried. Um, the other points here is um, so that the council provides directions to staff regarding the project administration model for the project. So you're talking about uh, Pat in the sense of what level would do that, or is that sort of premature until you talk to have this letter for uh, sent out? Yeah, no, that was more about the um, whether you wanted us to procure the services of that consultant to start the water booster station or whether you wanted it to, you know, maybe to go back to Blue Mountains to um, get that those services. So can that wait until we get some word back from Simcoe and a Collingwood town of Collingwood or is that something we need direction right now? Well, I mean, you, you got to design it one way or the other. Um, we can argue about the money later, okay. probably we might as well start getting the design services. Okay, so uh, the director of transportation is seeking some direction. What's your feeling, council? Oh, direction. <laughs> Does everybody understand the question? I see Councillor uh, Hicks. Councillor Hicks, thank you. Yes, yeah, so ahead. Mr. Gordon, I'm not sure that I'm understanding uh, what the options are uh, for project administration. Uh, I'm I'm just puzzled. Like, what are the options? And then maybe we can give some direction. So that was back in the slide uh, uh, presentation that uh, Pat had presented there just a few minutes ago. Pat, are you able to pull that slide up where it talks about who procures, why, sure. who procures, who procures it, and sure. the advantages and disadvantages? Right. Yeah. Oh, does Tara want to throw it up there? Maybe Tara. I could, but does Tara have it open mm -hmm. or no? I can't. Yeah, Tara's going to throw it up. If I can, just to restate what Pat had spoken to earlier, um, 
Greek County has not in the past been involved in the construction of water infrastructure. So this would be something that would be new for us and simply wanting to know if, um, if council is supportive of us taking this on as part of the overall contract or whether or not um, certainly Town of the Blue Mountains could procure this and, and have the design done independent from the overall project. So I think there was a slide that showed the yeah. advantages and disadvantages. Yeah, slide seven. That's right. Mr. Warden, I, I, I get it now. Uh, so I okay. apologize for <laughs> pushing us back. Well, I didn't mean to do that at all. Uh, my, my personal view uh, is that uh, it's, it's not a, a business uh, that we have expertise in and we should stay away from it. Yep, that, that makes sense. Uh, so then that would mean that the town of Blue Mountains would do the procurement and at that level. Um, I guess I can speak to the, the, the representatives from the town of Blue Mountains. I guess uh, this is talking about the Blue Mountains. Uh, comments there? Yes, uh, Mr. Warden. Uh, certainly, uh, I understand uh, the, the county's position on that. And um, so I think what we need to do is, um, I think the town of Blue Mountains position, I can't speak for council at this point, but my own view would be that we would be happy to um, manage that part of the project, but I also see that it should be part of one project. And, you know, um, because if we, you don't want two consultants because one guy says, okay, this is my schedule. And the other guy says, well, yeah, but this is my schedule. And then if one person falls behind and, you know, it stops the other project because they're not ready yet. Uh, so there needs to be some coordination and collaboration. So uh, I think we're, we're happy to deal with the risks so that the county isn't uh, exposed to more risk on that part of the project, but it should be part of the overall project with the same consultant then, you know, because otherwise you're gonna have two different projects really working on one project. And that's, in my experience, has been a recipe for disaster. The more consultants you have on one project, uh, the less effective it is. Okay, so is there a hybrid way of doing this? <laughs> um, if I may, well, I, Pat, I think we can work with this, can we not? Yeah, uh, yeah, I mean, it's, it's not the end of the world. Like, okay, yeah. So, so are we agreeing then that the county of, of uh, Gray Will be well, can, in the... the... The county, the town of Blue Mountains will work with the consultant that's already on the project and um, to, but they will be responsible for the um, overall design of the water booster station. They will have to sign off on the water booster station. We'll still have to deal with some procurement issues between the two entities, but we will do that. Okay, let's put that in some kind of a resolution here so it's written down here. However you word of that, maybe we'll get a move in a seconder then. Did you capture that, Heather? <laughs> um, Tara's frantically typing here. So um, while she's doing that, I wonder before we get a mover in a seconder, Councillor Desai has his hand up. And I just will note for Council um, and the public that Councillors Millen and Compass have left the meeting. Oh, okay. Okay, thank you for that. We have we still have quorum. So, Councillor, while well, that's being typed up uh, for this other second amendment, Councillor Desai, go ahead. Thank you, Mr. Warden. Um, <clears throat> just a quick question there for uh, for Pat. Um, he mentioned County at one point worked with uh, with City of Owen Sound on on the uh, on upgrading their water booster station. Um, what was the, how did the cost flooding work in that case? Okay, because clearly I'm seeing there's a precedent, so maybe we should follow that precedent. Um, the second one that I have is the process usually around uh, consideration for, of, uh, for land. Um, if my understanding is correct, uh, we're, we're trying to uh, get land from, uh, from, from the town of Blue Mountains. So what's the process around consideration for obtaining land from lower tier municipalities. Um, and that's the two questions I have for now, Mr. Warden. Okay, thank you. Pat, do you have uh, a yeah. follow up? I can answer those three, Mr. Warden. So that project with Owen Sound um, actually hasn't been built yet, um, but they are paying for their entire booster station. 
Um, that being said, it didn't have to be moved because of the road. So there is, there's a difference there. Um, as far as land, um, if, if the land that we had acquired through development um, was basically, you know, free to the county, um, that's kind of a different thing than um, if, if Blue Mountains had to go out and buy new land for the booster station. I think that's where their concern is, um, that the land we already acquired through development, um, through the approval process, might not be enough to house it. So um, typically we, we don't usually pay uh, the member municipalities for land. Um, but then I can't think of many times we've acquired it other than through a development. If that answers is your that question. A is that, does that to suffice your question, Councillor Desai? Um, it, it does. Um, yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Mr. Okay. Wood, um, I did see Councillor Hicks. His hand up. Okay. Councillor Hicks, go ahead. Deputy Warden. Thank you. Mr. Warden, I was going to uh, say to our, our clerk, uh, I don't think that we need a separate uh, motion to deal with item three. Uh, item three is simply sa no. staff seeking direction and they've, they've got that direction now, correct? Yeah, that part I think we're okay on the third item. Uh, this is just the amendment to give direction of uh, looking after the pump station and the, and the, um, and the project. That is clause that three, has... Mr. Warden, is the... Um regarding the project administration. So that is the, uh, and Pat can correct me, um, that is the administration of the contract for the oh. booster station, as well as okay, the roundabout design. Okay, okay if, it's, if you're going down to each paragraph, okay, yeah, you're right. It is, technically it is, okay. But, but we still need a motion though. I thought, do we not need a motion in the sense to answer the part about, and that's the amendment that's on there right now, right? And And, Tara has um, just added a, a very short amendment uh, that the motion be amended to reflect that the project management include the town of Blue Mountains working with the current consultant on the projects and approving the design of the water booster station as the CAO spoke to uh, just recently. It'll just it'll right. just firm up and provide staff with some some firm yes. direction from council to provide then to the Blue Mountains. So Councilor Hicks, are you looking to move this? Deputy Warden. He did have his hand Somebody. up, yes. Yes, yeah, sure, I'll move it. Okay, great, thank you. And and, and I can't see anybody's face, so but do I have a seconder? Uh, uh, Councillor Burley. Councillor Burley, I got it. Okay. Discussion. This is not a second amendment. Discussion. Anybody, uh, uh, so is anybody opposed to this uh, amendment? Okay, that's carried. So now we have a complete motion and it still goes back to uh, Councillor Soever and Councillor, I think, Potter were the original movers, uh, correct? Okay, so now we can talk about uh, uh, the, the full motion. Any discussion? Hopefully that gives direction for Pat. I think it should. Okay, seeing there's no sure. other discussion, uh, anybody opposed? Sorry, I did I hear sure. a I just have, yep. Go ahead. I just have one question, just so, um, and I guess that second part, I don't have the new motion up in front of me, of course, but um, so the, you know, we were kind of wondering, do we keep, as this cost of this thing grows, are we still going to pay 50%? Are we going to maybe only pay the difference between what they have now below ground and the new above ground? Or are we, that's kind of where, where we're at. Like we want to work out an agreement. I, I think we've got the contract administration and the engineering uh, design will work with, um, the, the consultant to cost the sharing, board. um, but I'm, I am just concerned about cost sharing. Like, are we going to just keep going 50% down the line? Like we were kind of doing that when we were, um, you know, when it was 1.5 million, we thought, yeah, we'll split it. That seemed reasonable. And then as it grows to 2.1 and whatever else it grows to, um, how far are we going down the, with the same percentages? That's kind of, um, some, something I'd like some feedback on. Okay. So, well, um, and does that have any reflection if, with the query or the question to Blue Mountain or to uh, Collingwood and Simcoe County? Would they have any cost sharing on that? Or is that strictly just to uh, moving it is strictly to the cost of Blue Mountains and Great County? No, actually, I, I guess you're right. Yeah. If uh, if all of a sudden they kicked in uh, 
thirty percent, then our number would be back to what it was originally. So yeah, maybe you're right. Maybe that needs to be decided first. I mean, that's one one avenue we can find and follow yeah. up is to to do that. And you can always come back if if you need more clarity on that. And the other question I have briefly is, is this a possibility to apply for any funding if any funding appears like from federal and provincial funding? Is that, is that something that could also be applied for? Uh, yeah, I, could, I mean, you know, like the roundabout on four and three we applied for was basically a safety driven roundabout. Um, obviously, okay. there'd be a, it'd be a bit tricky to apply with right along with Simcoe. We both have to be applying, I would assume, but um, well, I'm, I'm just thinking that if you have four municipalities applying for funding, does that make an application sometimes more feasible and more um, uh, achievable just because it's a bigger, you know, it's, it's, it's four municipalities that are making that application. Just something to think about. I don't want to, yeah. we got to, I don't know. I don't know what funding would be out there right now. Right. But, yeah, I don't so know. I either. think, I think Councillor Soever has a, a probably an answer to that. And just before we get to him, Mr. Warden, I will let you know that Councillor Body has also left the meeting. Well, we're dropping off like flies here, so we got to keep moving here. So Councillor Soever, and then I got I, I thought I was going to put it to a vote there, but Councillor Soever. Okay, there there is a lot of infrastructure funding out, and and I would point out that this in this infrastructure here is serving largely people from the GTA that are coming up here to um, you know to enjoy the skiing and everything else. And there's a lot more of them coming. So I think we should really push that and on uh, getting other levels of government to, to fund it. And um, it is a tourism, we've got a good relationship with the Minister of Tourism. So uh, we'll work on that on our end. Certainly, and, and I still like to see, as I mentioned earlier, um, what we can do with development charges, because none of this would be required. This is all growth related as far as I'm concerned. It's not rebuilding an existing road or improving it because we that road is perfectly fine if there weren't the 7,000 units coming in in Craigley. <coughs> Maybe windfall should pay some too. <laughs> they are paying well, for other parts of the road. Yeah, okay. Yeah. So we can have further discussion at a high level with staff. And so uh, just to, so full motion is here. Nobody opposed. That's carried. Okay. So we're moving on then to our next, uh, sorry, I want to keep moving things along or we're losing people here. So um, got to find my seat here. So we're moving on to the next, um, the next item, which is a, an official plan amendment. And, and, and that uh, uh, is being taken care of by Stephanie and Lacey. And it's moved by <clears throat> Councillor Clumpus and second by, oh wait, Clumpus, Councillor, did she leave? Is she still here? Yes, Councillor Clumpus okay. is gone. So we would need a new mover. Can I have a new mover? Okay, Councillor Burley and second by Councillor Potter. Okay, uh, Stephanie. Yes, thank you, Warden and, and County Council. The presentation is visible by everyone? Okay. Yeah, I think so, yeah. Perfect. Go ahead. Uh, so today we have addendum to report PDR-CW-1420. <coughs> and it's for a, a proposed county official plan amendment number two for a quarry expansion. In part lot 36, concession two, geographic township of Sarawak, in the township of Georgian Bluffs. The current quarry and proposed expansion is owned and operated by a numbered company, 660341 Ontario Inc. Care of Herald Construction LTD. So the following is an aerial photo of the subject lands and then the lands to be licensed for this quarry expansion are located within the dotted line here. Um, as you can note, there's an existing quarry operation just immediately to the north and so that's the existing Sarawak quarry. The county official plan requires an amendment to any new or expanding quarry operations and we, we require that because we we need and, and want to ensure there's an adequate public consultation process and that all technical studies and reports are submitted for, for staff review. 
An amendment to the Township of Georgian Bluffs zoning bylaw has also been required. And the proposed expansion is also going through the Aggregate Resource Act process to obtain a license for the operation. The license would be issued following planning approval of the county official plan amendment as well as the zoning. So just to reiterate um, from a previous presentation I had done, so the subject lands are approximately 32.5 hectares in size, whereas the proposed licensed area will apply to only 15.55 hectares and only 14.4 hectares of this area will be proposed for extraction. The quarry will be a, a below the water table operation. And as mentioned, the, the applicant has already begun the license application process through the Aggregate Resource Act. And there were no outstanding agency or general public concerns throughout the ARA process. And a joint public meeting was held with the township and the county August 5th, 2020. Agency comments received to date for this file include comments from County Transportation Services. There are no concerns. The haulage route is going to remain the same. Um, from Enbridge, Gra Enbridge Gas, there are no objections. From Gray Sobel Conservation Authority, um, they recommended random plantings should be of native species along the slopes of the proposed pond edge following rehabilitation of the quarry. Historic Sogging Metis, there are no objections or concerns. The Ministry of Municipal Affairs and Housing, no further concerns. And from OMAFRA, there were no, no concerns and a clearance letter was issued December 18th, 2019. Comments received from members of the public were from Dale and, and Christine Mortimer and Tim Oakley and Marcia Wilcox. The general summarization of these comments and concerns raised include future noise disturbances from blasting. They're worried about permanent damage to neighboring properties from the vibrations caused by blasting. Potential increase in truck traffic related to the expansion ongoing outside storage, so trailer, tractor, machinery storage, as well as neighboring property value decrease, dust, noise, and the obstruction of view from the berm that will be in installed or created. So to address the concerns raised and to ensure a safe quarry expansion is completed, the following review and mitigation measures were proposed. A minimum 20 meter setback distance will be maintained from both woodlands on the subject property. So the woodlands are located on the south and east of the property. No domestic wells uh, were within the pred predicted inf area of influence. And so that's within 100 meters of the quarry face. Regular groundwater monitoring will take place throughout the duration of the active license on any on-site wells and domestic wells within 500 meters of the proposed extraction area. And through the hydrogeological study, there were five domestic wells located within that area, so within 500 meters. And they've, they've had consultation with the homeowners um, so to, to, to check in to see whether or not there have been previous is issues related with the local water supplies to date with the existing quarry operation. And there have been no concerns. There are five sensitive receptors located between 225 and 340 meters from the expansion lands. Noise control measures implemented in accordance with MECP. So there will be a, a development of a berm. Um, the Harold Southern Construction has a blasting contractor who monitors all blasts to ensure, with, ensure the blasts are within MECP's guidelines. Blast notification list has also been updated to include new neighbors to the area, as well as to include the township. And so this was something that was discussed at the public meeting. The township expressed an interest in, in being included on these blast notification lists so that they can effectively support and help notification of all residents of Georgian Bluffs. So the cumulative extraction will remain at 400,000 tons, which is what the existing quarry to the north is currently permitted to extract on a yearly basis. And the haulage route will remain the same and continue, continue to ex use existing entrance off Gray Road 1. 
So my recommend, recommendation today is that committee support the proposed amendment to the County of Gray official plan for the subject lands and further that the appropriate bylaw be prepared for consideration by County Council. And that concludes my presentation and I'd be happy to take any questions at this time. Thank you. Great. Well, thank you, Stephanie. And uh, are there any questions from uh, County Council on, the, on this uh, amendment? <clears throat> Don't hear any. So it's been moved and second. Uh, this is a good time to bring them forward at this time of the day, I presume. <laughs> uh, seeing there's no comments, uh, anybody opposed? That is carried. Okay, thank you, Stephanie and staff for that. So we have one item we have to go back to, and that was, I think, item F that was pulled by uh, Councillor, or sorry, um, uh, the, uh, Soever, Councillor Soever, uh, with regards to an item that was from the City of Home Sound. I think it was to do with waste uh, waste management. So um, it was item F. So um, I think, uh, Councillor Soever, uh, uh, we do need to have that motion put on the floor. So are you moving that, Councillor Soever? Yes. And can I have a seconder, please? I, I can't see. Okay, I'm going to say Councillor Robinson. Okay, you may, it's now on the floor. You may uh, speak to that, uh, that piece of, uh, of uh, correspondence, I guess. Okay, so um, we received this correspondence from the um, uh, Owen Sound Council and um, previously we had received the correspondence from uh, Meaford. Um, you know, I, I am a bit surprised that Owen Sound is, is asking for this uh, given that it's going to cost their taxpayers an extra about $150 a household. But that being said, that we'll leave that for another day. Um, what I am interested in is the process, what comes next, because I think after the last, uh, our last meeting, um, staff was kind enough to send us a, um, a framework and in that framework, the staff report describing the framework, it did say that um, this was um, adopted by Gray County Council, but I've since uh, requested and received information from the clerk, and I'm not quite sure that it actually was adopted. Um, when we look at the uh, what was actually recommended by the um, committee, it actually um, says that, you know, they, they received the report and the framework and the, then it was to be sent to, the recommendation was to be sent to the lower tiers and uh, the warden and, um, and I can't find it right here, but the, we're supposed to consult with the lower tiers. But the recommendation from the committee did not actually say that, oh, here it is. We've got a lot of paper today. So, yeah, so the recommendation from the committee was that report number CAOR Gov 12 of the administrative officer dated June 5th be received. The petition, position paper, which we received, uh, entitled Opportunity Knows No Boundary, a collaborative approach to reviewing municipal services in Gray County and the collaborative decision-making framework described therein for reviewing selected services with municipal and community partners be received. And then three report CAO Gov 1012 and the related petition paper be circulated to the councils of the local municipalities and be made available to the public. And Four, the governance task force chair and the warden engage the lower tier municipalities in a series of workshops as part of the local municipal consultation process. So that was the uh, minuted and, and, and sent to council. And then the council resolution merely states that the minutes of the governance task force dated July 17th, 2012, and the recommendations contained herein, which I've just read, um, be adopted as presented and engrossed in the minutes. So there's nothing in the recommendations from the committee 
that said that the the collaborative approach should be adopted. So I, I would uh, like um, staff to look into this some more. And as we're getting these requests for um, a municipal, uh, a countywide waste disposal service, um, then um, that we actually make sure we're following a process that's actually been adopted by the county council. There may be something else in subsequent council. I know we looked at the um, library issue at some point in time, but what we were sent was this um, framework and looking at the paper trail on this framework, it doesn't appear to end with council adopting it. So that's why uh, I pulled this because I would like, you know, it looks like this is gonna become a priority. And I would just like to make sure that we are doing the right thing as to an, a process that council has actually approved. Okay, so two things. We have, we have a motion on the floor uh, to receive this. The other part you're raising, Council Sewerver, is the process and do we have it completely ironed clad to go through that process? I'm sort of reading that. So I'm going to go to the clerk and is this something that you need time to, to sort of review or do you have a comment, Madam Clerk? Actually, I think uh, CAO Wingrove has a comment to that. Oh, okay. I didn't see her on the screen. So go ahead, Madam CAO. Okay. Thanks very much. Um, since receiving the correspondence from both um, Meaford and Owen Sand, we've subsequently also received correspondence from Hanover. I'd like to suggest to Council that, and this is really what would have been part of the collaborative framework if we were going to follow that as well, would be that there's a staff report that comes back. And what I'd like to propose to Council is that I write a staff report about what would need to be in the staff report. Um, going into a, a, a significant endeavor like assessing a, a, a waste management strategy for Gray County, um, I'd like to put something together that really laid out some of the considerations that would need to be undertaken in order for council to make a decision and give you an idea of um, kind of the investment that would need to be taken in investigating um, the various aspects, et cetera. And I would, if I could, I would, I would uh, bring that back to you in January. Certainly um, we do need to get clarity as, as Councillor Soever points out around how exactly the, the collaboration framework did end up and we'll, we'll follow up on that as well and get a clear answer about that. So we have it for the future. Um, I think even now, because our governance model has changed and we don't have those specific standing committees anymore, we might want to update this to reflect the committee of the whole anyway. Um, but if you're okay with that, Council, I'll bring a report back about um, looking at waste management and what that would involve in, in the new year. And, uh, and Heather can follow so up. On the other. Let's, let's put this let's put this in some motion so then it, it sort of it follows the trail so uh i'm suggesting and maybe madam clerk we have a separate motion given the um, ceo direction to write that report but right it, now we it, have a motion on to receive this actually, right now it is actually part it's the second clause of the motion that uh, staff bring forward a report on considerations i'm looking at uh, it says endorses and supports in principle the resolution consideration delivery and disposal systems in Gray County and directs staff to send a letter of support to the County of Gray. Sorry. Okay, I'm uh, looking at the quote. Yes. So the, the okay. resolution. Oh, I see is, there. Yes. I see it. I just pulled the okay. correspondence. I'm looking at the agenda. That's right. Okay. I apologize. Okay. That's not bring before the report considering. Okay. So that's yes. already there. And, and then in that report will be a report how we need to fix the collaborative framework also. Is that right, Madam CEO? I, and I think the two things could run independently. We'll, we'll okay. Um, okay. with this direction today and what Councillor Soever has pointed out to us, we'll just follow that up as a matter of administration. Okay, so that has been moved by Council Burley and second by I think Councillor Potter, Potter. So any further comments there? I do have Councillor Robinson and Councillor Potter who have some comments. Okay, sorry about that, Councillor, I'm just, getting speeding things along here. Councillor Robinson, go ahead. 
Well, thank you, Mr. Warden. I just wanted to advise that uh, West Gray Council has also looked at the correspondence from, from Meaford. And um, if correspondence has not been sent, it certainly will be forwarded on to the county um, for the request for Gray County to consider the merits of delivering um, waste collection and disposal system at the county level and also addressing the collaborative decision making model. Thank you. Thank you for that. Councillor Potter. Uh, thank you. I just, uh, I guess my comment would be that we consider various options because we've already heard that some municipalities are, are, uh, are okay when it comes to some service to the service level. Uh, so if we, if we look at options, instead of just putting everyone in the same basket, uh, maybe there are better ways to do it, but we certainly should look at what the options are and what would be the best, uh, best way going forward. Thank you for that. Any other further comments? Councillor, Councillor Mackey. Well, <clears throat> thank you, Mr. Ward. And just further to what uh, uh, Councillor Potter mentioned, there are uh, uh, municipalities right now that have uh, working relationships with uh, one another in regards to waste management. So, you know, that should also be considered. Um, I'm not sure that it needs to be a county wide because uh, a number of us have made uh, some significant investments into landfills over the last number of years and continue to do so. Um, but there may be partnership uh, arrangements that be, can, can be made with uh, different member municipalities. Uh, source separate organics is, you know, kind of separate from, from waste. And uh, it, this is a, this is a big, uh, uh, a big ticket item for uh, all municipalities. And uh, it takes some time to really, uh, you know, work through all the uh, the issues that uh, potentially could arise. So we need to take the slow and get all the proper information and certainly have buy-in from the lower tier municipalities. Thank you. And certainly at some point communication with all the lower tiers too, if depending on how where you go along with this, right? Okay, uh, that, that's enough direction for you, Madam CEO. Any other further questions? Yes. Okay, anybody, oh, sir, who is that? That's uh, me. Okay, go ahead, Councilor Swerver. Yes, I think this is a very important uh, thing to look at, and it's I I, I want to just uh, follow up on uh, what Mr. Mackey said, and and I know they're doing very well, and with their their investment in their landfills and biodigester, I want to compliment them on having among the lowest costs in the county, and I can see why you'd be concerned. Uh, because you know it's costing them forty-seven dollars a household right now, and when you look at the average of Dufferin and Simcoe counties, that's two hundred and nineteen. So I can see why he doesn't want to um, put an additional cost like that on his taxpayers of almost another extra hundred and eighty dollars uh, a household. And um, I think many of us that have invested are in the same boat, and uh, and I, I'm kind of interested in, in what, to see what the um, results of the um, investigation by the CAO shows um, in that the, you know, some of the municipalities like I hear Hanover now, they're at $65 and they're gonna be adding another $154 per household to their, uh, onto their taxpayers if it goes to a countywide system which has similar costs to um, Dufferin and Simcoe. So I'm a bit surprised that uh, we have so many people queuing up to put additional costs on their taxpayers. That's all. I think we're, th thank you for that information. I think Madam CEO, you're just sort of gonna bring a, an exploratory report back, right? That's uh, correct, Mr. Uh, yeah. That's correct. The report will really, I think, lay out for council all of the various considerations that would need to be undertaken in order to make an informed decision about how best to move forward. Yeah. And thanks for bringing that up, uh, Councillor Swerver. Okay. Any, and you're going to, you're going to work all through Christmas to do this, right, Madam CEO? <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> oh, you got to take some time off yeah. for sure. Okay. Anybody opposed to this motion? Okay, so we'll look forward to that report coming forward. All right, so we've got to keep moving along here. And so at this time, we're going to go uh, into uh, camera. 
And I have a motion for, uh, by uh, Councillor Desai and Councillor Patterson. And to the two items that were listed on our agenda is the reasons why we're going in camera. And uh, so I guess you're going to have to clean, uh, remove some people, I guess, Madam Clerk. Is that right? Rob are will. So the, the people that are staying in are uh, CAO, um, our county solicitor, Pat Hoy, Randy Schertzer, Kevin Wepler, Lacey Thompson, Scott Taylor, uh, Sharon Melville, Tara, and myself. And as we're going into closed session, I just want to remind council to make sure that your work areas are secure. That mine's good. <laughs> and just as something I want to... Mr. Ward, go ahead. I just yep. want to advise the clerk that um, I have a hard stop at 4.30 because we have a special committee of the whole meeting that starts then. So I'll be leaving the meeting at 4.30, whether we're in closed or open. Thank you. Okay. And I'm just going to say is if you do have situations where you're at home and there's people coming and going, like Councillor Potter has a set of earphones, that does help. So people can't hear what's going on if you're in a corner somewhere and there's our people in your room. Okay. And so I also kicked my wife out of the room too. So oh, oh, she's just oh. leaving. Okay. Well, that's good. Mr. Warden, I do, I do think um, Steve Dahlmeyer is likely going to stay in as well or come back in. Um, okay, as long as, you re long as you're marking it down or keep, keeping track of it, that's fine. So uh, anybody opposed?